What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnis and say, welcome to Star Wars, reborn as Anakin Skywalker, part 6. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Anakin is in Jabitha, heading directly towards the Kemal station, and he would get there at record speeds. While Jabitha didn't know about how Anakin felt, that didn't mean she didn't know that he wanted her to go faster. So she went at her fastest speeds that was reinforced by the Force, further propelling them through space. It was not a long journey at all. Thank you, Jabitha. Anakin said aloud as the ship landed in a discreet location, far away from where most of the trade centers are made. Papa doesn't need to thank me, but Papa. Jabitha asked him, yes. Anakin didn't need to talk to Jabitha through the connection all the time, as she could understand most if not all languages, and is capable of receiving sound through her systems. What are you going to do? She was still mostly innocent to a lot of things, despite knowing that a lot of her kind had died because the birth planet she came from couldn't help them. So too was Anakin incapable to stopping the deaths of those living ships. It is nothing that you should worry about. Anakin replied, making sure that she doesn't feel the rift in his being. Okay? Whatever you say, Papa. Jabitha responded, completely believing what he had just said. I got to go now. You can go back to Tatooine now. Anakin told her as he exited the living ship. Jabitha did just that. She left Anakin all alone on the Kemal station, heading back to Tatooine where he would call her when he is done. Or he could just secure some other form of transport from here on Kemal. Kemal Station had become the secondary trade center of the Emperor, where merchants could stay and sell their goods to the people outside of the Emperor. Things had been built up rather nicely, and Anakin was making a lot of money from trade centers like this, that act like a buffer between himself and others. Foreign companies would come in and pay a lot to stay on Kemal Station or on other planets from the Emperor. This was another way to increase the overall value of his currency, and it was doing splendidly despite the economy still using, or still accepting currency from other systems, like the previous currency used by criminals out here in the Outer Rim or the credit system used in the Republic. Still SC was the currency mainly and mostly used within the Emperor because of a few reasons. Walking around the station, Anakin connects to the Force and pulls it all around him. The energy creates a silent storm. That was not felt by anyone around him as he didn't allow it to just go and destroy everything within his path. That would be both a waste of time and detrimental as he only meant to create something like this to increase his sensory abilities. It was similar to a sonar and since he had no idea what the people's force signatures he is searching for are, he would need to do this to better view the situation on this station. In fact, Kemal Station was more than just one main station, but was several spread throughout this moon and around it. The planet it orbited being of very little use, and as a gas giant, it couldn't really provide anything to him at the moment, or when he had gotten it. There may be some resources on this planet but it was best to leave stuff like this to the future. From what he knew, there was some sort of gas mining operation set up on the planet, but its production and output was so low, it was useless. Now that the storm within the force had started silently and was starting to expand out around him, furthering itself like a tornado, it twisted and twisted around him, and if Anakin wasn't careful or if he wanted, he could allow it to be unleashed all around him. A cloak or pure kinetic energy generated by the energy field known as the force, but this would also harm the force itself, because this sort of thing would scare it. A wound, a scare would be created, and to Anakin that wasn't a good idea, given this would twist the nature of those who live next to a scar without proper training to counteract the effects. While he wanted to make an example of the dissidents, that didn't mean he was going to expose innocent people to a total breakdown of the force, which would affect them. As the storm expanded, it touched upon every living being on Kemal. Then it expanded more so to the outer reaches down on the planet of Kemal, and the smaller stations around the primary Kemal station. He could see everything, perceive it in a way that is similar to sight, allowing him to identify a great many of things, and with which he could work his way up the chain of command. There were many hidden areas or locations, but Anakin doesn't want to just destroy those without checking if they are a part of the dissidents. So he started on Kemal Station within a certain club. Hello, Anakin stated within his full-on merged nanosuit power armor to everyone within, and everyone knew of what the prince looked like even within his armor. Even though different from before, they would still be able to see the telltale signs. Run, a few people said, but Anakin had already collected everything he needed by reading the minds of those within that belonged to the dissidents. He didn't read the minds of the others and proceeded to force choke those that had committed crimes that are extremely bad. Of course this was only a few, and then he left. The storm still having built up, and Anakin moves to now another location of someone else even further high up in the chain of command. He would proceed to destroy entire shops that belonged to the dissidents, tear it down, crush it into a miniature ball of nothingness. A massacre was happening, and he was basking in the feeling of vengeful justice, something that he was all too familiar with. Some other people that did crimes but were not as severe just got the stare. He made them remember all they had done, and had them repent through experience the experiences of those they had wronged. 
This would only be used on either those that did minimal wrong, or those that had some of the worst. As he moved up the ladder and went from base to base, within the span of a few hours, everything that was, that is the dissidents had been destroyed. At least nearly everything as there was one last place he had to go to. As he did move up the ladder, a trend was starting to appear as those in charge were more and more corrupt, which lead to more and more deaths. Not that Anakin would be all that sad at their passing. You, a man said as Anakin approached him. They were within the last base. The main base of the dissidents and unsurprising they were not on Kemal Station itself but on the planet. Anakin had hijacked one of the ships the dissidents were using for himself to get there. Me, Anakin said as his Nano suit power armor was still active but unseen for now and would show itself when something tried to hit him. You are the problem. The man that said this was the jester, the main culprit behind this attack. He was basking in the money he had gained. He was going to go away, far away from this crazy place forever, and stay within the peaceful republic to live the rich and luxuriously comfortable life. I am the problem. Anakin was basically copying the man. The jester started to laugh. It is over. I have finally done it. My message was heard, and the Lord and Savior has answered my prayers. While the jester wanted to get away from everyone here that was going crazy, that doesn't mean he wasn't crazy himself. I am not your lord, nor am I your savior. Anakin spoke calmly, but he had already gone through the entirety of the man's mind plunging into the depths to see just what he had done. Who was ordering him around and all of the other nonsense that was seen. You can't do anything. The jester continued to laugh madly, as within his crazed state, he probably realized that he was dead. At least he was soon to be anyway. Grant me my greatest wish, my lord. No, Anakin said as he knew that the jester wanted to die. It wasn't riches or fame or glory the man wanted, it was the sweet release from life he had been given. Don't you see it is all pointless? All of it. For you. Anakin said before continuing, you will not die but suffer something even worse before you die, so I will die. Eventually, Anakin stated as he started to lift the man up through the force and drag him towards him and stared directly into the jester's eyes. For your crimes, you shall be punished. For your sins, you shall repent. Ha! Huh. Repent, I will never regret my actions. The jester practically spat in his face, but not one part of the jester's spittle landed. You shall. Anakin dove deep into himself and decided that he will not only experience the tortures he has done unto others right to the depths of his soul, but also the torture of others his subordinates had done. The jester slumped over, brain dead, but was actually within his soul. The being of his existence being tortured. I am done here. Anakin brought the jester with him as he didn't want the man to die just yet. He needed him to go through the entirety of his punishment, before he sends him somewhere he has access to. To live forever in torment. Running through the streets using a blaster, a man is seen trying to escape the pursuit of a female to Gruta. This female being quite small, but nonetheless she was fast approaching the man, and he was starting to get desperate. The man running was the pawn, while the girl chasing after him is Ahsoka. Ahsoka being the energetic and sometimes reckless person she is, came to the conclusion that there needed to be someone behind the attack. Of course, the other girls had figured the out as well, but given she was the last outside of the palace, it was now her chance to prove to Anakin, that she would make good due on her abilities she has learnt from him. The Jedi had taught her a lot, no doubt, but most of what she knows and what she will most likely know comes or will come from Anakin, her current and forever master. She would have no other, not at this point, and she noticed this line of thinking shift in a manner that was weird. Why would she think of Anakin like that, her forever master? How ridiculous that had sounded, but inwardly, she only continued to agree with that sentiment. But now is not the time for that as the pawn was getting away. Come back here, she called out. No, you stupid little girl. You think you can get me? I will not go down with that madman. The pawn was muttering to himself, but Ahsoka was able to hear him. Who are you calling stupid? And who is this madman? Ahsoka called out, given that she was supported by the force, her endurance being greater than the pawns. I will never say any dash the pawn huffed here before continuing. Anything. The chase was on. Ahsoka was having to rely on the force to get her through the obstacles the pawn had set in place to either slow her down or trap her, so he could get away. She was not someone you could rid of easily however, just ask Anakin of whom had to deal with her cleanliness. Especially now that she had formed a diet between him and her, or was it formed by him between the two? It could even be mutual or the doing of the force to further chain Anakin down to its will, as while Anakin was powerful himself, and could defy it. It didn't mean the girls had the same strength. They all however still benefited from the dyad, just as much as Anakin did, as it wasn't a one-way connection. Now caught at a dead end, it would seem that the pawn had nowhere to go, but he had a plan up his sleeves, and Ahsoka could sense this. Maybe I shouldn't have gone off by myself she thought to herself as she prepared herself for what the man would do. She had a blaster on her just in case. It was no replacement for a lightsaber but it was better than having no weapon at all. What do you have planned? Ahsoka asked. Why should I tell you? You really are stupid, the pawn said to try and get her to be angry. But she isn't as impulsive as to allow those sort of comments to get to her. Hey, I resent that sometimes people just like saying their plans and give out the full details to their enemies. Of course this usually applied to the hero and villain scenario. But she is acutely aware that while she may be the hero within her own mind, the villain could see themselves as the hero as well, and her as the villain. Why would I ever do that? The pawn said as he distracted Ahsoka just enough for his support to arrive and save him. Well dash, Ahsoka was distracted, which let the man escape with her being unable to do anything. 
as he was hoisted away by someone else using a jetpack. It seemed like a Mandalorian, but it wasn't Jango Fett or anyone else recognizable. A bounty hunter they must be. Hey, wait dash, an explosion had gone off which would have harmed her but she had the capabilities to avoid the damage. Thankfully there was no one else around, and the explosion was small, only big enough to further distract or harm her. Damn it. She stomped her foot on the ground which created a small crater and some cracks extending outwards. Damn it. Ahsoka exclaimed again as she thought to herself, why did I have to do that? Now the Empire is going to have to have some more expenses. While what Ahsoka had done was not that big of a deal, it did cause some damage that would have to either be repaired or just left alone, because it was so small. I am going to head back to where the others are. She thought to herself as she turned around and used the force to guide her to where the other girls had gone to. Ahsoka after having her little fit of anger at failing, begrudgingly made her way over to the area. The others were no doubt at. One may ask how she had come across the pawn. It was due to two factors being at the right place at the right time and the force telling her that this is the person, at least partially responsible for what had happened. She trusted the Force to a certain extent, because Anakin had told her not to always believe that the Force would solve all of her problems. All of hers, or anyone else for that matter. Ahsoka. Someone called out her name, and she saw that it was Isla, and she was alongside someone else. Shark and Barris were nowhere to be seen, as well as Xana and Renala. Isla. She called back as she came closer. Isla turned towards the woman next to her, and introduced both Ahsoka and the woman. Ahsoka, this is Padme. Padme, this is Ahsoka. Nice to meet Dash, they both started at the same time, and would continue to try and start and talk, but would say the same thing at the same time. Isla found this amusing and she laughed, which prompted both of the other girls to laugh as well. Where did you go? By the way, Isla asked Ahsoka. I nearly had the guy. Ahsoka said. Nearly had who? It was Padme whom had asked. He called himself the pawn and was running away from the area. He was somehow connected to what has been going on. And you went off to chase after the guy yourself. Isla gave her a knowing look. Leave me alone, okay? I just wanted to help. Ahsoka pouted. Yeah, yeah. Just know that Anakin won't be happy with what has happened. Both at you going after the person while at the same time still losing him. Isla said to her as she patted her head. Don't do that. I am grown up now. Ahsoka was in the stages of wanting to be seen as an adult. But it would be a while yet before she hits a proper growth spurt. Where did Arnie go? Padme asked out of nowhere as they started talking about him. We don't know. All we know is that he had left the planet to go. And quote unquote finish something. It somehow relates to what has happened. Isla replied. The damage had been kept to a minimum. Those harmed were taken away. And all that was left now is to help out with the aftermath of the event. Which was something Padme was adamant in wanting to doing. Instead of going back to the palace with Isla. In fact the others, Shark, Barris, Renala and Xana. Had gone off into other directions that were in need of some assistance. Shark and Barris genuinely wanted to help some people out. While Renala and Xana couldn't care any less for these people. They were a part of the Emperor. And they were people Anakin was upset about the death of and they knew. Both Renala and Xana knew that it would be best to act in the best interests of him. The both of them had an interest or investment with Anakin themselves, whether this be on purpose by Renella or unintentionally by Xana. What happened to the others? I don't see them around Ahsoka left off as she was glancing every which way to find out where the others possibly were. The others split off from me, and once I arrived everything was basically already taken care of. Isla said as she answered Ahsoka's question. Okay, I guess that is fine then. Ahsoka said with a sigh of relief she was unknowingly holding, in which only leads Padme and Isla to smile at her, knowing that she is really like Anakin as Anakin's mother had said she is. By the way Ahsoka, did the man, the pawn mention any Anything else about what he is doing here, his purpose or anything like that. Padme asked her. Well he didn't say anything else, but there was someone that had come to help him. It seemed like there were hired help, Ahsoka answered. Hired help? Padme was thinking to herself as she hummed as well, adopting a thinking posture. What is it? Ahsoka, ever curious, asked. It is nothing much, but to do all of this, they would surely need a lot of time, effort, planning and maybe even a lot of money. One simply can't just pull out explosive devices capable of avoiding detection on a planet as secure as this without some advanced technology. Padme explained. All money. Isla supplied knowing all too well that this was probably a planned attack intent on causing chaos. Possibly it was random, but it was in the heart of the Emperor and it would surely upset many. Especially those in leadership positions like Shmai and the person behind the scenes, Anakin. Whoever it was, they wanted their attention, now they have most certainly got it. And it may not be the type of attention they were looking for. Certainly not when the type of attention they would be receiving was coming from Anakin. The girls had only really ever known about his light side, where he is mostly selfless in a lot of what he does. When it came to the public, even those outside of his empire, he cared enough to try and change the order. It didn't work of course which lead to him leaving along with them, and no doubt people have taken him as an example and have left as well. But this only went to show Anakin's fame. Within both the Republic and the Emperor and even out in the Outer Rims people at the very least respected what he had done and managed to accomplish. Even with the help of the mysterious figure Vader and his mother, Shmai being the main person in charge, everyone knew that without Anakin, there would be no Emperor. There would be no freedom within the Outer Rims. And there most certainly wouldn't be more people alive than there were the days before, the years before or in any other alternate timeline. Yes, all money. Padme continued, we will need to regroup back within the palace to talk more about this. Everyone here has basically been taken care of, but I would still like to stay. Padme looked over to the one child that had died during the attack. His body now moved to somewhere more safe, and as a sign of respect, 
had a blanket covering his mangled, destroyed body. She remembered the look in Anakin's eyes, and it saddened her immensely. We should go back then, Isla said as she gestured for Ahsoka to follow her. But why don't we dash Ahsoka was going to question, but was interrupted as Padme said. You don't have to stay. I was given a task, and I also wish to follow through with it. Anakin wanted me to stay here with the people and give them my support, so I will. Not only for him but for myself and everyone else here. She said to Ahsoka who wanted to stay. Oh, Ahsoka brilliantly replied. Come on, the Empress will want to know of this information, and so would Anakin like to know of this pawn as well. Isla said to Ahsoka as she started to drag her away from one of the places of destruction. Okay, see you later, um, Padme. Ahsoka called out as she was being dragged along. Yes. You may call me as such. Padme replied before she was out of hearing range, and turned around to get back to what was asked of her. After this is done, she would be going to the palace to meet up with the others as well. Hopefully Arnie is okay. She thought to herself as she moved over to another elderly person that was shot from the event, but actually injured. Even if they were, the special super serum injected into the people of the Emperor and advanced their healing capabilities. Meaning if this elderly was injured, then it meant she was probably all healed up before Padme had come over to her. In fact, it may have happened near instantaneously based upon the condition of such injuries. This went to show the insane efficiency efficiency and effectiveness of the super serum. Are you alright madam? Padme asked as she approached her and started to have a nice chat despite what has happened allowing Padme to better understand her situation. To better understand the importance of her decision to marry Anakin and her importance in leaving the Republic. She wanted to know about the Emperor and, and just how much had changed throughout her time of absence from Tadrian. A lot had changed and it seemed to be for the better. Entirely so that it seemed as if it was an entirely different or separate place from the slaver's planet she knew of before. Now that I have everyone's attention, I would like to go over the events of what has happened. Shmai had to yet again tell people about what was going on, and she's starting to get tired of it. At least she didn't have to do this forever, and would rather create a press conference, where she would explain everything out in the open. In fact, she had called a press conference to address the event. She went on to talk about the casualties, about how she would put an end to the dissidents' uprising, because it got in the way of the prosperity and safety of the Emperor and her people. It was rousing, and many people within the Emperor would feel believed that Shmai was addressing this situation publicly and out in the open, while keeping near 100% transparency. She would need to give everyone a target to blame, and they knew just who they were. This further incentivized the citizens to worship Anakin as a divine being, and his mother is the mother of that divine being. Why wouldn't they love the people that had helped free them, helped them get back on their feet, and propel them into prosperity, of which had immensely elevated the living conditions of themselves and their loved ones? Then there are the droids, which were also listening to this believing that they had missed out on something, an opportunity to prove themselves to the prince, worthy of his praise, and it would increase their fervor. Everyone was becoming more and more zealous, which resulted in less and less tolerance among the people overall. This would stop change and would hamper freedom if Anakin wasn't careful managing the moods of the people. Just as the media was a powerful tool, it could not only be used by someone, it could also be used against them. In fact, following this tool analogy, Anakin, if he messes up big time somewhere along the way would be him mishandling the tool. With no protection and care to make sure the tool doesn't degrade, Anakin would need to ensure it is kept up to standard. Shmai, while knowing and experiencing a lot of things, was still not a political mastermind manipulated behind the shadows and was mostly not in the know of more intrigue-based situations. Not that it would have all mattered as she could access those files anyway. No, she just didn't want to look into it, as she would most likely cause some problems. She knew where her place was and what she needed to do for her son. Soon enough she would not have to deal with all of this, and would only be semi-directly connected, because she would still be the Empress or Queen Dowager to the Emperor. Thank you. That is all and I hope that all of you will show your support for those of whom have lost their family today. Your community matters and so do you. Shmai finished the conference as she re-entered the palace to find that her son was there. He seemed like he was okay, but she knew that outside appearances could be deceiving. Ani. Shmai asked her son that was standing there. He had no usual smile he had, but instead a blank face. And if Shmai was fussy sensitive with the ability to sense his emotions, she would be saddened. I am fine. The usual that is said by a person that is totally fine. It is okay. Shmai does the motherly thing and just hugs her child, where she feels that Anakin releases some tension built up from within. She could see it by the way he was standing. His posture gave away that he was still angry. I know. Anakin replied while sighing. I should have done more. He was starting to regret trying to control such a faction, just to pull out those who were against him, and while successful, it still came at a price he was unwilling to pay. Why don't we go back inside? We can talk more in there, and you can tell me all about what you did. Shmai lead him through the palace into a private room. You may not want to know everything, Anakin said. Then only tell me an edited version. Shmai said as she was not against Anakin having some privacy. The two then would have a talk before reconvening with everyone else, getting the knowledge about everything else. From the success to the failure of Ahsoka being able to identify who the pawn was, and where they came from, while also lamenting the failure of not capturing him. A constellation would be Padme now having semi-safely arrived here on Tatooine, and Anakin would be celebrating that at least. A memorial would take place however, in a memory of those who were lost in the attack. 
It was the only natural course of events to take place. Anakin would also upgrade the defensive systems in place around Tatooine and on other worlds to make sure an attack like that didn't happen again. In oversight that should have not happened, but because of the lack of resources to do so, they got away with it. Surveillance and order was properly restored to Kemal Station. Droids were now back on the station and those around them. Anakin would have to deal with what is to come next now. His ascension to the throne and position of Emperor while introducing Padme and Isla as his wives, that while he had already married, knew that they would want something more for their loved ones to witness. For Isla, she would like to invite her master, her father figure and others her life, while Padme would also officially have those from her family attend as well. The pawn had escaped. Finding success in his endeavor, he left as soon as he could, and was almost caught as well by that meddling kid. He had helped in the setup of the bombs on Tatooine, had smuggled everything in key locations, that while dangerous, didn't cause much damage. The people and a lot of the buildings had been saved from the destruction and chaos that could have happened. Again, the pawn would attribute this to those droids, droids that may have very well been stolen from them. The Trade Federation. The pawn wasn't lying when he said he was a part of the dismantled trade federation and as they no longer officially existed they had now become a part of the dark world the underground the underworld and it was both liberating and restricting they could no longer operate in an official capacity either within the republic or the separatists neither of these two great conglomerations of star systems and governments would ever allow them to participate in the grand scale of things again they had their chance and had failed miserably now however when given the opportunity they had successfully hit back against their perceived enemy anakin skywalker and his empire sir i have done it the pawn spoke to his direct superior Good, good. The superior replied with praise. You have done well. Have you also gotten the information that we want? Yes. The pawn answered in an affirmative tone. The superior is referring to information related to the trade, or the market within the Emperor. There isn't really much that is shared amongst those within the businesses of the Emperor, but it wasn't like it is all that hidden as well. The Trade Federation is looking for ways to infiltrate the market and try to destabilize the situation using all sorts of illicit goods. Too bad for them however, as Anakin had long ago allowed the production of certain illegal substances to become legalized. But it is regulated. Regulation is key to keeping a healthy society in complete bans on what one can buy, and what they cannot destroys and creates from within a form of economic exploitation of the people. You can't always trust your citizens to be smart enough to not take drugs that could potentially harm you. You would not where they have come from their production process and several other factors like ingredients that go into this process. It is crazy just how much smuggling could have happened if Anakin wasn't to regulate this sort of thing. He doesn't mind if someone wanted to get high or go on a trip. Who is he to say whether or not they should do it? As long as it wasn't affecting him or affecting others in a harmful way or have a negative impact on the society as a whole, then it was all good for him. Thankfully, the people agreed with his laws, not because they are drug addicts, but because they had an immense and deep respect for freedom. They had fought over their freedoms and liberties after all. What is this? This is useless, the superior screamed at the pawn from the other side of the comlink. It showed him that their ability to enter the economy would be allowed, but the scale of impact they would have would be minimal at best. At worst they would have none at all, and there are restrictions to the drugs they want to get out in the market. Tests were to be done and if approved by the government, it would be allowed. Not everything was allowed within the Emperor and despite Anakin wanting it to be so, because a free market would be great. The people would be able to determine whether or not something is of value. But a free market without restrictions or regulations in place could turn into chaos too quickly. We won't be able to do anything. The superior slammed his cold up hand, making a fist into a desk. He isn't truly well angry. Sir, please wait. I have at the very least caused some damage to dash the pawn started, but was interrupted. Shut up. That was useless. Pointless despite your success. You must remember that the purpose of our dismantled organization now is to get back at those who have wronged us. The superior told the pawn. The superior continued. We may have succeeded, but there is more yet to come. We will need to take our attention away from the emperor, it would seem. But sir, I am Sue Dash the pawn was cut off again, and before he could do anything else or say anything else, the superior continued in a condescending voice. That spoke volumes to just how expendable he was. Truly he is a pawn. Silence. That is enough from you. The superior disconnected the comlink after getting everything he needed, and turned around to the others within the room he was in. A meeting was happening, taking place within yet another undisclosed location, probably somewhere out in the outer rim, and most likely within either hut space or somewhere unoccupied. Did everyone hear that? The superior asked the room. Most within the room just nodded, and surprisingly enough there was a few Nemordians within the room, and if there were people here to recognize these figures, they would definitely be surprised. The former viceroy, now just a member of the board, or at least supposed member of the dismantled board a part of the trade federation was there. He had not died and was not captured to be handed over to the Emperor for a prompt execution for the audacity to try and have their prince killed. King, don't you think that we should focus more on the Emperor? One member spoke. Surely they are in chaos now. That is untrue. The superior now identified as King spoke. From the reports we have received which are minimal at best, they explain that the Empire is at an all-time high and still growing. The people still feel safe. King continued. Vindicated even that they now know that the Emperor doesn't negotiate with known and unknown terrorists. Then what are we to do? Is it not our main goal to take down the Emperor? Newt Gunray, the former Viceroy spoke with anger in his voice, letting everyone know of his displeasure at the current situation. King ignored him and continued. We will turn our attention to the Galactic Republic and the Separatists. It is through them we will siphon away any and all resources we can to build ourselves up. 
They are just sitting there ready for the taking, and with us being located in a location no one knows about, it will be all the more easier. Someone stood up and said, for the Federation of Vengeance, the rest of the room joined in on chanting this name of the rebranded Trade Federation. While the Trade Federation was terrible, there were a great deal many of people disgruntled and disillusioned about the fact the Great Federation that had provided them with jobs had gone down. Now there were a lot of people, a lot. Like, a lot, a lot of people that are now jobless. And it could have lead to the entire destabilization of the Federation controlled systems. Too bad? Or was it too good that the Separatists saw this as an opportunity to take over as well? They had only needed to give up a third of the droids and resources the Federation had, but never any planets. For the Federation of Vengeance, today was the day an enemy group of the Emperor was born, and although small in number, that would annoy the hell out of Anakin. This would force him to unfortunately Unfortunately, either fix the situation with people outside of his empire, or lead him to destroying them all. Either option was good for him. For now though, the Federation of Vengeance would focus all of their efforts in making sure that the Separatists and the Republic suffer as they continue their war. It is a group that would no doubt be able to increase the amount of resources and money spent to take down the entirety of each other. The Emperor would have no part in the war, which was unfortunate for the Federation of Vengeance as they would be unable to harm them. But the consolation is that they get to get back at the other two conglomerates of star systems, while at the same time making a profit. Bewildered, befuddled, confused, mind-boggling, mind-twisting Jubaidi. Sidious was all kinds of things, and has all kinds of feelings conflicting in various ways. It was a good thing and bad thing to be so stumped because it gave him pause, gave him some time to know that something had gone wrong. However, that didn't mean what had gone wrong was right for him. As Palpatine he had put up a front of everything was going fine, but he had taken to lashing out at some random person every now and then to release his anger. The dark side is a source of many unnatural abilities indeed, but it certainly twisted you to make you just like that unnaturalness as well. One didn't need to look no further than when Palpatine reveals himself as Sidious or even as he is now. He is becoming paler by the day, his skin sagging more and more as his age progresses, but also because of his dark side alignment further corrupting his being, he has control but not in the way of his physical self. He may be strong with a lot of things, but what he lacks is a good, young and strong body to help him be at his peak. Even when he only just started out training as a Sith he was old, way too old to really reach peak physical capabilities, but that didn't mean he was unable to make up for it through the usage of the Force. The first thing that bothered him was the enigmatic existence of Anakin Skywalker. His simple academic interest he may have been until he got to witness his abilities and power within the Force allowing him to make a decision there and then. He would either have the boy or would destroy him once and for all, because he could get in the way of his rise to power. He would not be the strongest and would only be second to the boy. The supposed chosen one, the precious precious chosen one of the Jedi, had left them, left them all behind to rejoin his lofty and glorious empire. Sidious would be lying if he said he was not envious of such an opportunity. If he could, he would try and start to build himself, just as the Emperor had started out as within the Outer Rims. There are no fancy laws or puffed up politicians to get in the way of his ambitions, but that would just not be happening. Now would it? No, he will continue here within the Republic, and when the time comes, he will destroy the Emperor and the boy. No, the boy was no more a boy but a full-on grown adult man. There are many things Sidious was interested in when it came to the Emperor, specifically when it came to this mysterious super serum, meant to increase the people's mental and physical capabilities. It was a marvel of the era they were in, and he wanted it but his agents had failed to bring him any. That was until he received one such sample and experimented with it only to find out it was useless. There were mechanisms in place to protect the serum from being administered without a special condition. There are just too many things happening, and not everything is going in my favor. Sidious thought to himself as he had gotten Padme's resignation from her as she darted off to the Emperor, another pawn gone from him in joining Skywalker. It was starting to make more and more sense to Sidious. The Emperor and Skywalker, Vader everything was connected, and these three were all in the middle. It would seem that Skywalker and Vader was either one and the same or two completely disconnected beings that just so happened to share the same goals. He had noticed Skywalker's intelligence and maturity for his age, but he knew that Force-sensitive people seemed to grow up quicker, mentally at least when it came to it. So he had assumed that because of Skywalker's special status, it had granted some form of increased mental maturity. It would seem, however, that the boy was taught in the ways of the Force even before he came to the Jedi. It was quite possible he had only used the Jedi as a training ground before he left to go back to the Emperor and maybe Vader trained Skywalker while he was younger. Sidious thought to himself some more, and this seemed like the most probable and most plausible explanation. It doesn't matter. What matters for now is the Republic and its reconstruction as my empire. Then the destruction of the Jedi and the Emperor is all but guaranteed. There was something that Sidious had down. It was talk to the Jester. He had supplied the man with ample things to make sure he was able to do as much as he could to destabilize this foreign entity. That would be a threat to him. But from the reports he had received, there was no way it would happen, and he may have just made the faith the people there had increase. While it looked like a win on the outside, it was actually a loss. For now, Sidious would have to pull his attention away from the Emperor as the battle between the Republic and the Separatists was becoming more and more heated. Dooku may be a very good leader, 
But that didn't mean he told his student everything. He knew there was many things that Dooku isn't telling him. And he was starting to believe that Sidious was trying to start his own journey to becoming the next Sith Lord after him. Of course this is just Sidious's paranoia acting up. It is not that Dooku wants to become the next Sith, rather that he wants to destroy him because he is slowly eroding the Republic. Dooku may be no Jedi, but his heart is still in the right place. And he had the capability to be a proper leader within times of war. He is capable of making hard decisions others would hesitate to do. Dooku is no Jedi anymore, but one simply cannot also call him a Sith. Not truly. But for now his disguise was still kept up, and Dooku had wanted to make sure the CIS could run independent from Sidious or himself once it was all over. In fact, Dooku was making many discoveries about the Emperor and may just very well secede control over to them. This would be of course once everything he is planning comes to fruition. Bring me the documents. Sidious ordered his aide after staring out of the window of his office, located in the Senate's high-rise building. Paperwork is the bane of my existence a necessary evil Sidious. Left off with those finishing thoughts. Arnie. Surprisingly enough, the first person to jump in before all of the others was Ahsoka. Or was it all that surprising that she would be the first to do so? Ahsoka. Anakin questioned as she practically glued to him, while the others also started to come towards him. She didn't say anything, but it would seem that she was very clingy all of a sudden. But no one asked any questions about her, and instead focused on him. Where did you go off to? It was Xana, the one with the least amount of time spent with him that asked this question. Nowhere special. Anakin answered not going into detail. I just had to take care of some business. The dissidents, the rebels that had caused the explosion has been taken care of. Taken care of you say? Xana said back with a questioning tone. But it is rhetorical, and he didn't need to answer, because she has an idea as to what had happened to those that had harmed his people. Never mind that. We have acquired some interesting pieces of information that would no doubt be something to hear. And what would that be? He asked. There is someone called the Pawn. It was Ahsoka who had told him, given she is the one to have chased after him. I chased after this person because they were suspicious, and the Force had guided me to him. The Pawn. Huh? Anakin says with a contemplative look. Yeah. And after everything we have gathered, the remnants of the bombs and pieces of information we picked up, the pawn is probably someone that has money. Ahsoka continued while everyone else just listened. Anakin of course knew of the pawn and where he is from, and knows that he wasn't the one in charge of the assault, but more like a benefactor of the Jester. From the Trade Federation, they are. Anakin said which startled everyone, because the Trade Federation is not supposed to exist anymore. At least not in an official capacity, and they would be most likely in hiding. They are scared on the Emperor and fear what would happen to them if they are caught. The Trade Federation. Padme was here along with the other girls that have interest in Anakin, or have some type of leadership position, while anyone else was not included, because it was more of a private matter. Yes, the Trade Federation, but I do believe that they do not go by that name anymore, Anakin replied. Padme was angry, but it wasn't just her, it was mostly all of them, excluding Xana. But in time her emotions would develop enough to get to that point. They have tried to kill me, and you, time and time again. Isn't this a bit too much? Padme asked. No, Isla said. Isla is correct, because if you think about it, the Emperor has now taken at least a third of what they own, and I am. No, both me and Padme is the reason for the Trade Federation's dismantling. Anakin said. That is true, Padme left off. It is. I think however that we shouldn't really be talking about this now, and should get back to the normal things that we would all be doing. Anakin stated. And what normal things would that be? Shark asked him. Normal things. He just raised an eyebrow and had a look on his face. That said he didn't know the answer to that question. Right, I best be heading on my way then. Come along Renala. we have some other things to do. Xana said to Renala as she was starting to leave, not waiting for Renala to follow after her. But Dash Renala wanted to stay and spend some more time with Anakin. But it would seem that Xana had other things planned. She was looking between Xana and Anakin as she is hoping that one of them would allow her to stay with him. But Anakin wasn't going to stop this. He had some other more important activities he would like to be doing with either of his two wives. Padme had not been able to have the special activities that Isla and himself have been enjoying with each other, and he fully intends to make sure she knows she is appreciated. Go on then. Anakin gestured to Renala as she pouted but reluctantly left to do whatever she is supposed to do with Xana. Shakti was also starting to leave considering there was nothing else for her to do, and she was in the middle of some important self-reflection, because she is still coming to terms with her decision. She wanted to make sure that she didn't regret this choice she has made. She doesn't, but she is still in denial of whatever feelings she may have developed for Anakin. But thankfully she did have some friends. The other girls and herself had become like family as well. So of course she wouldn't feel so conflicted about things. However, practically all of those of whom she considers family, now have gotten into a relationship with Anakin, where it was only Ahsoka and herself that wasn't in anything like that. Jealous may be the word she is looking for, but at the same time she can also be relieved that at least Ahsoka hadn't developed those types of feelings. Otherwise she may be the last to enter into a proper relationship with Anakin, and she may be in denial, but subconsciously she wanted more. She didn't want to be the last either, even though at this point she probably will be. See you later Shark. Anakin made sure that she knew he was still thinking of her before she left. Yes, see you later. Shark replied as what Anakin said, had brought a smile to her face. Now there was only the women he has started an intimate relationship with left in the room with him, all except Ahsoka of course. Given the events that had happened over the course of the past few weeks, the next course of action is only natural. I guess this means I have to go ahead with my plans then. Plans? Barris questioned. Yes, plans. Anakin detached himself from Ahsoka, where she pouted and was reluctant to let go.
but didn't say anything as it seemed like Anakin was going to do something. Anakin walked up to Isla and kissed her on the lips, before moving over to Padme and doing the same. Then the last person he did this with is Barris. And after he is done he says something that surprises those left within the room. That really shouldn't surprise anyone. Let's get married. For real this time. Anakin says as looks towards Isla, Padme and even Barris, who is the most shy of the lot. A ceremony will be held so that everyone can bring those close to themselves. Whether they are family or friends, the three of you can also prepare. Married. Like officially so, Padme asked as she was the most concerned about having her relationship kept secret. Not that she minded doing so for Anakin. It just made her uncomfortable as if it is the foreshadowing of something disastrous, which lead her to wanting to express her devotion to Anakin for everyone to see. She felt that this would be the best course of action to be rid of this feeling. But what she didn't know, is that this feeling comes from the pangs of the timeline shifting and changing around Anakin. He was forcibly changing fate and destiny, which would lead to other events changing as well. Yes, officially, all three of you, Barris, Isle and Padme, will be mine. Anakin said before an intense emotion could be seen within his eyes, and he continued, No, you three and already mine, and now I will tell everyone else that is so. Barris was the first to hug Anakin, followed by Padme and then Isla. It was finally happening. The wedding would take place before the events that would lead up to Anakin's ceremonial crowning of becoming the new emperor. Ahsoka was there and decided to join in the hug as well, because why not? She didn't want to feel left out, and had a strange feeling from within, when she noticed the way Anakin looked at the three other girls in the room. A look that he gave them but didn't give her, not ever, and it made her feel a strange way. She wanted him to look at her like that as well, but she while she knows what adult special activities are, she has a rather vague concept of romantic love. Considering she had lived and grown up around others that have developed and shown this type of love, it was certainly strange. Her purity in this manner was partially because of the Jedi forbidding stuff like this, and she had no crush before, so she is unaware of what her feelings mean. Not that she didn't always have some sort of feelings for Anakin. It was only now that it was becoming more and more prominent, and it would start to annoy her more and more as time passes and he still wouldn't look at her that way. The Night Sisters had been doing well for themselves in establishing their dominion over the planet of Dathoma. Talzin was having the time of her life. Despite this, however, her son was still missing and didn't come back to her, and despite everything Anakin had done to help her, she was disappointed. Disappointed in the fact that the boy, not turned man, would not really keep in much contact with her. At least she had her poor, poor Grievous, the cyborg she had come to develop unexpected feelings for. She had her own ways to access information and had access to various technologies, also allowing her this ability to get a lot of information. While Dathoma was on the other side of the known galaxy from Tatrine and the rest of the Emperor, there was a very strong connection between the two. A connection that allowed her, her people and those who live on Dathoma, to gain access to and communicate with those on the other side of the galaxy. Anakin had not left Dathoma to just rot, considering he wanted the planet to himself in the future, it was best to leave it prepared for his eventual takeover. Not that anyone knew of this. Not Talzin and not even her lover, Grievous. Talzin would continue to allow the ritual to be used on her people. Though none would have the same reaction Anakin had, it was still happening. Even more so than it had been happening before because their casualties, everything related to the ritual had decreased. They didn't use as many people as before, and had gained a method to determine whether or not someone had the capacity to survive the ritual, because there is some form of compatibility someone needed to have. The fact that children went through this didn't change as it is a societal and cultural thing at this point. But now that she didn't have to worry about her population number decreasing or staying the same, she could do a many number of things. Like slowly begin colonizing the rest of the planet. Then there was the device left behind, the infinity gate that she wanted for herself, as it would speed up her plans of destroying Sidious. She wanted revenge. And she was starting to see that Anakin was more than some valuable asset. Even though he is but she started to like the man more and more, as he kept giving Grievous lots of time off to spend with her. In her old age, she may be unable to have children. But that didn't mean she is incapable of doing certain things. Grievous was saddened at being unable to do this with her. Well do this with her and feel it. He had to rely on specially made parts that Anakin didn't want to part in creating for him. He just had someone else do this. Grievous. Talzin asked as she was within the caves, laying beside her was her lover. Yes. He asked back not knowing where this was going. I wish to propose something to Skywalker and was hoping that you would pass along my message. I feel that it would be better coming from the mouth of someone he knows and tolerates. Talzin said. Sure. Grievous would do many things for her. But he knew to be careful in cause she turns into a demonatrix. Both she and he are both strong and aggressive personalities. So that would lead to a lot of aggressive activities. That would otherwise be dangerous for others. But for those that have access to he force. It was much easier to negate any damage done. If there would be any at all. What is it you wish to tell him? Are you wanting more resources or something? Grievous asked her as the continued. No. I have had this idea for the longest time now. But have not had any to be able to do this for me. Talzin continued. I wish to get someone from my people engaged to Skywalker. What? Either you would never dash Grievous began but was interrupted. I thought so as well. But as I continue to lay here with you. It seems like a good idea to secure a proper alliance between myself and for those on my planet with Anakin and the Emperor. Talzin said. Who do you have in mind? Grievous questioned. Someone that I had to give a long time ago, and regret in doing so. Say what you will about Talzin. But she at least had some level of attachment to her people, 
Her name is Asaj Ventress. Ventress? Huh? Then where is she now then? Grievous asked as this would be an interesting thing. Given that Anakin is getting married to three other women, Grievous would have thought she would be against this. Her cultural background kind of demanded that the women be in charge. In fact Talzin was ecstatic over the fact that Shmai, another woman even though none of her people had become a queen, then turned empress. It was an amazing feat even if she had help from Anakin. No, she had no right to say anything if all parties involved were okay with everything, and she wanted to try and insert herself, her own faction into the mix that is the Emperor. She has a feeling that in the future she may. No, her people may become a part of an even greater purpose, and whatever that purpose was involved Anakin and the Emperor. I do not know, but I would like to join forces with you to find her. Talzin replied, so you want to force the girl you had given away back into your people, and then force her to marry? Grievous asked. I know it doesn't sound like the best idea, Talzin said looking around the room they were in, making sure not to look at Grievous. Best idea. That sounds quite horrible, Grievous replied, not afraid of her anger. I know, but there is no one else I would want to get involved with Skywalker. She had no one else was what she meant. Too young or too old being born eight years prior to Anakin made her the best choice she has. Sighing, Grievous responds. Fine, I will see what I can do. If we are unable to find her, there is one other person I could want to send Talzin said. And who would that be? Grievous asked. Her name is Mirren. HK-47, a droid with which Anakin had created and could be considered his child. HK has done a great many things for him which enable Anakin to further his desires, plans and designs for the future. Because of this Anakin would be transforming HK first into the first synth. Even though HK doesn't need this, not like the other droids, it would still be better if it could get a proper body for itself. It would only be proper for the first droid, first living droid to become a part of, and be the very first synthetic being enhanced through his genetic modifications. HK, are you ready? Anakin spoke as he was now on Kamino along with HK, whom was having some complaints about becoming a fleshy meatbag. Query. Master, even though I would follow your orders without question, I must question exactly why I have to do this. HK vocalized. Not only will you be given a superior body compared to every other meatbag as you would say, but you would also be given a part of myself. Anakin said. Query. A part of yourself, Master. HK questioned. That is right. And you just have to choose which body type you would like. Female or male? Anakin said and questioned HK. Pondering over its choices, HK says. Query. Are there any specific benefits to each type? Statement. Master. I have no knowledge as to what body I should choose. Why don't you consult the Force? Make use of the gifts I have given you, as you are sure to still have them even after transferring bodies. Anakin replied giving his suggestion. Okay? HK responded before delving into itself to pull from within its innermost self. The Force would help it shape the way it is meant to be. The way it itself would like to be without it realizing itself. Anakin waited patiently for HK to finish its little meditation session. Statement. Master, I do believe that I am meant to become a girl. The Force has provided me with an answer I am unsure of this decision however HK said. It is good that you don't always trust the force, but a lot of the time it will be unbiased and give you the decision you have to do. Not because it is bound to happen, but because it is best for yourself, at least within this context. Anakin said, I don't trust the force all of the time either, and you wouldn't have to be completely rid of your mechanical parts and pieces, because you would still be getting your own interface and living metal armor. It would be powered completely without the aid of anything else. Anakin continued, statement. Whatever the master says then, HK replied. What would happen next is a slow process of Anakin using a combination of abilities to slowly transfer consciousness of HK into another body, while also moving some midi chlorians to activate this new body's connection to the Force. There is also the other bits and pieces that was included, and Anakin intended to get HK to have its own nanosuit power armor, because it, no, now she would appreciate it. While this was happening something else was being created, a body specifically cloned from Grievous leftover biological and genetic data. Anakin wanted to recreate his body, and it wouldn't be through the normal cloning process, but instead an entire body would be built from scratch. The reason for this is that Grievous is already an adult, would appreciate an adult body of himself, and that he wasn't getting the same treatment the other living droids were getting. They are to be implanted with his genetic modifications, meaning they would become physically superior, but Grievous didn't want this. He may lose his ability to use the Force for a while, because Anakin would need to do some modifications to give it back, but that was nothing to Grievous. He just wanted an actual body where he could properly feel again. Of course his body would be aged and not brand new, because it is created from his current genetic data, and he didn't want to go through the entire process of being a child or adult again. Anakin wouldn't be granting him immortality either, but he could live on when he dies as a Force ghost within his still budding dimension. He would forcibly bring in Talzin into his dimension as well if he had to, because Grievous had done a lot for him and he is willing to do some things for him as well. That was usually how he operated. Not that he was always one for one, but it is the basis of how he deals with most situations. The body HK would be receiving would be a female body, but it wouldn't be as simply as a synthetic being. He was going to do for others. It was designed in a way that is unique from the rest while keeping all if not the exact same abilities of the other since being made. HK would also not be called HK anymore and should get her own name. A name that would suit her and her new self better and maybe even represent a lot of other things about her origins. In fact Anakin had decided to modify her look himself as she had given him full and total control over the process. 
When it came to the synths, they originally were supposed to be grown without any specific genetic alterations other than the ones through his super serum and the Sky Seed. Everything else would be left up to chance, except their gender with which the droid would be able to choose so for themselves what they want, while their skin color, eye color, hair color, things like this would depend on their development and random genetic variables. Anakin didn't want to go through the process of only having clones, as these people needed to be unique in their own way. Because when it comes to the Force, it is childish like that. If you are different or differentiated within the Force and are Force-sensitive, then you will never be able to live for long. Midi-chlorians would leave a clone Force-sensitive's body because of this, and they would eventually shrivel up and die without the decency to live a ling and proper life. When it came to normal people, however, it is perfectly normal when it comes to cloning. This is one of the reasons Anakin did this to hopefully counteract one of the Force's childish acts, of making sure he doesn't become more powerful. He could around the Force by making them Force-sensitive through his specific cellular structure, modified to be implanted within others, as the implants mess with their biology. That is another to talk about. The process that goes through or between either males or females as it would be different. Generally, when it came to him he could control just how tall one would be, but there was always some variables behind the scenes affecting the process. With the extra implants he did as well, he is just lucky he didn't become all too tall, given lightsabers would be harder to use then. This is also another factor, where the men should range between 2-2.1 meters in height similar to him, instead of it being ridiculous enough to be unable to use sabers. They would be force users after all. If they couldn't use sabers or at least some sort of weaponry to suit their bodies, then this process may be useless. No one could be as strong as himself within the Force or even physically. His results cannot be duplicated, no matter how much time one spends in modifications or otherwise, simply because he is just that unique. He is thankful to be reborn as Anakin, otherwise he wouldn't have had such an easy process throughout his life otherwise. Just as there are benefits however, he had to deal with the downsides of being the chosen one as well, with having to constantly reaffirm and assert himself within the Force. His will will not be taken for granted, and the Force would have to give up and trying to get him in its direction. Not that it needed his help as it could always try and create another Force sensitive as strong as him. It was entirely possible for something like this to happen. That is if a situation that happened between Sidious and his former master Plagueis was ever done again, and he doesn't think it will. Even then, he would probably be way too strong at that point, having created his own dominion with the Force, and increased his own midi-chlorine count, or even what he is planning now. To upgrade the midi-chlorians into a superior form, that would only come from himself and be under his complete control. Master, a voice was heard and it was quite strange, since it gave Anakin some flashbacks from his previous life, precisely to do with a game called Nyar Automata. Master, I'm done. I am completed. And there she was a direct replica, or at least as direct as he could get using his previous life's memories to his advantage to modify her body. To suit his need he means to suit what she would have wanted. Master, what is this feeling? Shkay was referring to something strange. A feeling that Anakin was familiar with as it resembled the connection he had before to all other droids. The bond made through Mekuderu but this time it is different, entirely different as it was now much more closer in a way. He assumed this is because of the midi-chlorians that originated from him, and in the sky seed implants that contain them, and was put into the sense. It enable a new form of bond to come together as HK was created in the process, and the growth serum speed up the development to get her to this point. If Anakin had this growth serum for himself when he was younger, he could get the implants to work faster, and get his body to develop faster as well, instead of going through with the Night Sisters ritual. In hindsight, it would have been safer to do this, but it would come with the risk of aging himself too quickly, with no way to moderate it. It would have been impossible without midi-chlorian manipulation to grant himself a form of immortality. Even better yet was the combination of everything working within himself to elevate his actual potential to greater heights. It is nothing. Thing. Don't worry about it. It is just the same too as the bond we shared before. Anakin explained. Statement. This feels different somehow. Shkay explained, now with a feminine voice that sounded just like that of 2B from Nyar Automata. Do you like everything installed already? Anakin asked as he had done several things to make it as comfortable as possible. But given that the body was developed rapidly, just like Xana, she would need to get used to her new body. Even with the insane genetic modifications, plus the super serum, it would at least take a week before she is ready to properly walk again. Statement. So this is how our meatbag feels. It doesn't feel all that bad, Shk said. I would hope so considering I have to live with my meaty suit as well, Anakin said. Statement. But the master is divine and the pinnacle of every being living, machine or otherwise, Shk said with fervor within her voice before continuing. You are the perfect mix and match between those of us within the machines, and within those of the others within the biologically living. Now you can be considered a hybrid yourself, Anakin stated. Query. I am like the master, Shk questioned. Yes, and I think it is about time for you to get another name. We will take inspiration from your previous droid name of HK-47. Anakin adopted a thinking posture as HK was given some clothing to cover herself up, but she didn't feel all that embarrassed to be naked. She had not gotten used to normal human sensibilities just yet. I didn't know that I would be becoming like this. HK said to herself as she was starting to get used to how the way felt around her, either through her sense in the Force, and through her new biological senses as well. Master was right when he said I would keep my abilities, 
and in fact it feels stronger now than it did before. HK thought to herself as it is true that the sky seed he had extracted from himself was and is currently being administered to the rest of the synths as Anakin prepares to go through the process of transferring them of their consciousnesses into the Matrix, before bringing them into their new bodies. Of course he first had to had Siri get the droids to send in what they wanted, if there was anything in particular, like the physique of a man or a woman, and surprisingly enough, there was a lot more wanting to become men. It probably has to do with the factors of being generally better in the physical department compared to a woman's body. Anakin thought to himself as on average men are usually stronger, but here it is actually not as pronounced. One just has to take into account the force, and that would solve any and all strength disparities between a woman and a man, if they both had force abilities. Yes, men generally have a better physical foundation to work off of, but women can reach the same strength if not surpass them simply because of space magic. It works wonders for equality, and Anakin no doubt believes at least a few people would have liked to have the force just to step and spit on men. It happened already with the Dathomirian Zabrak tribes of Night Sisters and Night Brothers on Dathoma, so why wouldn't it happen elsewhere as well? Then there was Nabu that strangely only ever elected women rulers, which is not really that equal between the sexes. But that was just a part of their culture, and from what Anakin had seen there was minimal discrimination like that. Not that he has to worry about any of that within the Emperor. Their culture predicated itself on him being some sort of divine being, and the core value of freedom above most other things. Of course not to the destructive degree, but it was the most prominent thing the people worried about. It was slowly changing to become more tolerant of other things, but it was still rather zealous, and Anakin for now didn't mind. Query, Master, do you think you could help me? While HK didn't feel shy or embarrassed at being seen naked by Anakin, that didn't mean she wouldn't feel some from being physically incapable at the moment. Sure, Anakin helped her up, and she rubbed her body against him for support. This was dangerous and would awaken the beast if Anakin didn't already have a great amount of control. Query, what is my name then, Master? HK asked. I believe that the name Hitsuka would be perfect. Anakin said as it was from the Japanese language of his past life, and it meant first daughter. It also had the English letters of H and K within the name itself, which further connected HK to the name. Hitsuko, Hitsuko, she looked up to him with her grey blue eyes. That were quite nice to look into. I like it. She had a smile on her face as she said this. I am glad. Anakin just smiled back before the two would go on to do other things. Anakin starting the process of creating the synth army in full effect, while Hatsuko would go on to further herself further. Within the force and with her new physical bodily limitations, which only served to be a boon rather than a disadvantage. Obi-Wan was not too surprised by Anakin leaving. Well what Obi-Wan was surprised about was that he would leave so soon at a time of war to less. He had thought the boy he had seen grow up from someone that liked to help others to what he is now, would have wanted to do something for the people. Not that this war had escalated all too much, but it did. It had escalated so quickly with the introduction of Dooku now being somewhat connected to the dark side of the Force and slaughtering all of those Jedi. Not that they were in the right either, but they at least had their hearts in the right place. Which is something Obi-Wan couldn't say the other side had the rights and well-being of the innocent on the top of their priorities. Obi-Wan disliked politicians. Not that he hated them and saw that their jobs are important, but a lot of the time, politicians are usually in it for their own gain, and he was confronted by this all too often. Spending time around with Anakin, he had actually become much better as a person than he was previous, just as everyone else did. He saw things differently from the way he did before, and could say that the Jedi did have their flaws. He is still a supporter of the Jedi though, and would stay within the Order probably for the rest of his life. General Kenobi, sir, a man within a clone trooper outfit, made his appearance before Obi-Wan. Captain CT-7567. Obi-Wan nodded as he thought inwardly. This was supposed to be Anakin's job he sighed to within himself before looking at the clone. The clones had been created from Jango Fett's template and slightly altered modified to be much more capable in combat, and have less independence. At least that was what the Kaminans had said, but Obi-Wan was starting to see that the clones weren't some disposable soldier like droids for example. Despite their excellence in combat, they were living beings, and Obi-Wan knew better, especially when taking advice from his little brother figure, Anakin. He was always for some reason much wiser than even he was, and he was supposed to be the older one. A battle was going on, and Obi-Wan had been tasked as the current leader in general for the Elite 500 first clone trooper unit. That was originally to be assigned to Anakin. Now that he was gone they had given it to him as some form of replacement, not that Obi-Wan would complain. He may have at one point been a little jealous over the boy's considerable gifts, but had soon gotten over it, because he knew that he wasn't the strongest. He wouldn't even compare himself to his own master, let alone anyone else, despite him having more potential than Qui-Gon himself. His master was still better than him through and through, and that came with the territory of being aged and experienced within the Force. General Kenobi, I do believe that we are ready to go out into battle. ET-7567 said to Obi-Wan as he was within his own thoughts over the matter of the war. Okay, we will take you men and take on a slow approach. Going in when we barely have information is not a great idea. Obi-Wan. Yes, sir. ET-7567 at this point in time was quite strict when it came to following orders. He had earned himself enough merits on the battlefield of Geonosis. He had heard that he was supposed to have someone else as their general, but he had left. Even more absurd was that this person was also the Prince of the Emperor and out in the Outer Rim, that had taken over the planet Geonosis after the Republic's occupation. Everyone was chaos, and CT-7567 had no idea what was going on, but he just had to follow orders. Good soldiers follow orders, after all, 
That is right, the Jedi and a lot of others within the Republic that had some form of vested interest in Anakin was also subsequently interested in the Emperor because of the connection between the two. Even more so that an entire new order is rumored to have started up there. But no one was sent out to investigate. Not in these times of war against the CIS. And even if they were sent to investigate, they wouldn't be able to because the Republic and the Emperor had their own treaty set in place. This would bar the Jedi from being able to take any legal action into the Emperor. The Jedi and the Senate had become so close together, that while the Jedi Order is supposed to be considered a non-entity within the Republic, they were still pulled into its messes. It was bound to happen, either right now or further on into the future, because of the way this system was made. Made to be exploited. Let's go then Captain. Obi-Wan spoke to CT-7567, who had yet to have a proper name, along with all of the other clones that were currently unappreciated for within the Republic not that the people were evil. No, generally people are a herd, social creatures that will follow the leader, and whatever the leader says, goes. Yes sir. CT-7567 then spoke over his comlink connected to all of the troopers within the Elite 501st unit. This is CT-7567 speaking to all units. Our mission is a go, and for now we will be taking this by the book, just as our general has said. Multiple replies were heard over the comlink confirming to CT-7567, the current second in command, that everyone is ready to engage their enemy, the Separatists. The battle that is taking place is going to be referred to as the Battle of Arantara, a battle over some insignificant astronomical object floating within space that both the Republic and the CIS would fight over. What people didn't know was that this astronomical object known as Arantara was on no use to anyone at all, and this skirmish was only meant to further the conflict and tension between both the Republic and CIS. This battle was still taking place during the early period of the conflicts to happen during the course of the Clone Wars, and would later set up the stage for the coming conflicts in the future. Little battles like this happened all the time, and now the Jedi were forced to be a part of a conflict that even though is theirs, wasn't the way they would fight. They are not warriors or people meant to be a part of a militaristic force. They are supposed to be space monks with the ability to use magic to spread peace and prosperity throughout the galaxy. They are not meant to be generals within a war. But in times of supposed great need, they had answered the call to arms quite readily. Most probably because of their ever-binding connection to the Senate through the Republic as a whole and that it was one of their own involved. They had pride of their own, and this also probably increased their desire to participate, not even taking into account the thirst for vengeance against Doku, who had killed them. Massacred a great part of the Jedi Order in the Battle of Geonosis, despite the many more people that Anakin had inadvertently saved, either through his actions directly or indirectly through increasing the Jedi's capabilities, specifically the girls that had decided to leave with him from the Order, specifically the ones that had also participated in the Battle of Geonosis alongside all of the other Jedi. By being connected to them or by even just teaching, learning and practicing with each other, did it have an effect at better preserving life. The mission and tactics used during this battle would be vastly different from how it originally went, but CT-7567 would still find that was in over his head. He and his team hang gone in without the aid or leadership from Obi-Wan because he believed that it was best to go in. This gave someone else the chance to infiltrate and exploit the situation for himself. Anakin wouldn't be letting these clones die because Obi-Wan made a few mistakes even if they had originally been done by the original Anakin as well. Anakin knew that Kenobi was not him, and would not be able to fix the same mistakes, despite being in the exact same situation. On the battlefield it was chaos. War. War never changes. Anakin liked to think about this quote often as it was true, and will probably stay true until the very ends of time itself. In fact it would probably even stay after the end of time as well. The Galactic Republic and the Confederacy of Independent Systems was going at it, and Anakin had taken this as his chance to steal away the infamous clone trooper squad, known as the Elite 501st. To compensate the Republic he would think up of something that would cripple the CIS as well, just to make sure that both sides are still equal. He wouldn't want the scales tipping in anyone's favor other than his own. While the Republic is good and all, they are always meant to fall to the throes of the dying democracy of the Senate, while the CIS is actually a part of the grand scheme of allowing Palpatine to come into power. If the CIS manages to get an advantage in the war, then it would speed up the process in which Palpatine is able to create his own empire. Anakin still needed more time to ensure his own safety, along with the rest of his budding empire. There is always ways to become much more powerful, and he wanted all the time he would get, which was only about three years. If everything still goes similar to the timeline he knew of, he could also rely on shatter points at various points to make sure that everything is going as certain, but at the same time without the major loss of life. Preferably he wouldn't even want minor loss to life, but he can't save anyone. Despite him trying to not turn people into number, they were obsolete when it came to the grand scheme of things. The certainty and safety of numbers was unchangeable no matter what he could do, so that only meant he would try and work harder for himself, others in the galaxy at large. He would still have to deal with future intergalactic wars. Given just how much he has invested into technology, he doubts he would be able to reach the same peaceful resolution the others in the future would be able to with the use and bomb. They would absolutely hate the fact he was mechanized himself. Then there was that one force sensitive within their group pulling the strings from behind the scenes as well. It is an entire ordeal. But for now he has to for now worry about other things. Rome wasn't built in a day after all. During the battle, CT-7567 fought with merit and led his troops to the front line without Kenobi. But he was wounded and knocked unconscious. By the time CT-7567 regained consciousness, his armor was damaged. Hidden behind cover in a rocky terrain, the trooper had done his best to try and win the battle. It was unfortunate that he had gotten himself into this situation, and he was starting to regret his decisions leading up to this point. 
Think about it, clones had only practically been alive for 10 years. That is half the time. Then what their actual physicality would suggest. This means they haven't actually had the time to actually develop the normal way like normal humans or other species did. Because they are humans we will compare the clones to humans and their natural life cycle. 10 years is way too young. Way too young for most of anything these clones would be going into. But their mentality was at least of the level of adults. The special growth serum made to increase their growth also had simultaneously speed up the developments of their brains as well. I don't wanna die here. ET7567 thought to himself as he had awoken from unconsciousness. Wait, what is that? He was confused as what he saw before him was especially strange. A man he had never seen before but had most definitely heard enough about to know that this person shouldn't be here. Which lead him to believe that he may be hallucinating on his deathbed. You you are dash yes. I am me, myself and I. It was Anakin who was here. Here just for these elite clones for many reasons. The first is because he liked their potential. Second because he didn't want them to die. Just because he decided to leave the order and third. I am here to bring you back with me. I got to collect on my investment. Anakin continued to see T7567. In investment, sir. ET7567 is confused. Yes, investment. Haven't you heard about some mysterious person concerned about the health of the clones and their longevity? Anakin said in a questioning tone. ET7567 was perplexed at the line of their conversation, because they were currently out on a battlefield. Yes, he did. That person is me and I have come to collect on my investment. I will be doing this through taking you and the rest of the 501st Legion back with me to the Emperor. Anakin stated as he started to use the Force to heal the wounded trooper. E but, ET7567 exclaimed. No buts. My decision is final, and as your benefactor, I would suggest that you come with me now. I have already evacuated the rest of the 501st with me, and you are the only one left to take. It would seem the rest of your men are waiting for you and put up a little bit of a fight. Anakin said before continuing. Don't worry they aren't hurt or anything. I managed to peacefully convince that coming with me is for the best for the safety of themselves, and for the fate of the galaxy. Anakin stated. I do believe it would be best for you to come with me to better explain the situation. What about Dash General Kenobi? Good old Obi-Wan will be just fine. There is no need to worry as I have taken care of a droid here on Arantara. The Republic have won the skirmish, and it is about time that you come with me. Anakin said as he lifted CT-7567 up. They're all better. Don't you just feel great? Anakin had a smirk on his face which somehow irritated CT-7567, but was strangely familiar. You better be explaining the situation wherever you are taking me. Don't worry, the Republic won't come looking for you. You have died a heroic but tragic death as the catastrophe here will be covered up by me. Anakin said as he got the clone on board Jibitha, who had matured just enough to allow others on board other than Anakin and his loved ones. Off we go. Anakin exclaimed as Jibitha started up and took off probably never to return, and for Anakin's grand plans to start coming together. Anakin wanted the clones from the Republic for himself, his synth army, along with his droids and finally adding on the clones, if they want to will become a part of his military. Not all of his synths would join in the militaristic efforts he is trying to have prepared for the future. He wouldn't be forcing anyone to fight, and his droids that aren't actually living, but under his control through Mekuderu, would always be the main force. They may not be as good as the creativity a living being with a mind could have. That doesn't mean they are useless, as there is a lot of upsides to using them. Droids are tireless, or at least tireless to the extent that they never need to sleep, but they do need to have some way to recharge. The power source of a droid depends on the specification of the droid itself. Some have power cells that require recharging, some have internal generators requiring a fuel source, though power cells batteries are most common. Anakin didn't use internal generators as he preferred the ease of power cells, which did need recharging. Droids may need to food, water, sleep, and all the other things fleshy life usually needs, but they have their own problems. Anakin would much rather, if he had to choose between the two, either between being a droid or a human, he would choose human. Who knows what he could have been if he somehow reincarnated as a droid. It would certainly have been interesting. Ah, uh, sir. ET7567 asked Anakin as they were both standing outside of a medical bay as one of the droids was being put under the knife. Yes. Anakin questioned the clone. The place they are both at is actually on Tatrine within a medical station, but any and all living medical droids were not here. In fact, all of his living droids were nowhere to be seen, which did lead to him having to get normal droids to fill in for their previous jobs. Right now, the clone being worked on inside was being done by medical droids that weren't living. In fact, he wouldn't be having living droids being created anymore, because he will be having the sense made instead, with which they would be not only superior overall, but also have access to the Force without their midi-chlorians leaving their bodies. They would also be much more powerful as a result of using his sky seed variation implanted into them. They wouldn't gain the same eye, hair and skin color as he had, but instead it would take on forms present to their current adaptions. I was just wanting to ask about what exactly you are doing. ET7567 said to Anakin. Anakin replied, I am not doing anything, as you can see. He had a cheeky smile on his face as he said this, but CT7567 being the still tightly wound up person he has just got annoyed. What I mean, sir, is that I want to know what exactly is happening to one of my men. ET7567 said with a tinge of annoyance leaking into his voice. You will see, didn't I already tell you about the threat to the Republic and to all of those you protect? Anakin said aloud. I know that you have told about some potential threat. 
But that isn't why you have brought us here. You said something about collecting your investment. ET7567 replied. That is true, because I have invested per se within the abilities and the value of your lives. Anakin responded. There is more to this however, is while making sure every clone gets to live a good and long life is one of my intentions for what I did. That doesn't it was completely selfless. I thank you for that sir. But we are just clones. I am confused about why you would do this. To even go so far as to remain hidden as well. CT7567 said slowly and leaving off. That is because of how it would look. Politics are not an easy thing. And sometimes intrigue is required to make sure you and your people are safe. The Republic has many flaws at the moment and those flaws would lead to its downfall. Anakin stated. There was some silence as CT7567 considered his words before asking. Why did you leave the Jedi Order? There are many reasons for someone to leave anything. But if you want to truly know then you don't need to look no further than the events that has transpired over the course of history. Even within the current day and age, the Jedi Order are slowly going backwards instead of moving forwards. Anakin said to the clone, You left sir. You left as soon as the war started. Weren't you afraid of being considered cowardly? ET7567 said as he only thought about most things within the militaristic context. Cowardly. There are those that if they could with the Jedi, they would leave as well. And from my knowledge, there have been a few people leaving. Anakin said as he knew of the Jedi Order's predicament created by him. But there is just no way to change something that had gotten to that point. Not the Republic and not the Order. From what I have seen, the Jedi make fine warriors. ET7567 stated. Warriors? Is that how the Jedi want to be seen? Anakin asked. Thinking about it, CT7567 can say that he is unsure. I am unsure. On one part the Jedi seem to like the idea of peace. But on the other, they enforce such peace, usually through violent means or methods. And there it is. There is a lot wrong with the Jedi, with the Republic overall actually, and it has only become progressively worse. Anakin said before continuing as the operation to remove the chip from the clone's head was nearing its end. There is no way for recovery as the apple has become rotten to the core. I have heard a lot about you sir from General Kenobi and some other Jedi. In fact, I would say a lot of the Republic knows about you as well sir. ET7567 says before asking. I have heard that you also have some rather unique relationships with a few women, you don't have to stop there. Yes, I have a few quote unquote unique relations with women that the Jedi would not appreciate. Attachment is forbidden after all. But love in the form of compassion is considered fine, Anakin said before continuing. I know it sounds silly, in fact the Jedi don't even deny someone from having any sexual relations. But it is the attachment part that is forbidden. That sounds a lot like the clones right now. CT7567 left off. It is good that you can sympathize and even think for yourself in this situation. Anakin stated as he began to slowly change the clone's mind about their status as simple disposable soldiers. Have you ever thought about a life outside of being a clone trooper? A commander on the battlefield? No sir. It might be strange for a few. But CT7567 was used to referring to Anakin as a superior at this point. It was as if it was natural and Anakin didn't mind as he has gotten used to the same treatment from many, many others. Not even considering the fact that clones were made to be both loyal and listen to orders with hesitation. It certainly wasn't all that strange that Anakin, once a person of the Republic, would still be somewhat considered an ally within his eyes. He had not done anything to him or his men that spelled doom for them or had them be hurt in any way, except when it came to the current operation of course. Anakin had assured him thought that it is of importance to remove whatever is stuck within their heads, and one trooper was brave enough to volunteer himself. There was some more silence as the operation came to her end, and Anakin used force heal on the trooper to increase his regeneration as the medical droids helped fix him up. These chips you talked about sir, what exactly are they meant to do? Control you of course. Anakin stated simply before continuing. What else would they do? Explode. You guys aren't slaves now are you? Or are you? Anakin gave the clone a look that seemed to incite CT7567's emotions. No sir, we are not slaves. ET7567 hand to tighten his fist and grit his teeth because of Anakin's insinuation. That is good then. If you said that you were slaves to the Republic I would have to liberate you all. I have become somewhat of a figure for the freedom of the people here in the Outer Rim. Anakin said bringing the tense atmosphere back down. ET7567 was strangely enough relieved of his anger as if it was washed away or even absorbed by something. He felt incredibly strange at this feeling. Did you know as a force sensitive person who has access to space magic? I could influence your thoughts and emotions if I wanted. Anakin said all of a sudden. It isn't instantaneous or anything like that, and it also isn't perfect. But it is something I can do. What are you implying sir? ET7567 thought back to the strangeness of not feeling angry anymore. Did you? Yes, that was me. Anakin answered. ET7567 didn't know whether or not he should feel afraid or relieved by the fact Anakin would share this with him. Why did you tell me this? Because it is something that you will, or would got through. Maybe not necessarily you, but it could and would happen to others within the clones. There is a reason you guys were made years before the war started. Anakin said, come now. Anakin then continued, we should go and share this evidence with the rest of your men. It would be improper of me to not share this. He lifted up the chip that had been taken out, and the trooper he had it taken out, had a very, very fast recovery. Right. ET7567 answered as he followed after Anakin into another room where he would address everyone. Behavioral modification biochips, also known as inhibitor chips, control chips, and behavioral inhibitor biochips, were a type of organic biochip capable of dictating or responding to the thoughts of its host. Kamen and cloners implanted them within each clone trooper in the Grand Army of the Republic at the third stage of their embryonic development. Anakin had said a lot of stuff, 
that needed to dumb down most of the medical speak, as he knew that the clones weren't grown to have genius level intellect, or even have advanced medical knowledge. They were born and bred, no created to be soldiers or commanders themselves, and their training reflected that. The chips that were within their brains could very well lead to them doing things that they don't want to, and is past the point of hypnosis. No, with hypnosis one could only get someone to do things that they were okay with doing. An example would be trying to force someone to kill themselves. But that is impossible, because someone's survival instincts are just too strong. No, what Sidious wanted was something that enabled him to take control of the entire clone army, and get them to do exactly what he wanted. They were implanted in the clone troopers of the Grand Army of the Republic on the suggestion of Jedi Master Sifo Dias, who initially ordered the clone army as a contingency against the clones being given orders by rogue Jedi. In this instance Anakin wasn't considered a rogue Jedi, but just someone that had left, so it didn't really apply to him. The control chips were extremely effective at taking over the minds of those who had been implanted with them, erasing all existing biases and beliefs in the clone troopers. There were cases of immunity that existed within the clones, but it is was usually for clones that were considered genetically defective or modified in some way. Even if such clones were not immune, their mutations could still interfere with their chip's performance. In such cases, chips could be amplified to make clones totally loyal. Immunity, however, was not absolute. It was possible for the chip to be fully activated and induce brainwashing, as long as it remained present through means such as head injuries. Clones whose chips were removed after activation, still remembered what they had done under its influence. As you can see here, these chips are not the usual mechanical chips one would usually see, but are instead made up entirely out of cells. Anakin stated to the 501st Clone Legion, the biochips were, as the name indicated, made out of biological material, specifically genetically engineered cells. The DNA of the chip's cells was different from that of the clones they were implanted in. They were microscopic in size, and this combined with their biological nature, made them extremely difficult to detect with standard medical equipment. It took a level 5 atomic brain scan to find the chip inside the head to see whether any anomalies existed. The chips were durable, with malfunctions being rare. There would be a minimal, absolute minimal amount of cases regarding this, and it could prove to be fatal. So you are telling us that these things could kill us, and also force us to kill others? A clone's woes designation was CC1119 asked. Yes, effectively as well, with no flaws except in those special cases, someone could resist or be immune in a sense. It is still better to get these things out of your heads. What about the rest of the clones in the Republic? Shouldn't we inform them of this problem? ET7567 questioned as that was his concern right now. He fully believed Anakin at this point even aware as he is that he could influence the thoughts and emotions of those around him. He had not felt that strange feeling of having his emotions be sapped from him, and as far as he could tell, there was no changing of his thoughts or the way he thought. Do you really think that is a good idea? We would alert the person behind this and be unable to save a lot of people in the process. There is no telling what this person could do if it was found out their plans are discovered. Anakin said, It wouldn't be a good idea to reveal to the entirety of the galaxy of Palpatine's little plan, even with the evidence, as he could try and make the clones do a mass suicide. It is entirely possible for this to happen, and no one would be able to stop it. No, Anakin wanted to make sure that he saved as many lives as possible, and that required a bit of diplomacy plus intrigue. Anakin would then have the entirety of the 501st Legion go through the operation to get rid of the chips, and restore their safety, in knowing they wouldn't do anything they wouldn't. It was a big relief off of their shoulders, and they started to trust Anakin more and more time went on. Now, the next step is, Anakin and the Emperor were snowballing their borders, and it didn't affect anyone else, because the systems that have come under his control weren't owned or controlled by anyone. So it was free real estate. When it came to those planets close to him that were under the control of some minor power, he wouldn't take them over. At least not at this point as he will await for the CIS and the Republic to go further into their own conflicts. There was also the possibility of just straight up buying some planets, but that wasn't really the best course of action. He first had to consider the distribution of resources and the population before trying to expand. He had to wait for the conditions to be just right before doing anything that would be spending the accumulated resources he had built up, whether those be his own personal funds that just continued to grow and grow or the funds the Empire had at its disposal. If he did want to expedite the process however, he could always use his own wealth if he really wanted or needed to. He had done so at the start and through some rough patches, as the Emperor was developing a few years back, so it is still an option now. Obviously this isn't the best option as the best would be to make sure the Emperor could run just fine all by itself without his interference. It would require him setting up a system that wouldn't fall behind the times to adapt to evolve and above all else keep the core concepts of what had started. Culture, heritage, religion, all of that is important to a developing society, as it will dictate the norms of the society, and as it has changed or influenced in some ways, the system would also have to reflect this. The only thing is that Anakin may not be able to automate the entirety of this process no matter what he does, and it would forever need a real person in charge. A leader that could stand for eternity or at least be replaced, and even though he could do that, it wouldn't exactly be best, if he had to continuously do all the work. He wanted to do other things as well, and he did notice that his mother was getting tired of doing it. He wasn't as patient as her, meaning that he made more of this much faster. Either that or he could develop a desire to take over the rest of the universe to keep him busy with other things. After the Galactic Empire, the huts and the use in Vongla dealt with, there would be no other enemies. At least there really shouldn't be. But it is entirely possible that conflict would still happen over time. Rebellions, people that are ambitious or greedy enough to try and crave themselves out of the Empire. All kinds of situations like wanting independence, another example of what could happen once the Emperor reaches that level. 
There is never an end to life until the end of course, and even then, so what are we supposed to do then? ET7567 questioned Anakin. Anakin had gotten rid of the implanted chips, and now they were clueless on what happens next. Soldiers without orders, especially those that had just into the conflict, were the most conflicted on what they are supposed to do. What do you mean what are you guys supposed to do? That is up to you guys to decide. You want slaves just as you have said, and are now you all are free to choose your next course of action, Anakin stated. Sir, if I may add, but wouldn't it be better if you helped out the Republic for real? ET7567 asked after hearing what Anakin said. Get involved in the war between two other foreign nations. I thought I had gone over why this is probably the wrong decision, Anakin said, as he looked over all of the other clones gathered within the medical or research center of Tatooine. I understand that, sir. But it would end the war soon dash. CT7567 was interrupted as Anakin said. That is where you are wrong again. Think about it. If the separatists are the excuse used by the person controlling everything behind the scenes to become more powerful, do you think he would allow it to end so soon? Anakin questioned. Sound logic sir. Then that means we would have to wait and laze around while everything is going on. What about the rest of my brothers and dash CT7567 was getting quite passionate. But Anakin put his worries to ease. You don't have to worry. Of course it wasn't as simple as saying this. I have a plan. Of course Anakin has a plan because he fully intended to become the god of droid kind, now becoming the god of the entirety of the empire. Of course it was all within his plan not. Sometimes, happy little accidents happen, and Anakin can't help but think that maybe he never did have a plan in the first place, and just followed his desires. Whether they be for money, power, land, fame or women, it still happened in a way that helped progress himself and elevate those around him into a great deal of prosperity. There are some things that had seemed totally out of his grasp, like the Jedi Order and the Republic, and whatever else is within the galaxy at large. He can't control everything. But he could stack the cards in his favor, and when the time comes for it, he would be able to do a new reverse card if need be. You saying that, sir, isn't really that reassuring. CT7567 said, Nonsense, my friend. We are friends, right? Anakin says as he slings his arm around CT7567 before saying, I do believe that as good friends I should give you a proper name. But, sir, I already have an identity. ET7567 is my code, and dash CT7567 started to say before being cut off. Nonsense. You can't be going around with a name like that because it isn't a proper name at all. Anakin stated before continuing. How about Rex? I like that name, and it seems to suit you just fine. Rex, sir. ET7567 was hesitant in accepting this as his new name as it really wasn't supposed to be allowed. But there aren't exactly rules against having a name, sir. Rex, yes. Anakin replied separating himself from the newly named Rex's shoulder. I think that it sounds good, but how about my men? They get to have names as well, right? ET7567, now to be called as Rex said. That is not for me to decide. If your men want it, they can have as many names as they would like. You see out here in the outer rim. Or more specifically with the much more safe and ordered emperor and people are free to choose stuff like that. Anakin said, why be restricted to the one you were given at birth? Or in your case creation. That sounds just fine actually. Rex started to change his way of thinking, and was slowly starting to accept becoming a part of the Emperor. It is nice even when they had been confined for a little bit within this facility. It was quite nice. There was no war to fight in and no orders to take, and they didn't exactly need to listen to Anakin even when he is the leader here. No, they could leave at any point. The proof was in the pudding. Because Anakin had given them access to all of the codes that would allow them to leave, and even fly straight back to the Republic. Not one of them did that though as they had gotten comfortable within this place. Soon enough, they would be ready to move out into the world at large, maybe even start families of their own. A strange concept to them, is not one of them believed they would have the time to think on such topics, or even be able to do so, considering they might die out on the battlefield. If it wasn't for Anakin creating a solution to their rapid aging problem, they may have not lived long enough to do so, even if they did survive the war. Either way they would have been in a bad spot to not consider themselves as living people with their own traits and desires, despite them being near exact complete copies of each other. Then it is settled then. We can gather everyone around and if they want a name, I could grant them their names to the best of my ability. Anakin said as Rex was now sold of the idea of at least gaining names. Something to truly make them people of their own as names are considered important to the process of being a person. They may have been created instead of born like most other races do. But that didn't mean anything to Anakin, or to anyone else out here within the Emperor as well. No one cared. Every now and then, they would go out into the seat of power of the Emperor, known as Tatrayan, and be greeted to the culture here. It was a life they could get used to, of course they would need to do the whole therapy thing. Because Anakin didn't want unstable elements, bringing potential harm to the people that already live here. No matter what, no matter how much compassion it is always best to err on the side of caution. Another thing to think about was a clone's capability to reproduce. Because while Anakin didn't mind too much if they could, it would have been a problem if he didn't have the super serum or the medical technology to overcome inbreeding. One may ask why would this be a problem? Simple, they are clones, and because they are clones and there are a lot of them, imagine releasing them into the population with no restrictions, and they start having families like crazy. Sooner or later the problem of inbreeding would happen, so there needed to either be a solution, or there had to be a way to eliminate the problem. He didn't feel particularly good about chemically sterilizing these men, just because they are clones. Thankfully the galaxy is diverse enough, and not every clone would have children, or even be able to have them, simply because they don't want to. Not every one person wants to pass on a legacy and it's understandable. The super serum would fix all of those genetic deficiencies if it got to that point. And if he was to truly crunch some numbers, 
then it would be fine either way. The amount of clone made at this point in time should only be within the hundred thousands range, while his population at this point ranges in the trillions fast approaching the quadrillion range. That may seem like a lot, but one has to consider that he probably only started out with a couple thousand before the great expansion into other planets. This came with an increase to the populace as people started having families of their own or people immigrated into the Emperor and other factors. Slaves wanting to escape their fate from the slave trade that had successfully survived, and now even those running away from the war going on between the Separatists and Republic. Anakin would proceed to help the newly dubbed Rex name all of those within the 501st Legion of the Republic, or are they still of the Republic anymore? They had been given ample evidence of something going on that was beyond their understanding, and if it happened just as planned, it would have been devastating. What would happen to the Republic? What would happen to the rest of the clones? The Jedi? What about everyone within the Republic? The citizens that are innocent but mislead by some falsehood of a leader. Someone that didn't want to do what is best for the people but for themselves. It is truly insanity the world had come to, and they, the clones had been born into it with the sole purpose to be controlled, and eventually thrown away. They are disposable through and through. But here, they felt valued at the very least. The leader, Anakin, his people and the society was tolerant of their presence. Of course, as long as it didn't cause any harm or detriment to the people, they were fine to stay here. They all had their decision to make, but Rex knew that everyone here would stay. If not to become a part of the Emperor, but to become a part of some form of plan that was made by Anakin to overcome this momentous threat. Grievous had this little tingly feeling at the back of his head. It was the process of returning to a body that was his but not his at the same time. Once his transfer of consciousness is complete, he would finally be able to breath again, and Anakin had made sure too that he would keep his ability to use the Force. It was something he had been gifted, and he doesn't know what he would do without it. It had gotten him out of a lot of predicaments, and he would finally be able to take up some proper lightsaber training. Anakin would train him fully, instead of just some simple stuff here and there in combination with his mechanical armor. He would be able to truly appreciate and love the woman he had come to love. He had thought he would never love again when his previous lover died all those years ago, but it would seem that he was wrong. His name that he attributed to her would still be kept in tribute to her and a show of his devotion, but that didn't mean he would not learn to love again. He had already and would be truly silly if he decided to not give it a chance. How does it feel then? Anakin asked him as he stepped out. But Anakin wasn't looking at him, because he didn't want to stare at another man's body. Understandable, because Grievous doesn't want his master staring either. It feels great. He was finally able to move again freely without those bogged down mechanical parts. Not that they are useless. In fact his body had been made by the same strange material Anakin has used for the synths. He didn't get the upgrades of the Sky Seed, but he got his own super serum. That was for his species in particular along with a cybernetic body. That is right, as while it is fully cellular based, it also his machine merged into him. Grievous can entirely recreate his arms from his previous self but they appeared similar to how Anakin's nano suit worked. It manifested itself and was made of nanites that are attached to him and his consciousness fully becoming a part of him. If he were to die and have a spiritual form, it would include these bits and pieces, just as Anakin would have his very own included in his own spiritual form. By the way, yes, Anakin had a distinct feeling that what was said next will be surprising. It is about Talzin, Grievous said. She wants to arrange a political alliance based on a marriage between yourself and someone from her tribe. That is interesting. By the way Grievous started as he was thinking of a way to broach the topic of alliances through marriage to Anakin. In a few days time he would be having his own official marriage, and it wouldn't be that good to bring this up now. But it was the best he would get. Yes, Anakin had a distinct feeling that what was said next will be surprising. It is about Talzin. Grievous said, she wants to arrange a political alliance based on a marriage between yourself and someone from her tribe. That is interesting. Anakin said while contemplating what Grievous had just said to him. Emperor. Grievous voiced himself to make sure Anakin was still listening. Yeah. Anakin was shaken from one of his multiple thought processes that had been working on other things. Siri was not the other administrator of the Matrix setup. The whole entirety of the system was run in combination of her multiple processes, along with his own developmental facilities. If I may suggest, there have been two options given by Talzin. Grievous said to Anakin who was listening, There is a woman, whom she has said she had to give up a long time ago, due to some certain circumstances. Her name, if I remember correctly, is a Sag Ventress. Go on. Apparently she is somewhere out there right now, and it would be prudent of us to find her and bring her back to her tribe. It would be a great political move both from within and outside for the people to see us rescuing the girl. Who is the second option? While Ventress was attractive in her own right, Anakin had a feeling that she would be trouble. No, it would be better to see the full list of options first before he made his decision. Unfortunately for him, he only had two, and while the first woman is around eight to nine years his senior, the next option is better but still bad. Then there is another girl. But she is younger than you are, and is currently about the same age as your now apprentice Ahsoka. Really? Anakin didn't want to have to deal with another girl younger than him. Not because he liked older women or anything even though that has been within his target range. That doesn't mean he wouldn't get involved with someone younger than him. The fact of the matter is that these girls are still within an age range he is not comfortable being in any meaningful relationship with. Talzin said this second candidate's name is Marin, and she is quite the perspective amongst her people, and she said you would be most pleased with her, of course. Even with changing their culture to be more tolerant of men, that doesn't mean they would change everything. Anakin thought to himself as it is actually quite common for children to be paired and married off to each other. It was like this for the simple fact of the matter. That mortality rates were so high, that the times demanded that people very young have children to help stabilize their 
population. Her age, Anakin wanted to know the exact age because if he chooses the younger option, it would mean he would have to wait. That would feel creepy, just as it was feeling slightly creepy for him, now that Ahsoka had unintentionally bonded with him in that way. While there are technically a lot of age ranges for marriage and betrothals and the age of consent, blah, 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 that didn't mean anything much to him because he would still follow some of his previous life's morals. Not out of some insane sense on wanting to hold on to the past, but because that is what he had gotten used to. He thought of those above a certain age as adults, and thought of those below a certain age as children. As simple as that. I believe that Talzin said she was born six years after you were. So that would make her 14 years of age this year compared to Ahsoka, you apprentice of 15. Grievous answered from the knowledge handed over to him by Talzin. Grievous was told that if she had to pick then it would be Mirren, because she was the easiest option right now, and quite possibly the best out of the two. Considering other factors it is incredibly likely Ventress had died by now, and Talzin didn't hold out much hope. Of course Ventress is alive and is actually thriving at this point of time. Specifically she should be training under Dooku, as his new Sith assassin and somewhat apprentice. But Dooku didn't really take her as an apprentice. She would still be classified as such by others though. So my choice is between a 14-year-old girl and a 28-year-old woman. That may or may not be alive. Anakin asked thinking the situation was ridiculous. But considering stuff like this happened within his past life, and the fact that Padme, at the age of 14, was elected to rule over an entire civilization, it was probably very much in line with the logic of this universe. Of course, if Ventress is not alive, then that would mean Talzin only has one choice left to her as other women of her tribe are either married often have partners of their own or otherwise. Grievous supplied why exactly these were the only two options. What value does this Marin girl have compared to Ventress? Anakin knew of both of these people, and knew of the value either one would have to him if he were to accept. It is within his best interest to do so. But he would still not be going through with this. Why would he? It was one thing if he was also the same age if not similar. But the age gap was still a little too big at the moment, because she is still a child. Well, Merin is younger so obviously that is the plus and other things like proper force-sensitive training by the Night Sisters, compared to Ventress, who we have no knowledge of. Stop right there. I think I will decline this offer. I thought you would say that. Grievous within his new body was still giddy over his new form, and had been getting used to his new muscles. His body was aged however, both at his request and because Anakin couldn't reverse his aging without grinding some form of immortality, which is something he wouldn't do. It is great to know that you know me so well. Anakin stated as the situation was decided, and while Talzin may dislike this decision, she would just have to live with it. At this point, there is nothing she could do to bring him over to her side more than what she has already done. There was also no reason to antagonize Anakin as well, since they have only ever had, well, nearly almost always has Talzin and the Night Sister ever had positive interactions with Anakin. I don't mind being in a some form of treaty with them, but I dislike the idea of being forced into a marriage. I am sure the girl, whether it be Ventress that may be dead and Meren that is young, would also appreciate my sentiments. Anakin said as he walked off leaving Grievous to get used to his new body all by himself. A little help would have been appreciated. Grievous called out as Anakin just left laughing internally at Grievous' struggles. He is kind and compassionate, but that doesn't he would just give it out like it means nothing. Grievous has done a lot for him and they are close. But they could only be considered friends, and Anakin believes that it is fine to mess with your friends every once in a while. He had already shown that he cared enough to remake him his entire body, with upgrades, so he just left. It didn't stop him from taking pleasure in knowing that Grievous would struggle for a bit however to regain his bearings. Another thing about the whole age matter, is that he wouldn't have minded that much if Meren is older, and he wouldn't mind that much if Ventress was younger as well. Not that he didn't already have a few women older than him in a relationship with himself. Padme and Isla are too, then there is Shark who is connected to him through a dyad, and finally Xana, who is quite possibly the oldest out of all the women. No, she is the oldest as she was born a whopping 1000 years before the current date, give or take a few years. Barris is a year younger than himself, while Renala is also older than him. Now that I think about it, does the Force like pairing me with older women? Or is this just my preference? Anakin thought to himself. But, the Force also paired me with Ahsoka, so there must be something going on there. There was some silence as he came to a stop. No. Let's not think of this matter now because within the next few days there will be a grand event taking place. Unfortunately it would seem that most of the guests for Isla and Barris may be unable to make it Anakin thought to himself. It is okay. They will have me. Anakin laughed to himself cockily. Okay? Maybe it isn't okay, but delaying the wedding wouldn't be good as everything else has already been planned. Anakin wanted to allow for the Jedi to come here on time. The guests included people like Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, Luminara, Quinlan Vos, even good old mace. But they are busy with the war. More so than there would be to have a few breaks here and there because of his actions. Meaning they would be unable to come. Which of course sad embarrass and Isla as Luminara was sort of like a mother figure to her. While Quinlan is a father figure for Isla. This just makes it easier for him though. As he wouldn't have to do the whole bullshit face the father thing. It was usually over the top. And he would also do the same thing. This is hypocritical of him. But this is one of those times that it would be allowed as for some reason it is universal for fathers to be overly protective of their daughters. That didn't mean they had any real right to dictate their children's love life as it is their own. So all he would be doing is scaring handsome more and waiting to see if he still has Luke and Leah with Padme, just as the Force designs. It wouldn't be out of reason for something like this to still happen. Thankfully he had already given everything he is connected to through a diet eternal life already, otherwise they would be aging while he didn't. A few more days, 
A few more says later, indeed, everyone, well near everyone that is meant to attend this ceremony had come. The family of the groom, which is Anakin and the families of the brides, had also come on this fine evening. Tatooine usually isn't the best place to set the atmosphere, but Anakin didn't mind as he could create the atmosphere himself. He did do it, as it wouldn't be the best for the girls. Those in attendance is actually quite a few people, now that he thinks about it. Those that had come weren't anyone from the Jedi or even anyone from the Republic or CIS, both of whom he had signed treaties with. They must have more important things to do. He thought to himself as he would transform his nano suit for every bride-to-be. He decided to go along with each of their cultural background to better respect them, as for all three girls their species and heritage played a part in their development. Traditional clothing from Nabu was copied for himself, and he allowed the nano suit to create the illusion that he was actually wearing a proper suit. Then came the traditional garb of the Twi'lek when doing their ceremonies in relation to finding a partner, and the last but not least morale and cultural getup. He put in the effort because he wanted to, and it would also show to everyone in attendance and no doubt, when it is broadcasted to everyone, that the Emperor is quite the diverse and tolerant empire. Meaning that any and all are welcomed, because even the soon to be crowned Emperor himself would get married to three people of differing species, that he may or may not be able to even have children with. Well, of course he would be able to have children with Padme, but the other two are a different story. That was until you took into account that he had already modified it, so that he would be capable of impregnating any species. The way he did this was a unique method that allowed him to bypass the whole hybrid situation, and instead of the children between himself and someone from a differing species being spliced, they would come out completely like the mother. The mother's species would be predominant while features from his own genetic code would be passed on like hair, skin or eye coloring. He did this because it was the easiest way to get around having to overly transform himself as well. I, Padme Amidala Naberi, take you, Anakin Skywalker, to be my husband. I, Isla Sakura, take you, Anakin Skywalker, to be my husband. I, B. Barisofi, take you, Aani Dash Barris was stuttering badly when it was her turn to participate, while Padme and Isla had already gone through this before. They were still nervous, don't get Anakin wrong. It was because they just had to do it in front of so many people now, and potentially to the rest of the galaxy as an audience, if they so choose. I mean, Anakin S. Skywalker, to be my husband. Barris finally properly finished and everyone's ceremonies went on their own pace, finishing one after the other and now, within his own Emperor, the Skywalker family had increased by few more members, officially. Isla Skywalker Ni Sakura, Padme Amidala Skywalker Nina Berry, and Barris Skywalker Ni Elfie. A small passionate moment of public affection passed by as Anakin would proceed to passionately kiss them, when it was their turn to go through with the ceremony. It wasn't the typical everyday thing to witness, but there was a lot of people to witness it in full grand scale. It would seem that it is time to finally have some passionate baby making with Padme. Anakin was thinking naughtily right now as he was full of certain energies as of this moment. Of course, he thought of Padme in this instance because of two reasons. The first being that he can sense her want for him and the other two weren't particularly in the mood as of this moment. The second and arguably the better reason is that she is technically his second wife. That seems a bit backwards. There are no ranks it doesn't change the fact that she is the second to be married to him, after Isla, and she hadn't gotten her fair share of sexy time with him, so it is only right for him to fulfill her needs, just as she would try, but probably fail to fulfill his. But that is what practice is all about. Another joyous event for the people of the Emperor would be happening this very day. It isn't the same day as the wedding had taken place as that would have been silly. No it was taking place the day after of course. Okay, maybe it is a bit silly, but not like there was anyone complaining except Anakin, as he had chosen to do this because he could see that Shmai was not really wanting to do the job anymore. What's more is that this is probably the day he also introduces his own legion of warriors, or at least those of the living droids, that had been converted into what he is calling Primrose since were going to be revealed. All because the crowning ceremony is taking place as the droids. Now since were hard at work making sure that they would be in full capacity to show off to the world. They wanted to do it, and Anakin thought that it is fine at this point. Hopefully no one takes this as some sort of declaration of war. Not that it is, but only meant to put some fear into a few people eyeballing the Emperor. No doubt they would be scared off sometimes people People can be done though. Joined here today, we are here to witness the grand event of the prince being crowned the Emperor of the Emperor. A news crew was recording the entire event. But it wasn't just one, it was a few. Just as the wedding had been recorded as well by these stations, whether they be a part of Skywalker Industries subsidiary, Skywalker Entertainment or by others that have started up their own business or company within the industry. Of course Anakin had the wedding recorded for other purposes as well. And it wasn't just to remember or reminisce and be nostalgic about what had happened in the past. No, it was also being used as a sort of political and cultural move within the Emperor. If the people saw Anakin's tolerance of other species and even engaged in romantic relations, then they too would be fine with it. Not that most people weren't already. But he is sure that there are some that would preach about human superiority within, if he showed that even he, himself, the divine savior, god or whatever else they think or believe him to be, then it would set a precedent that would make sure those that want human supremacy over others to die down. The officiating process that has him becoming the emperor is not that complicated, and it is just Shmai passing over the title to him. She would become the Empress Dowager, a title that is common within monarchs, as it signified the queen or empress that was before. It usually meant a widow with a title or property derived from her late husband, which she doesn't have a late husband or one at all. However in this context, it signifies her now becoming a part of the now line of people to sit on the throne. Shmai is the first and she is given a title for it, then Anakin is second, and he doesn't know when he would hand this title down. Preferably it would go towards his children in the future, which it probably will. 
There are no other real noble or royal type families within the Emperor and the people seem okay with that. But there are some wealthy families starting to come into existence. The Emperor is still fine when it comes to the system and improvements are constantly being made every day. As you can see, we have in attendance many people here today, from the officials elected into office along with other dignitaries. The news announcer was speaking towards a camera. Look over there. The cameraman panned and zoomed in on other famous people that were allowed into the event as while Anakin didn't mind the common people. It just wouldn't be right. It is impossible to have everyone witness this in person, so he had to choose the best people to attend, and who better than celebrities, officials, dignitaries, even the current Queen of Naboo is here considering the alliance that was formed just yesterday. She is here to show her support, and even Talzin had made a trip out all the way to here, and he could see the young Meryn that was brought along with her. It didn't surprise him that she would try and bring the prospective betrothal candidate with her. Sighing inwardly he thinks to himself, Talzin is very persistent to even bring the girl here, today of all days. There is Grievous, and others within the military as well. There is the Prince as one can see his extremely good looks that exemplifies his air and dignity as the next Emperor. The news reporter continued talking Anakin up, before moving the attention of the camera towards those next to him. And would you look at that? It is the three Empresses to be, Isla Skywalker, Padme Skywalker and Barriss Skywalker. Anakin had to have his now new wives be with him during the event, as it would negatively impact his public face, if his wives weren't here to support him. Not that they aren't or wouldn't be supportive as they had stopped anything they had planned for this event. Of course he would repay them all back, and then some for their supportiveness as just as much they gave to him, he would give to them. Ahsoka was also with Anakin, while Xana and Ranala both weren't in attendance. The both of them are sulking. Sana because even though she knows why she is feeling this way at this point, it doesn't mean she likes it. Not that she doesn't support Anakin, nor that she doesn't like him because she does. Renala is a little different because she is the most twisted of the girls Anakin had interacted with, and while the whole crazy in love thing can sometimes be romanticized, it is also bad. Anakin is also possessive, yes, but that doesn't he is overly so that he would be like her. No, he loves the three of his current wives because he just does as simple as that. While he knows Renala has an obsession with him, rather than actually feelings of wanting to be committed or be in a proper relationship, he would have considered her feelings a bit more if they were genuine and real in those emotions of love, but it isn't. There she is. The cameraman had to swivel around, and the erratic behavior was not something they couldn't control. It zoomed in on the current Empress of the Emperor and Empress Shmai Skywalker. It is the Empress. Quickly, look at this everyone. The Empress has finally arrived, and she is here to deliver the crown over to the Prince. It is finally happening. The news person said, Hello everyone. Shmai's voice was heard loud and clear as the crowd outside the palace quieted down, and everyone within turned their attention to what is about to happen. I have a lot to say but have little time to actually say it all. I am sure that there are many of you here today that are only interested in the food. Shmai says which prompts those within the palace to laugh a bit, since there was exactly that. A person that was immensely interested in the food that they hadn't even realized the crowning ceremony is just beginning. Some of you are here are only interested in getting to better know those around you, to make connections to either each other or the emperor to be, my son. The people remain silent in respect of Shmai. Then there are those that are here to support the event, the crowning, and even though there may not be everyone wanting this to happen, I can assure you that Anakin will lead by example. He is my son and I may be biased, but I can say without it that I full-heartedly believe that he will do so. Shmai continued, he has taken into consideration that I wish to leave the throne, and because of that he has stepped up to the challenge. She continued, just as everyone knows of the wedding that had taken place just yesterday, they might be confused by the fastness of why the ceremony is happening today. I will answer those doubts as we are officially trying to expand our efforts to make sure the outer rims are free from slavery. All of those we come to have peacefully seceded their control over their planets to us, and for that I wish to thank you all. Without more land, more planets to help build this empire, we would be in a tough spot. Some people here are also worried about the Emperor joining in on the efforts of war, but we will not be doing so. Shmai continued, We may not be the most peace-loving of people, but that doesn't mean we are hungry and bloodthirsty for war, as that would be detrimental to the preservation of life. No, myself and Anakin have a certain line and beliefs we follow. Looking around, Shmai sees that there are a few getting bored of the long speech, so she decides to just wrap it up quickly and hand over everything to Anakin. I can see that there are those that don't appreciate long speeches. This gets some giggles from the people within as it is true that having speeches that are too long are quite boring. Even if it is meant to mean something important or special, a person could get lost in the moment and not realize that time is being wasted by frivolity. After a bit of silence, Shmai then proceeds to get up from her seat, which just so happened to be the throne, and Anakin is at the center of attention. She walks down to him as he bows his head like they had all planned it, and while he had copied the basic crowning ceremony from his previous life, it still worked. Shmai didn't have a crown, and Anakin didn't intend to have a crown per se, to symbolize his power within the Emperor. A crown is easily lost and what if someone manages to steal it? It would negatively impact the public look of the Empire. While the Chinese government are obsessed with face, Anakin is also sort of as well. Not that he wants to look good among others no matter what, but the Emperor needs to look good to continue to improve. If they are shown to be somewhat peaceful in nature, others won't feel threatened if they expand a little more within the surrounding star systems. What was used instead to represent the sovereignty of the nation was a necklace, sort of like the Amulet of Kings from the Elder Scrolls. It was christened with a large blue stone that was luminescent as it radiated power. It was in fact one of the stones Anakin had gotten from that species, and used to create his living droids. It was 
quite beautiful as it was shaped properly into a nice look gem even though it isn't a gem. Shmai places it around his neck and backs away and rejoins his wives in the crowd. He gets up and faces everyone with the amulet that looks like the amulet of kings. But instead of a red gem, it was a glowing blue stone. Why this stone one may ask? It is significant because it is attached to the Force, and given that Anakin is the child of the Force, wouldn't this mean an amulet like this should have some form of connection to him? Maybe not to the Origins, but it also has decoration that symbolizes his origins of Tatooine as well. This is something others would be unable to steal simply because of the next action. Anakin's nano suit power armor shifted and twisted turning into his regal outfit, and there was something in the center, a piece that was missing that would perfectly fur this amulet. The suit merged the amulet into itself, and it gave off a new feeling, as it created a pulse felt throughout the entirety of the planet. The entirety of the people from the Emperor and felt this feeling as they watched. It is finally done. Anakin thought to himself as the crowd was still quiet, and would be until a special event happens. He sits on the throne and as he does so, something amazing happens, as Anakin doesn't like talking much he will let his actions or the actions of those under him do the speaking. What is that? On the outside of the palace, there were ships, and the people would have been sacred if they didn't identify as a part of the Emperor. It was the synths, and they were ready to present themselves to the world at large. A great display was held as the synths started to recite multiple things. Long live the Emperor. Long live the Emperor. They were all geared up in their power armor, and most of this army is made up of men. The droids did like the idea of physical strength over physical appearance. That some of the living droids had decided to do. There were multiple people, and they weren't just staying on the ground and creating a scene like that. No. They were flying through the use of the Force as they had learnt to do so through Anakin, and with their increased capabilities to learn the Force because of his cells, it was easier for them to do so. Flowing through all, there is balance. They would recite this in the words Long live the Emperor in a glorious display. There is no peace without a passion to create. There is no passion without peace to guide. Knowledge fades without the strength to act. Power blinds without the serenity to see. There is freedom in life. There is purpose in death. There was something different about the last line however as their fanaticism was. No, is at an all-time high. The Force is the Emperor and the Emperor is the Force. The Force is the God Emperor. Long live the God Emperor. In the end, the citizens would start to join in as well as they chanted his name, and if one had the ability to see and hear everything, they would be able to see the absolute madness of the Emperor. On every single one of the planets within the Emperor, the denizens were taking part in this chant. Long live the Emperor, indeed. Anakin thought to himself as people didn't notice it. But the gem now that was in the middle of Anakin's chest was changed colors for a split second. In had become purple, the same color as his eyes before returning to the color of blue. Long live the God Emperor. Something else was tacked on, and now people were starting to refer to Anakin as the God Emperor. That was something, wasn't it? Isla said as Anakin was now the crown monarch of the Emperor. Officially it was him in charge, no longer needed to manipulate from the shadows, and instead would be able to do things in the open. It certainly was. Arnie, you didn't tell us that you had this planned. Padme responded to what Isla said and then continued in a questioning tone. No, I didn't because it wasn't originally my plan to expose them. He replied as they were within the throne room, and everyone else had left with only the necessary droids doing some work here and there. There was a fact that was left out, and that was Anakin never bowed or even got on one knee to purpose, because that felt stupid. In his previous life he felt that it was stupid and in this one he did think of the act as the same. He didn't want the girls he was marrying to get on their knees, and beg him to get married to them, and he didn't want to do the same. They surely didn't want that either, and it was not something he would have done no matter what. It was a silly concept, and it may have been his pride, but he would still never understand why others did this. If you love someone and they love you, then simply asking should be enough instead of having to do a grand display of your devotion. This is besides what is being currently talked about however. Then what was your plan? When were you going to tell us you have had an entire army like this? Padme gave him a pointed look and knowing her views of the galaxy, he could only sigh as it may take a little time to convince her this is necessary. It shouldn't be that hard to see it from my point of view, right? He said in response. And what is your point of view exactly? Shark was there present among the others as well. Safety, protection, intimidation factor. These three things are important, at least I believe it to be important especially in the times we are currently in. I agree with Arnie. Ahsoka spoke up here backing him up, and he smiled at her, which caused a certain emotion within her, which may or may not be connected to romantic feelings. Maybe I shouldn't have done that Anakin thought to himself even though he did appreciate that Ahsoka would stand by his decision here. Whatever, what's done is done. Ahsoka, you aren't supposed to take his side in this instance. Barris goes up to her and pinches her cheeks. Zoe, Zoe. Ahsoka exclaims as her cheeks got sore from being pinched. What are they anyway? From what I could sense, they are all force sensitive. Isla added as she was remembering just what she was feeling through the force in relation to the sense. They were droids. Anakin stated. What? Droids? Padme exclaimed confused as she had the least amount of knowledge out of everyone here. And what do you mean they were droids? You mean to tell me? No, us that these living people are droids or were droids at some point. Padme is aware of Anakin's technological intelligence, but this seemed a bit far-fetched even with knowing that space magic can do many things. Yes, there are a lot of things that I don't tell you all, and I don't intend to tell you everything, just as I will not pry into what you guys hide from me, if anything at all because I love my privacy just as much as you guys would like yours. Anakin said, privacy. This is not about privacy. Padme was exasperated as even though she agrees with him, he completely avoided what she actually wanted answered. Can you actually answer my question now? Sighing, Anakin 
Anakin answers. Sure, it isn't like it is all that bad anyway. Anakin would then proceed to tell everyone about how he had created living droids capable of thoughts and have actually consciousness. In doing this he had amassed a small army of droids that were able to use the Force, but they were dying. To save them he did what he did best, and that was find loopholes within the Force to allow him backdoor entry into some of the more forbidden things the Force doesn't like. There were many ways to get immortality, but he wanted to do an easy way. The Force, however, didn't make it easy for him, and he knew that it wouldn't. He had become prepared in the event it wouldn't allow him this so easily. The Force may be everywhere and touch all living things, but that didn't mean it was perfect, and he could get around a lot of things. An example of that being, using science and genetic modification to allow himself and others to better access the Force. His living droids, now since, are capable of using the Force now, through a loophole he had found when using his cells. It wouldn't be this easy if the bodies were already made, and they didn't have any prior connection to the Force. Through him and through the cells that contained a Sky Seed variation from himself, that increased their overall force sensitivity. It allowed them to both keep their powers and keep their ability to live throughout the rest of their lives, and that isn't all. They would be able to transfer their consciousness and individuality into a new body, once the one they are currently in expires. This still keeps in line with what the force wants as death still exists for them still exists for him as well, as while extremely hard to kill, and it was unlikely for it to happen within the future, he could still die. His body could still fail him, and he would need to either create an entirely new one, and go through the trouble of aligning it using both light and dark side energies through magic rituals. So they are basically an entire sentient race created by you. Isla said as she pointed at him before continuing. Their purpose at first was to test whether or not you could, and you didn't stop to consider whether you should. That is right. Anakin nodded on his throne. It is a folly of mine to think that it would be without any consequences. The Force obviously didn't like me creating new life so slowly started to make the non-organic midi-chlorians within them slowly dissipate. It is a folly. A massive one is now you have some crazy fanatics for people that wish to do anything in your name. Padme said particularly heated. For your information, they aren't slaves and can do anything they want, under the law of the Emperor of course. Anakin added seeing that it could be misconstrued he had created his own force of slaves to fight for him. If he is to blame for that, then everyone else should be blamed for forcing droids. That aren't actually living as well. Sighing herself, Padme submits. Fine. You point is proven. Anakin had given ample evidence to prove that he isn't lying, and that they did this all on their own initiative. That is actually crazy. The Jedi I don't know what the Jedi would think about this. Shark added her own amazement over finally discovering this. Neither do I. But I suspect that I would at least get a scolding, Anakin said after Shark adding in her own thoughts. That doesn't now. What I want to know is what is our next step. From what I could tell, the sense don't need any training Isla at this point was more concerned with how she would be as a mother. Not that she was pregnant or anything at this point, but she has become acutely aware of the possibility now, and she is both excited and nervous. While Padme doesn't even consider becoming a mother, well she does, but she believes that the fun time herself and Anakin had the night before wasn't going to result in a pregnancy. Anakin wasn't that irresponsible right? No, he isn't and because of this Padme is safe and secure in the fact she won't be becoming a mother so soon even though her age and Isla's isn't that far apart. Arnie, let's go for some training. And when are we going to get a new lightsaber? Ahsoka asked aloud and everyone was brought back to the simple fact they had no proper force sensitive based weapon. Sure, we can go for some training. Also, about the lightsabers, there are a few options that we could go to find some crystals to create our own sabers. I have all of the parts necessary because I have remembered everything about lightsaber creation. Anakin stated, Really? Ahsoka was the most interested to get a proper lightsaber again, not that Isla, Shark or Barris weren't. Even Padme was slightly interested in this topic, considering Anakin had talked to her about a few things the previous night. Just thinking about it makes me blush. Padme thought to herself as she was transported to her memories of the night before, which admittedly had gotten a little hazy the more and more it went on. Yes, really. Most within the room didn't notice Padme's behavior. At least that was what would have been like if the people within weren't force sensitives, and she was force sensitive enough trained to block others from sensing her emotions. Anakin continued, There are options, and while finding natural crystals or other things that could replace normal crystals for a saber is good, they may not be the best. How so? Shark questioned, believing that the lightsaber's Jedi had been using for years on end, now with the epitome of its efficiency. There are synthetically made crystals, and then there are unique ones that would have a special edge in combat. An example being ghost fire crystals being literally near invisible. Anakin said which got a reaction out of Isla, is the idea of remaining unseen sounded good to her. That, I want one of those. Isla said, nodding her head as if it is already decided. What? You think I just have one on me? Anakin questioned with a dumbfounded expression crossing his face. Yes, you have everything. Isla replied back. Despite your expectations of me. I in fact do not have everything. Anakin replied calmly before continuing. Synthetic lightsabers can be created, and we can create them to the best of our ability to better suit everyone's requirements and all of that. Then there is a multitude of many other gems throughout the galaxy that can be used in the recreation of your own lightsabers. The Jedi aren't the only ones that have an entire planet full of Adagan crystals. He continued. There are also the wildlife here on Tatooine that could provide you all with a crystal that could be used. Anakin left off to see if anyone is interested. Only Shark was. 
That sounds interesting. Does this mean we would have to kill a creature to gain one of these crystals? I see that your natural instincts are starting to come out there, Shark. Isla said to Shark. She isn't embarrassed and doesn't mind being called out. Depending on the creature, I am willing to try and get one. Crate dragon poles were lustrous, colored stones found in the last chamber of the gizzard of crate dragons. The stones were used to help crush food eaten by them, and over time, they became rounded because of how much they moved around. They could be found in colors such as blue, green, red, white, and black. Due to a refractive quality peculiar to the pearl, they could be used in a lightsaber if properly cleaned, prepared and installed, though it was a difficult task. Believe it or not, but they had in fact not gone extinct and still existed to this day some species on the planet. Crate dragons are quite the ferocious creatures, and it would be difficult to face one unarmed. Their pearls come in all colors, so you won't have to worry too much about choosing. Anakin stated as he already planned to help Isla get her ghost fire crystals, and now shark her crate dragon crystals. I would appreciate the help then, Shark said as she smiled at Anakin, and he replied in kind, giving a nod before turning to the youngest two within the room. Now that you are settled, there are only two left within this room. Of course, I am not forgetting about you Padme, but we should fix your problem first. Anakin said as he looked at Ahsoka, embarrassed before reminding Padme who was still stuck in her own world. Oh, oh, right. Yes. Of course, of course I was listening. Padme exclaimed quickly recovering from whatever she was imagining. Whatever, I can explain it to you later, Ahsoka, Barris. Anakin said as he now was awaiting Ahsoka's embarrassed answers. I don't know Anakin, synthetic crystals give off a red glow. So what? You are not a part of the Jedi, and synthetic crystals aren't below normal Jedi Adigan crystals. Anakin reassured her since she didn't seem to want a crystal from somewhere else. She was taken by the prospect of designing her very own crystal. Then, do you think I should do it? She didn't just ask this question to Anakin but the others within the room as well. Just follow what the Force tells you. Or if the Force doesn't give an answer, then just go with what you believe is right for you. Shark gave her advice given she was following her instincts to best a creature. Carnivorous was the species she came from, which inherently made her a predator, and it would be best if hers came from a defeated opponent. Padme knew nothing about lightsabers and the Force, but she still gave her advice. Sometimes, what you must look at isn't the look of what could be, but instead the benefits of what could be instead. Isla just said quite simply, just go for it. There isn't anything else, now is there, right, Arnie? There are other crystals. Anakin just deadpanned Isla's lack of awareness to the fact that other crystals existed. What? Barris ignored Isla, along with everyone else as they awaited her answer. I will do the synthetic crystal then. Barris stated because of the encouragement, and she was still quite taken, if not more so now, as she had some time to think about it some more. She wanted to design her own lightsaber crystal, and she would make it suit her needs to the best of her abilities. That's great then Anakin looked over towards Ahsoka, whom seemed to be the most excited. Ahsok Dash, he was cut off. Of course. I want to have one of my own, but I don't want to create one, and I don't like the idea of fighting against something to gain one. I also believe that it would be best for me to stay away from any invisible lightsaber types Ahsoka left off here. Don't worry, I think I have the perfect crystals just for you Ahsoka. Anakin stated as he was planning to give her some very powerful and unique crystals, still they best suited her. Really? Ahsoka questioned him with some type of effect known as the puppy dog Ayas technique. Yes, Anakin replied, and she just jumped him by hugging him very tightly as if trying to merge into his being. Of course, I just have to find these crystals for you first. Anakin thought to himself as they would all then be prepared for their journeys to get their lightsaber crystals they had chosen, Ultima Poles, with which they would have to travel into the depths of the ocean to discover. They were perfect and would give off the same color and feel to what she would have had. Ahsoka would keep her same design, if he remembered correctly from her counterpart of another universe. The only difference being that she would have these two crystals instead of healed crystals to act as the core of her lightsaber. Not that he would bar her from deciding whether or not she wants it. She should be capable of doing so and if she really wants it, it is her decision. He really doesn't like responsibility for the actions taken by others because he dislikes this. He will probably have to be responsible for others anyway, now that he has officially become the Emperor, but that is besides the point. If Ahsoka is to become independent from him and the others to have her truly become an adult, then he would need to start the process of getting her to make her own decisions. For herself as he wants her, no, just just her but everyone to know that whatever their choice is, it is theirs to make and even with his influence, they should still think for themselves, well for themselves. Anakin didn't want to have to baby people, but instead help them become themselves. This was what he tried to do when he was teaching those within the Jedi Order to make sure that they think outside of the ways the Jedi had usually taught them. Obviously he tried to do this in a way that wouldn't be detrimental or worse, boring. He knew all too well about how some people that are known as teachers shouldn't even be considered as such because they were wholly incapable of doing so. He did have his fair share of those types in his previous world and he would have to compensate for their failings when they taught. Then there are what he wants for himself, of course he wasn't going to just use these two gems, but they would be used for something much greater. Mantle of the Force and Heart of the Guardian, two crystals that had been discovered and recovered by the ancient being known as Darth Revan, the Sith, the Jedi, the everything in between and all around pretty powerful Force user. 
The heart of the Guardian was an ancient crystal that was rediscovered on the surface of Yevon 4 by the Rodian inventor Suvam Tan some time prior to the Jedi Civil War. Possibly utilized as a lightsaber crystal by the redeemed Revan, it gave the blade of any such weapon into which it was installed a unique bronze hue and yellow core. The heart was one of two legendary crystals that Revan possibly obtained from Tan near the end of his quest to find and destroy the Star Forge, the other being the mantle of the Force. When placed within a lightsaber, it altered the properties of other crystals that the lightsaber carried in a positive way. This crystal created a fast yet devastating blade that was perfect for lightsaber combat. It is believed that the heart was involved in the founding of the Jedi Order. According to prophecies of the Order, the heart would appear at the time of greatest turmoil and help in bringing the galaxy into salvation. However, the Sith also believed it to be an object of their heritage, which in turn, would have brought about their domination of known space. One might question why he wouldn't take these crystals for himself, but give it to Ahsoka. It is simple, he was planning to do something even more crazy when it comes to his own crystals. So, uh, Ahsoka started as Anakin was setting off with her, Isla and Shark to find their own lightsaber crystals. When are we going to get there? In fact, even Barris, never to be left out from the group, had joined along with them, because she didn't need to stay on Tatooine to finish her lightsaber. She was hard at work on her lightsaber crystal within her room, with all of the instructions given to her. Anakin didn't want to leave Padme behind, but she would stay behind to take care of the politics with some aid from his mother and Jira. What a great wife, he thought to himself. Where do you mean by where? Anakin asked her having a feeling he knew what she is actually after. To get my lightsaber crystals of course. She said smugly as Anakin stared at her and as if realizing her mistake she supplied. I I mean, to get all of our lightsaber crystals of course. She gave out an awkward laugh at the end here. That is right, we are getting all of our lightsaber crystals, and not just yours. And I can put emphasis on all of our because he is petty like that. Hey, there is no need to be like that. Ahsoka pouted here. I was joking with you. Anakin smiled and used his hand to rub her head. Stop that. Even though she said this, she didn't actually want him to stop touching her, but instead treating as a child. But Anakin wouldn't be doing that anytime soon. He already is slowly treating like someone with responsibilities, but that doesn't mean she is ready to be an adult yet. What is the ruckus going on in here? Shark came into the room to see the master apprentice duo bonding. Not really doing much, you having fun over there. Anakin was referring to her isolation that while Anakin had encouraged her to become more social, that didn't mean she was an extroverted personality. She would remain alone most of the time, simply because that was what she preferred. And who is he to say what she wanted is wrong? If she just so happened to say she wanted him in the future, how could he possibly so know to that? For your information, I am. Shark stated simply before looking to the other to greet her. Ahsoka, I suggest you calm your emotions there young Ahsoka. I am not that young anymore. Ahsoka pouted some more as Shark pointed out to her that she was projecting quite wild her feelings. And I am perfectly capable of controlling myself, she says as she draws in the uncontrollable feelings she was developing at rapid pace. By the way, I didn't come out here for nothing. I have some ideas regarding my lightsaber and was wondering on getting some input from the both of you. Shark has already gotten her crystal, which was the crate Dragon Crystal from Tatrine. It was the first stop the group had made, and they had ticked off the crystal for Shark off of their list. Anakin had gotten a crate Dragon Crystal for himself as well, but he wasn't just going to use that. He has much more to do with it, and would require many other different crystals as well to do what he wants perfectly. Sure, I am sure that I will provide some ample advice. Anakin stated not including Ahsoka in his sentence, just to mess with her. And me as well. Whatever Skyguy can suggest, I can suggest better. Ahsoka was positively overflowing with enthusiasm, and wanted to make sure that Anakin knew that she could be his equal in whatever manner that she can. That is new Anakin thought to himself before saying, Sky Guy? Yeah. I saw it in a vision, and I think it appropriately should be used in this context. Ahsoka says smugly looking at him to challenge her on this. No one questioned her ability to see things through Force visions at this point, because that was very common with her. Seeing into an alternate timeline or a future that will never come to be because Anakin had already created ripples that would destroy this future. Maybe. So full of energy is this what it is like to be young? Anakin missed the part that he is also young. Forever. Calm down there. This isn't a competition, but to simply help Shark here with her lightsaber adjustments. Right? Shark. Yes, of course it is. Shark just rolled her eyes at Ahsoka's obvious infatuation to Anakin at this point, and his obvious purposeful ignorance to it. While it might seem a little weird for the Emperor of the Emperor to suddenly leave after coronation, it really isn't considering he has been making Siri help him out more and more. He still has his multiple thought processes as well being put to use, as there are numerous amounts of information being used, created, transferred and deleted. Like the internet or any other virtual space, information isn't truly destroyed and is left somewhere to be recovered. One can't truly delete something, but Anakin does get rid of a lot of information that is not needed, and only things that need to be kept, are kept. Stuff that usually keeps an eye on the history of things, summaries of events and all kinds of other stuff. Then there are the insane numbers, pictures, videos and other forms of virtual or technological information kept on the Matrix. He doesn't only just have his droids, now turned since store their consciousness on the Matrix, which takes up a lot of space, but he has also created a lot of servers just for the common folk, or anyone else really that wanted to use this type of technology. 
and he upgraded it to be similar to the level of what he currently circulating the galaxy at large. By the way, you never did say where we are going first, Shark asked Anakin. Well, given the rarity of some of the crystals involved in the process, and we are the only ones going on this journey dash, Anakin was interrupted. Wait, yeah, why are we the only ones? It was Ahsoka who interrupted him as he was going to continue. Why not use some droids to help us on a search? Or even that cool looking army you had back there. Waste precious emperor and resources just for you girls. Anakin lifted an eyebrow, but inwardly he knew that he would waste some resources if he really wanted. Yeah. I know that you would. Ahsoka answered with confidence. She was right, but Anakin wouldn't allow her that. Of course, Anakin left off only for Ahsoka to come in. Really? Not. That seemed to take the wind out of her sails as she started to mop about her predictions being wrong. He did this often because her foresight abilities were quite powerful, and he had tested her midi-chlorians before as well. She had even more potential than Yoda, just as he, but her count was still far out from his own. Not that any of that mattered because of the diode reinforcing itself and strengthening himself and those connected through the Force. It did however say that she would most likely be the most powerful out of the Force-sensitive girls within all of them. Xana included as well she is also strong. Her count only clocked out at 15,000 per cell, while Ahsoka has 18,500 per cell. We may not be using droids for that reason, but we are also not using them because of magic. Anakin stated knowing full well that the crystal that you receive or get for yourself would help one advance in the Force. It is supposed to be connected to the person who finds or creates it, meaning it would be personal. Having someone else find it and bring it to you isn't exactly the best to your advancement and abilities within the Force. Magic. Shark questioned as she was still within the room. If it hadn't been mentioned already Anakin and the rest of them were actually aboard Jabitha, because she could be considered the best ship in the known galaxy, for her speed, cloaking abilities, and even the power to use the Force. It would be stupid not to use her to reduce the amount of time they needed to take to get their crystals. Yes, magic. Space magic in particular. Anakin stated as if what he said is common knowledge. Space magic. You aren't making any sense, Shark continued confused. The Force, magic, space magic, psychic powers, all of the above refers to the ever-present energy field. That likes to interfere with the lives of the living. Anakin supplied. Right, I think I will be going back to my room now. Shark said as she retreated seemingly exposed to one of Anakin's quirks, and also needing to get back to working on her saber as she was working through some things. Meditation is not nice all of the time, and some horrible stuff could be revealed. It also doesn't help that she is connected to Anakin. While Anakin can block off almost everything, he is most of the time, especially when in close proximity, unable to hide his emotions. Dyads are incredibly annoying. Thank you Mother Force. Anakin thought to himself and said the last part through the Force, which did get a response that felt like the Force is laughing at him. Or something similar given it really isn't sentient and doesn't have proper intelligence. Where are we going first by the way? Ahsoka asked as she too was also curious, and is no longer mopping about being wrong. Well she wasn't, but Anakin didn't want to tell her that. Well, to find Isla's crystal, we would either have to go at it at random, because it is found throughout the outer rim, which we are in now, but that would waste a lot of time considering their rarity. Then what are we going to do then? Ahsoka was confused, because what is she supposed to be doing? What about Anakin who is an emperor that is basically on a holiday trip while everyone else is doing other stuff? We will stop over every planet the Force tells us to go to, then Isla will have to continue to meditate when on a planet. As for the two of us, we can laze around as she will be getting hers first. Well, second since we have gotten sharks already, Anakin said. So, we are looking ours then. Yes. What are we waiting for? Let's hurry up. I want to get my own as well, and don't want to have to wait on Isla. Ahsoka said as if she was in a hurry. Patience. I admit I don't have much myself, but I at least have some, Anakin said as Ahsoka grabbed onto him, holding him. Ahsoka just doesn't say anything else, and just pulls him to go and play a video game that is virtual and connected to the virtual network of the Emperor. It had quite the large amount of range. Given that Ahsoka was now connected to him through a diet now, she would be able to feel what happened or happens between Isla and himself while on Jabitha. While before Anakin didn't have to worry about it, because the rest are adults and have some form of romantic connection. Now though his cute apprentice is cockblocking him, simply because she is connected and in close proximity to him and the other girls. It really doesn't help him or Isla that had come with him that wanted to do those activities. So for now, it would be put off. It is not like Anakin or Isla doesn't have self-control or can't do other things. It would be ridiculous to think about sexual acts and want to engage in sexual acts all the time, because it isn't just a physical thing, but also mental. It translates through the Force, and this is the biggest problem where he no doubts knows that the Force itself probably did this knowing a situation like this would occur. It is after all still trying to sway him in its direction, but it isn't antagonistic against, because why would it be? He hasn't gone against the balance, not truly because of the loopholes in the logic of immorality. He can stay like this and not be against the cycle of life and death. In fact, he would be promoting it because of the dimension he is creating, even though it has much more important services for him than housing souls. It is also promoting the cycle. The yin and the yang, life and death, push and pull, moon and the sun, everything was still within that balance. It held so dear, because imbalance would create disturbances, divergences that would tip the scale in one way or another, like himself or it could create a wound within the force, where the energy is unable to be in. Despite it being everywhere at every time, wounds act like a rift in which the energy cannot be used within, or near them. Of course there hasn't been any wound Anakin was aware of that was so extreme that it would completely cancel out the Force completely. That doesn't mean it wouldn't be possible. There were many planets within the Outer Rims that had towering mountain tops, 
that would be capable enough of producing a few awesome ghost fire gems. Or at least there should be in there probably a great deal of some hidden or tucked away, just out of the reaches of those of whom wish to take them. They are hard to get and especially hard to find, given they are quite literally invisible or near invisible, which is actually insane. It is probably a combination of how light reacts to the crystal, and when within a lightsaber, it also takes into account those factors as well. It wasn't just that however and Anakin believed, again it had to do with the unique way the Force interacted with these lightsaber crystals to produce such an effect. Magic can get you places apparently, and if that place is to stay as you are, do nothing and just exist just because you can, then it can do that for you. Or it can do that for some crystals abundant in the energies of the Force, not you, whom is but a simple and basic person with nothing special about them at all. This is besides the point however as Anakin would be able to reproduce the effects himself when creating his own lightsaber again. Synthetic crystals are the best when it comes to raw power because you input your emotions into them when creating them. It is not that strange to find a synthetic crystal that is a different color from the usually red. Red is usually the result of a chemical compounding and, or being aligned with the dark side. Anakin plans to use the mantle of the Force, and Heart of the Guardian as strange ways that would subvert them from what they are. He would need to go to where the Star Forge was destroyed however, as while HK, now named Hetsuko, had extracted every piece of the Star Forge to see if he could find those crystals. He has a feeling that he would also find those two lightsaber crystals there, even if he had no luck in getting Revan's holocron. It was destroyed after all, but for the crystal Crystals, however, they could very well be alive and well, hidden away. Papa, we are here. Jabitha used telepathy all of the time to communicate with him or anyone else really. She could do so using the Force, because the psychic connection she shares with him only allows her to speak with him, and no one else. Through the Force however, she is capable of talking to just about anyone and everyone she liked. Thank you Jabitha. Jabitha had not given up calling him Papa, even though he had asked for her to stop. In doing so he had upset at that time, which admittedly he probably shouldn't have tried to do so. It was not that he minded it too much or anything like that. But it was a strange concept to him, as while he looked forward to having a family of his own, he is also anxious about it. While he had done a lot to ensure his safety and the safety of those he loves, and then some by protecting trillions of people, that doesn't mean he is still safe in having a family. Not in times of war like this. And he had made it clear to Isla, Padme and Barris, that children probably shouldn't be an option right at this instance. Padme and Barris didn't mind Padme because she didn't feel exactly ready herself, while Barris also, while looking forward to it felt she was still a bit young for that, understandable. However, it was Isla that was the problem. Not that she was overly pushy in that direction, but she seemed to desire this more so than anyone else, and it was strange. He shouldn't have told her that it is possibly to have children between the two of them, because that incentivized her even more. If before she was hesitant because they would both need to go through cultivating a child through some genetic modifications, now she didn't have to worry about that. Arnie, what are you thinking about? Isla asked him as he was left alone with his thoughts. She had decided to try and get some alone time with him during their trip in this instance, since Ahsoka was practically hogging all of the time with him. Not that she was angry or anything like that, no, she knew about the diet between Ahsoka and Anakin, no, and knew that it was probably manifesting itself subconsciously. Ahsoka may not realize it herself, but the other girls connected to Anakin could see it. Not that they couldn't see her doing so before. Isla knew this was going to happen, as it seemed like he just attracted those men to be with him naturally, or it was the force throwing girls at him. Either way, it is what it is, and she had already come to accept that. Things, specifically things related to your desires. Anakin stated in a way that could be misconstrued for something else, and it was. Arnie, not now. Ahsoka is on board as well Isla got embarrassed, and she seemed to be the little closet pervert, given she instantly assumed he wanted to do some nightly activities. You little pervert. Anakin just grabbed her and hugged her in this instance before continuing. I didn't mean that. I meant your desires to have some children, children between you and I. Still embarrassed and possibly more so at being caught out in her inappropriate thoughts, she took a breath to calm herself down. She looked Anakin in the eyes before kissing him on the forehead, given and holding onto him tight as they were now both sprawled out on his bed within his room. I know that you think it would be a bad idea to have a child now Isla started off. And I know that I am being a bit aggressive and pushy. And I thank you for putting up with me and reminding me that I am not the only one within this relationship. It's good to know that you care about me. Here, I was thinking that I was only meant to listen to your desires and do what you want. Anakin was obviously joking here, and the girl in this situation would usually hit their man. Not Isla, however, as Anakin had set some boundaries and reinforced the point that if you are to hit someone, you should be prepared to be hit back. There was no cute exclaim in the harming of the physical, even if it would no damage to him at all. It was the principle behind the act. It was one thing if it was unintentional and uncontrollable, but it was another matter when it is controllable and intentional. No, Isla just continued to hug him without saying anything else, and as she remained silent, Anakin was silently enjoying this feeling. It wasn't exactly rare that he would be unable to just hug a loved one, but it was appreciated nonetheless. I think Anakin started. Yes. Isla questioned seeing that he didn't finish. I wouldn't mind having a family and want to have one, but I am unsure. I am unsure about what is happening, and the current state of the galaxy is not something I want my children living in. Anakin continued. Unsure, you are. Isla was confused before seemingly understanding something, and decided to point out something that was obviously right in his face. Unfortunately, it seemed to be not within his ability to perceive. You do know you have an entire empire that you would call home, that our family would call home. Isla continued. Anakin nods at this not needing to say anything to say he understands. 
You have an army too would rival the hearts or the Republic even now with all of these powerful people under your command, both force sensitive and extremely capable, along with all of those droids. You are in command and complete control over these things, right? She continued. He again nods again not knowing where this was leading. Sighing, Isla then says it straight to his very attractive but dense head. There is nothing stopping you from having a family now, and there is also no one to tell you that it is wrong. It is you, yourself that is stopping you from having one now. I understand that you want your, no, a potential children to live in a better galaxy, free from war and be in a prosperous peaceful state. But weren't you the one to say that conflict is inevitable? Well, yes. He couldn't deny that he had come to the conclusion even before he had been reborn as Anakin Skywalker he knew from experience that conflict was something that would happen no matter what. Whether that be through the gruesome, dangerous and in particular, the tragedy of war or from friendly competitions. People still played sports because it was conflict, and it served a purpose, whether that be to show people the strength of their country through their athletes or otherwise. Hell, it even happened in local competitions or sports that dealt with who was to be the top student, which would lead to someone being rewarding and someone, or multiple being the losers. It was a natural thing. Stop being silly, and admit that you just don't want to have a family now, instead of giving excuses. While Isla had been staying on point, it would seem that she is hurt by his hesitance. That is not what I mean and you know it. Anakin sternly says as he embraces her still transmitting his own feelings and thoughts through their bond together. I know. Isla was just dissatisfied even though she had eternity to have as many children as she wanted with him at this point. Women and men aren't that different from each other, but there are differences that won't go away, even within this new reality he lives in. The natural instinct and drive to have children and pass on your DNA is a strong one and isn't necessary bad. But Anakin up until this point was trying not to think with his second brain. No matter how attractive thinking with his mind down under sounded. You know what Anakin started as he stared into Isla's eyes. You have convinced me. But don't think we will be doing any funny business now. The connection worked both ways, and it influenced him as well. Not to the point that it would completely change his way of thinking. He could continue to deny Isla. But that would only further hurt her and himself because of the bond. It wasn't physical but emotional, spiritual in nature. Isla just kissed him at this declaration, and he did so as well but had to also focus on making sure no fluctuations came through the bond. This, unfortunately, is all they could do for now. Dak, the planet with which your team of pearls are to be found. The only planet in fact that has access to such a powerful crystal. That can be used in the creation of a lightsaber. It is unfortunate that while he knows the general direction of where this planet is, and how he could get there, there is no known routes that could be taken to get to this planet, at least not within any known star map. After having gotten Isla's crystal and Anakin having procured one for himself as well, they had promptly left on the search for Ahsoka's crystals. She isn't the last to get hers, as that role was to be taken and is taken by Anakin. Hers would be the hardest to get if Anakin wasn't able to breath underwater, and have the physical resistance to endure the massive amount of weight that comes from water, when diving deeper and deeper. He could have used something like a submarine, but they had only come on Jabitha, and it wasn't like he was going to do all the work himself. It was Ahsoka's lightsaber that was being made. He is only really here for her and not here to do everything for her, where she would now have to find a way to get to the crystals designated. Sky Guy, are you sure this is a good idea? Ahsoka said as they got off of the living ship, Jabitha. You want your lightsaber crystals, don't you? Anakin replied as everyone else would stay inside, still working on their crystals and lightsabers. It was only Anakin and Ahsoka here to deal with the oceans, islands and reefs of Dak. Is there really no other way? No, we are both going in. Anakin says and can see the worry within her, sense it even. Don't worry, you will be just fine. I will be by your side, just don't expect me to do all the work for you. Relieved and also having a tingly feeling within herself, she replies with enthusiasm before diving, with specialized equipment for herself with Anakin, can rely on either the Nano suit or his natural physics capabilities. Yes, into the depths we go. Ahsoka thought to herself as she used the provided equipment to help her breath underwater. A small device that recycled oxygen for her to breath and extracting that oxygen from the water they were in, and neutralizing the carbon dioxide she released when exhaling. It was a different story for Anakin, as he was able to breath underwater perfectly safe, because of the third lung he had implanted into himself. What a cheater. Ahsoka thought to herself as the deeper they both went, the harder and harder it was to see. The light of the star for the system they were in was obscured by the layers and layers of water above them, and if Ahsoka didn't have the force to help her, then she would start to feel the pressure of the ocean. Look at him, all smug, thinks he is the king of the world. Ahsoka was a bit grumpy now that they went under, as it was taking some effort for her to push through the water. Anakin looked like he was enjoying himself swimming and everything. Every now and then he would go so far as to play with some alien fish that would pass by, completely harmless, and even if they had some form or type of damage, they would be unable to hurt him. There was a few jellyfish that looked super poisonous, and would have very much harmed her. But he easily tamed those as well. Even if they somehow managed to get past his nano suit's armor and his body's natural protection, the poison would still be eliminated by his extremely powerful cellular and biological makeup. All in all, Anakin was having the time of his life, and they were barely off the coast of where they had landed. Leaving everyone else behind on the ship, they were having their own scuba diving session. What is this planet all about anyway? Ahsoka was able to ask despite the device she was using. She hasn't released her dive connection to Anakin yet, and would probably not know that it has happened despite knowing of what it is, and what it means. 
How could she not when around other women with various experiences in relation to it? Anakin replied as he had an entire school of fish follow behind him. Well, this planet's name is Dak. Dak. That's it. Ahsoka questioned. Yes, that's it. It is also known as Mon Calamari, and sometimes simply called Mon Cala. This place has a whole wealth of species that call this planet home. The Mon Calamari, the Koran, the Mopa, the Amphihydrus, and the Waladins. Anakin explained. Of course, this place is called by the locals that live here as Dak. So that is why I called it Dak. It is a bit of a silly name Ahsoka was being a little childish as internally she was comparing the name Dak to another inappropriate word. She may be a bright light within the force, but that doesn't mean she is innocent. She lived with a closet pervert known as Isla, who was actually at the same time an open pervert as well, considering the clothing she wears. Not that she doesn't know the reason of why she wears clothing like that, but it doesn't help when she is also around Shark, who is also openly flirtatious sometimes with Anakin. Her only respite from those two is Barris, who is probably the most reserved of them all. It is a good thing that Ahsoka isn't able to hear Barris' thoughts or feel her emotions sometimes, as she is quite passionate as well. Different cultures, different languages, you get the gist of it. Anakin replied, Mon Calamari was the name given to the planet by human explorers from the Galactic Republic, who first discovered and revealed the world to the rest of the galaxy. The planet was a shining bluish-white orb from space, due to its ocean-covered surface. It was home to 27.5 billion Mon Calamari and Quarren, as well as surrounded by the impressive Mon Calamari shipyards. Anakin didn't really have to explain what they were doing here, and there were no checkpoints stopping them from enter, so of course he went right ahead. Of course he did all of this under the cloak of invisibility from Jabitha, as while it didn't look defended, that was because there was no threat to be detected. Anakin had no doubt that the people living here would at least want to question why he was coming here. If it was revealed that an emperor had come all the way out to another sector far off from his own territories, Anakin was sure people may question his sanity. The fauna and flora of any ocean environment was dangerous, and Anakin had been making sure that Ahsoka didn't make any mistake that would cost her, her life. This was not a particularly good place to come to, but because of his influence and the decision of her own, Ahsoka was prepared to do something like this. In fact, it was her that had mentioned Ultima Poles in the first place. There was no way she had heard of it before, and Anakin connected the dots to her having already seen her arrival on this planet. The Force may have even guided her to be here at this time, and knowing that Anakin is with her, he became suspicious at what it may want from him. His paranoia is acting up, and while he is not the most suspecting of people, he certainly had his moments. What kind of dangers can we expect down here exactly? You know, are there any big, big monsters that could swallow us whole? Ahsoka asked a bit nervous, knowing that Anakin would save her gave her warmth. Knowing that he would also make sure she doesn't have it easy, also made the warm feeling be doused as well. Nothing too too dangerous, just some stuff like devil squids and things like that, Anakin left off in an ominous tone. Anakin didn't want a hentai situation happening of course, so he would stop anything like that from happening simply by virtue of the fact he had already accepted, that Ahsoka will be his. He couldn't allow a stupid squid that privilege, and of course there was the fact that he wanted to keep this page. Ugly what are devil squids? Ahsoka said in a shaky voice as they were now in an area nearly completely void of light. Nothing that you should be worried about right now. What you should be worried about however is whether or not you would be able to see where you're going. Anakin didn't answer her and kept her on point as distractions could take away from the learning experience. Various fish of alien origins, or is it various fish of local origins as Anakin and Ahsoka could be considered alien, because they did not originate from this planet were swimming around. Not that Ahsoka could see them and hear them at all. Thankfully Ahsoka could rely on her biology of being a Togruta as her Montrals has the ability to sense the proximity and movement of physical objects around them by means of their hollow Montrals, which detected space ultrasonically. She was using two to make sure there is nothing in front of her and nothing behind her, while Anakin didn't, again, have to worry about the darkness of the sea. His nano suit provided him with all of the vision he needed, and even if it didn't he had access to the force or even his own natural biological functions. His eyes had been enhanced to an insane degree that it could pick up light and all of its various colors. Not that seeing light was all that useful the deeper they went, because at some point, it would become useless as light can't penetrate deeper into the ocean. The further they went, the more and more, Ahsoka would use her hollow mantras to help her navigate herself. She could feel that Anakin was right beside her all the way, and she felt immensely safe by this. It shouldn't be long now before we come across some Ultima Pearls. She thought to herself, believing that wherever they went, she would find what she is after. Ahsoka's objective is to get the Ultima Pearls, specifically two pearls for herself, as she would be using two lightsabers instead of one. Her vision was blurry, and things weren't the same as they are now. But there was a lot that she would think is her, especially that one vision she will never forget. Leaving the Order in whatever style she had within that vision was saddening, and it made her feel as it was right. When she left the Order with Anakin in reality there she felt that it was right, and she didn't have those same feelings. She was scared that she would at that point of time, but there wasn't anything to indicate that going along with him was wrong. Even now, she would say it felt extremely right. Focus, my apprentice. You really don't want to not be prepared for what could come after you down here. While I will help you, it also doesn't mean you can do nothing. Anakin spoke to Ahsoka as she was going in towards her thoughts and not paying attention to her surroundings. Sorry. Sorry, I was just thinking about some things, Ahsoka replied. Remember three poles and then we are out. Anakin stated. Huh. Wait, you said two, right? Ahsoka appeared confused. That was if Anakin or she, 
herself could see her. Note 3. Two for you and a third for myself. Anakin said as he could sense something beneath them. Is that why you are coming with me? Just to get yourself your own pearl. She knew that Anakin wasn't coming with her just for that, but it did make her a little upset. Careful there, keep some attention on your surroundings remember. Anakin reminded her, whatever. Ahsoka seemed to be in a mood, not that Anakin all cared at this moment, but instead was focused on their surroundings. An archaeological find had been discovered on this planet thousands of years ago, that recorded a beast, a monster of a sea that was enormous. It was dead of course, but there was no telling when it came to places like the ocean. In his previous life, humans had been to space before they had the capacity to even fully explore the ocean, and he wouldn't think it was that far from how it was here as well. Despite the differences there are also a lot of similarities as well. It seems that your mood has become a bit snippy. Anakin left off as she recognized the word and how it would refer to her, but she decided to focus on her task instead. It would seem that what Anakin had just said had knocked her out of the trance she was in, and she would at the very least be prepared for what is to come. Inwardly she was and is actually happy that there was something from her visions that was predicted by her. Anakin would maybe start to give her the endearing name on snips. Hopefully, while all of that was going on, Isla was in Wonderland thinking about this and that. She is currently within Anakin's room, and instead of working on her own new lightsaber, she is instead daydreaming. She should really come out of it, as she would still need to construct her lightsaber. The Ghost Fire Crystal may not be the strongest when it comes to lightsabers and their connection to the Force, however they did compensate with their unique abilities. She was just too overjoyed at the moment, and she wanted to share this information with someone, anyone at this moment. She had already told Barris as it relates to her, and in fact she had even told Shark who was in her room still connecting with her own saber, and as of this moment, she needed to tell someone else, specifically the other Empress of the Emperor and Padme. Isla got up from Anakin's bed and connected herself through the connection, so she would appear before Padme. If she wasn't too busy in the place of Anakin that is, acting as regent may have been hard work and, or tiring her out, so Isla would make this quick. If she wasn't however, then the two would probably continue to talk a lot more about this subject. Isla, is that you? Padme was seen as a hologram, just as Isla was seen as one as well. Yes, it is me Isla, she responded. What is it? And if you were wondering, I am not busy at all. It would seem that Arnie didn't just leave me with all of his work to go off on an adventure with you guys. Padme had a smile on her face, and Isla was able to notice this. That isn't important right now. Isla said not caring all too much, but still this added to her perception of Anakin as someone that wouldn't just throw his responsibilities onto someone else. It was reassuring to know that Anakin was dependable enough to not make one of his wives do work that is his. Oh, what is it then? Going by your expression and overall excited tone, it would seem that you have either going at it with him, or you have something exciting to say. Padme had a suggestive face when she said this knowing full well Anakin's capabilities. Of course we aren't doing that, Isla said before whispering the last part. Not around Ahsoka at least. Isla snapped out of her inappropriate thoughts, as she still hadn't told Padme about Anakin's change of mind. Anyway, enough about that. Arnie has decided that he wants to have a family. In her excitement Isla forgot to mention the important part, instead of saying something Padme already knew. Huh? Are you okay Isla? I already know of this. Didn't he say he wanted one already? And a massive one at that going by how he is going at getting us to fall for his charm. Padme was exasperated at how easy it was for Anakin to draw in the attention of women, whether this be unintentional or otherwise. Ah, uh, that isn't what I mean. What I meant is that he is willing to have one now. Like he is willing to have children with us now, in the moment not sometime in the future when the galaxy is safer. Or whatever excuse he was using Isla said. She continued. But instead, he would when the both of us. Either you or me do the thing, we'll be able to have children. Now, that is surprising. Padme responded not knowing what to say as it is a happy thing. For Isla, as she was the one who wanted children in this moment, while she also wanted a family in the future, she was of the same mince that Anakin was. Children in chaotic times like this wouldn't be all that great, so she didn't try to convince him otherwise, and in fact liked his decision. I know that you are of the same opinion as Arnie, but think of it from my point of view, and you will understand why he decided that it is fine. Isla said before she would go on to explain her point of view. While Padme was listening, her own mind started to change more and more as she listened to Isla's explanation of things. She couldn't help but agree, and was now getting her own desire to have children herself. It wasn't like there was all that much work for her or Anakin to do as the Empire seemingly ran itself. It didn't, but that is besides the point as Anakin would be able to be a great father and spend time with his children due to having minimal workload. If any at all, stop. Anakin said as he stopped swimming and Ahsoka listened to his command. Not knowing why he said to stop however, she spoke herself. Why are we stopping? It can't be that you are scared of going any deeper are you? Ahsoka was taunting him and being a little tsundu, and while Anakin doesn't mind all that much, as long as she didn't verbally and physically assault him, then he is fine with it. No there were much more important matters at hand as there was no fish swimming around them. Not one in sight. Or well, not one within the immediate senses of Anakin or Ahsoka, while Anakin would only sense fish staying away from the area they were in. Why don't you just be quiet for a little bit and sense your surroundings a little better? Anakin continued. I have, and there has been nothing for a while now. Ahsoka replied smugly. Yes, and what does that mean? Anakin asked, seeing as she didn't seem to understand what that meant exactly. It means that we scared them away. Ahsoka stated before continuing. No, in fact it was I who did all of the work to scare the fish away. They were getting annoying. I am sure they were. That isn't important because fish would be coming here. Check through the force instead of your mom. Anakin said giving some advice as they were stopped. Okay? Ahsoka was not combative, 
and knew that she may have stuffed up by only relying on her mantras to perceive the ocean surrounding her. Within the force Ahsoka was feeling strange as while, well. yes, she could tell that the fish avoided the area that both of them were in, she was more taken by the sensation she had not had a chance to examine ever since it had started. It probably isn't the best time to be taken by the diet that she is now aware exists between them. Something beneath was stirring, and it had some force sensitivity as well, meaning that it could feel Ahsoka pulsing the force outwards. Unlike Anakin, who has mastered the art of the small which did more than allowing him to transform his genetic code. This technique was primarily used to make sure one remains hidden within the force, and acts like a notice me not charm in the force. Meaning that things might know something is there but are more likely, and most probably going to look away and forget there is something there. It basically meant that while it didn't grant full invisibility or anything like that, it tricked someone's mind into believing that what is there isn't. A rumble was felt, and Ahsoka couldn't help but be surprised. What is that? Something big is what it is. Anakin replied as he knew that there was something down there but he didn't expect it to be an absolute monster. He should have, but to this extent. A gigantic monster, a fish of course that looked somewhat like a Chinese dragon, long and scaled. Huge, and its mouth looked as if it could swallow an entire hill. Not a mountain, but a hill could definitely fit. What the hell what kind of ecosystem does this planet have to allow something like this to exist? There must be prey that it could eat to sustain itself at that size, otherwise this thing should be dead. Anakin thought to himself. It was somewhat reminiscent of what Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan had to face on Naboo when exploring and using the ocean of the planet to traverse towards Naboo's palace. What are we going to do? What about my Ultima Poles? Ahsoka was quite panicked, but didn't seem to be scared for her life, because she knew that she wasn't at that level of danger. Come down. Let's use the Force to direct ourselves away from this situation. Anakin says using the Force and the bond she has discovered to calm her down. Knowing that she had discovered it, there was no hiding the fact a dyad had been formed between the two of them, and Anakin knew that she might become even more persistent now knowing directly. Okay? Knowing that he knows, she knows, that she knows, that he knows is quite confusing, and Ahsoka is both happy and anxious about their current situation. The chase is a fault. Anakin says as he propels himself, grabbing Ahsoka and pulling her into his embrace as he goes fast, so fast within the water, that the larger fish has trouble keeping up with him. Its massive body is not agile at all, but this advantage of being smaller than the larger fish is bad, because Anakin is unable to currently lose it. Unluckily for Anakin and Ahsoka, however, is that the current landscape does not have that many obstacles, and it makes it difficult for the both of them. Well, makes it difficult for Anakin as Ahsoka is having the time of her life just being in his embrace, and she doesn't want to leave it. She is clearly in La La Land right now, unable to comprehend her situation, and it would seem she doesn't want to have her Ultima Pearls anymore. Within the ocean, Anakin doesn't make much underwater waves as he propels himself forward, but the larger fish basically pushes everything else out of its way. Any other fish or small protrusion is being destroyed. Anakin nudged Ahsoka to make sure she is brought back to reality. Ha! Huh, ha! Huh. She was confused, having been woken up to the reality of the situation. Wait, what are we doing here again? Where are we even? Ahsoka exclaimed as Anakin continued forward looking for some sort of crevice deep enough but at the same time narrow enough to not allow the fish entry. I am not the one that is meant to guide us on our way to the Ultima Pearls. That is your job, remember? Anakin said. Oh, oh, that is right. Ahsoka snuggled closer into him as they were still going. Thankfully, she didn't affect his ability to maneuver at all. And while Anakin could have dealt with the situation already, it probably wouldn't be good to just kill things willy-nilly. Especially when he had no need to kill the other than survival. And he can survive either way if he really wanted to. No, the reason he was still down in the sea, so deep was because Ahsoka was still yet to find the pearls that she would be using. And it would be wasted time if they didn't do it now. Hold on. Let me just. Ahsoka was being a little snake moving her arms all around Anakin seemingly trying to do something, but he wasn't having any of it. He used the force to stop her and whatever she was trying to feel, the little minx. I think that is enough of that. You are too young to be thinking about those kinds of things, and the situation we are doesn't really call for stuff like that, now does it? Anakin admonished her at the same time as he was starting to feel a pull behind him. And it wasn't a pull through his connection to the force, but instead the beast seemingly having had enough of the chase was starting to slow down, which would usually be a good thing in a moment like this. However, Close shut the jaws of oblivion is what Anakin wants to do right now as the beast utilizing its large capacity to breath inhales by a large amount. And if Anakin wasn't holding on to Ahsoka in this moment, knew that she would start having to live inside the beast. Its maw spoke volumes to its size as it opened wide and drew in a large amount of water, seemingly trying to just eat the both of them up. Not that it would be able to, but thousands of other smaller fish that were unfortunate enough to be close by, got caught and was swallowed whole. There, Ahsoka pointed out somewhere that would enable them to be safe for the moment, and Anakin complied as it was a crevice small enough to escape to, while out of sight from the sea monster. The creature was stumped as it didn't know where the two of them had gone, and it didn't have particularly good senses in the first place. What right did it have the need for good perception anyway? when it could simply draw in all of the food it would ever need by itself. The crevice they had gone into was small and claustrophobic feeling as the space was little. Thankfully they both could speak normally again as there was a pocket of air, enough for them to use and breath in normally. That was something Dash Ahsoka was interrupted as there was some rumbling that just further pushed her into Anakin. Sorry. She meekly said as she got off of him. There was some space that allowed the both of them to be separated from each other. But if they moved any closer, they would be able to feel each other's breath if they didn't already. It is alright, but you should have been more aware of our surroundings there. Anakin makes sure that she realizes her mistake as even though right now he can protect her, 
It was best she doesn't get into a situation like that and stuffs up like that. I know that. But Yuasoka didn't say anything more, as the both of them knew exactly what she was talking about. Sighing, Anakin begins. Look, about that connection between the two of us, it is accidental. Just like everyone else then, Ahsoka was fully aware of what it meant, not that she disliked it, but it only meant that he and she are meant to be with one another. Of course, she would be sharing with some other women, not that she cared all too much about that, if at all. Yes, just like everyone else that has had the unfortunate fate of being connected with me, Anakin said as he looked to the ceiling of the small cave outcrop from the crevice they had come into too. It wasn't meant to be this way, Ahsoka said out of nowhere slightly surprising him. What do you mean? I have seen more than you might think I have. My leaving the order and you staying, your fall to the duck side and the subsequent destruction, and even about your secret relationship with Padme. Ahsoka says stuff that happened, but it didn't happen in this universe. He just remained silent as she continued. I have seen it all and what was meant to happen and know that you have caused an incredible change to take place. We were never meant to be in the first place, and I have seen it all, she stated. You are correct that all of that was what should have happened. Anakin didn't lie, not because of some noble. I won't lie to my loved ones but because there was no need to. She had already gotten all of the information she has already from the all-knowing force, something that she had been trusting throughout her life. A comfortable silence comes between the two as the rumbling above continues, and in this situation, while not awkward, there were some words left unsaid. Why? Ahsoka asked. Why what? Anakin replied. Why did you do it? I have seen a lot through my visions, but I never knew why I couldn't see why, and I know that it isn't exactly the you. You are now. But, there are many reasons. And I believe that I'm stupid in those visions you have seen. Of course, there is a lot of blame that could go around. But you have to know that I would act in a similar manner, if I wasn't like I'm now. Anakin said knowing full well his capabilities. In fact he is stronger than what the original Vader or Anakin could have been. One might think to themselves that there is no way that such a well and adjusted individual such as himself, could go so far as to be like the monster known as Vader. The simple truth of the matter is that people are very capable. Anakin only needed to imagine himself in the same exact position the original was in, and in fact was able to experience what he had gone through when he went to hell. It was not something he liked at all, and it was incredibly excruciating despite him not saying anything about it to anyone. He not only empathized with his original counterpart, but also believed that he would have done the same, considering everything else. It may not have been the exact same, but close enough that the end result would still be the same. You aren't going to be like that, right? She still remembered seeing behind the mask of Vader, a mask that Anakin had foregone. Now that he wasn't needed anymore, she felt pain, hurt and suffering like no other, and that was from a version of Anakin that wasn't the one he is now. I can't promise you anything like that. Just know that what you saw was when I could be at my worst. What you see of me now is when I am at my average. Anakin decided to get over this heavy topic by injecting some humor into the conversation. Ahsoka, seeing this also plays along. Average. Then what are you at your best? My apprentice. What you have seen thus far from me is only 0.05% of my true power. You haven't seen my actual power yet. I haven't even gone over 9,000, Anakin said. Ahsoka has now come over the topic of conversation previously and has had a good chuckle. Whatever you say, but you will never be able to match me at Mario Kart. You underestimate my power, I am just going easy on you and everyone else. I am not a terrible driver. No, you are a terrible finisher. You can't manage to hold your first place position despite being first all of the time. You somehow manage to always come out last in the end. That is because you cheat and so did as everyone else. Anakin had noticed that while he doesn't have the same crash landing weakness that his counterpart seemed to possess, he instead was terrible at video games. Whatever you say, Ahsoka finished as the two would stay down there for the next hour or so, just waiting for the beast above to go away so they can now explore the new area they have gone into. They don't want to stay in the crevice because who knows if it might collapse in on them. Not that it would matter since Anakin could take care of it. No, it was the time wasted as Anakin is the last person to get his lightsaber crystals, and he may take the longest to do so as well. After a while, the shaking and rumbling had stopped, meaning that their worries were probably over. Specifically their fish-based worries were over, but that didn't mean they were done with their journey just yet. Now that this is over, I think it would be best that you hurry up in getting us to our destination. Anakin stated as he began to move himself towards the exit and entrance of the cave. Go down. Ahsoka said all of a sudden behind him. So it is down instead of going outwards. Anakin asked. Yes, let's go down. Ahsoka answered and confirmed that their new direction would be going further into the crevice. It would seem that the Ultima Pearls they are looking for are not here, but instead are down there instead. Let's just hope we don't come across anything more dangerous. Ahsoka thought to herself as she kept herself in close proximity to Anakin. On the outside of this crevice, the entirety of the depths was pitch black with something every now and then creating some sort of source of light. This is usually used as a means to attract prey. Whether this method was used by other carnivorous fauna, or even flora doesn't matter. What matters is that they would be out for blood, or meat depending on what they lacked down in the deep depths. Wait, what is that? Ahsoka spoke up as she could distinctly hear something within the depths. It shouldn't be possible for her and Anakin to be able to hear anything down here, other than the currents of the ocean and the swishing sounds made by fish. But there it was. Noises that didn't exactly sound like the swimming of the fish or the waves of the ocean. I don't know. But how's about we investigate? Anakin had a smirk on his face, and she could see it due to the lights that currently illuminated their path downwards. You will be wiping that smirk off of your face when it is some type of dangerous creature just waiting to devour us. I don't know about that I think we should just go down. 
What is the worst that could happen? Anakin stated his question posing it towards the open waters above, and stating to the constricted spaces below. Right, what could possibly go wrong? Ahsoka had at this point been exposed to enough media to know that this is where something goes wrong, horribly. The two would continue down heading towards the sounds coming from below. That strangely started to sound more and more like people conversing with one another. Anakin didn't notice it until they were getting closer, but the creatures below were trying to telepathically enter his mind. He is unsure of what exactly it was trying to gather, but from all of the creatures he knows of on this planet, he guesses it is the Knowledge Bank. Also known as Bakalku, was a sentient native to Mon Calamari. That was aware of all events that happened on the ocean world. Consisting of a cluster of mollusks, the Knowledge Bank used telepathy to gain information on events all across the planet as well as from the minds of those who visited it. It would then relay that information to those who could communicate with it, either telepathically or with the special ritual language other denizens of Mon Calamari used. The bank was sacred to the native Mon Calamari and Quarren, and its existence was kept a closely guarded secret. Unfortunately for the Mon Calamari and Quarren is that Anakin basically has an entire reserve of information within himself. A database of which contains information from his previous life perfectly recalled and categorized and things he has learnt of in this new life he was so graciously given. Why these creatures would be so far down however is another matter entirely, and that is why he is doubting that it is actually them. Ani, whatever it is, it is trying to read my mind. Ahsoka spoke up. It isn't doing a very good job at trying for me. Are you okay to fend off whatever it is? Anakin asked her. But she should be fine, because her abilities had just gone through an increase of strength. The diet strengthened her immensely, but she didn't notice this. Just as she had gotten more powerful, so did Anakin as well, and it was only natural at this point that he is starting to recognize this increase more and more. Not because he is unaware or unable to sense it, but simply because his actual capabilities have reached such a state that it would probably take someone incredibly strong within the Force for him to sense a difference. No problem. Ahsoka answered as they started to see a strange light. But, what is that? The attacks to my mind are becoming stronger and stronger the deeper we go. I can feel it as well. It was in fact those knowledge banks. Galactic visitors. A voice was heard and it transmitted a thought to both Anakin and Ahsoka telepathically. The knowledge bank was composed of a colony of sentient bivouac mollusks, who inhabited the oceans of the planet Mon Cal Calamari. The bank had existed for millennia, but whether it was the same individuals or whether they had reproduced is unknown. The knowledge bank was highly intelligent, though because the intelligence was so different from other sentient beings, some observers gained the impression that it was not intelligent at all, but rather a passive recorder and transmitter. The shells of knowledge bank mollusks were about a meter wide and glowed faintly. The mollusks opened with a groaning noise. Their interiors were soft and fleshy, and had the appearance of a large, pulsing brain. They shone with a strong golden light reminiscent of sunlight. Once open, the mollusks emitted a slow pulsing sound through the water. You are seeing this as well, right Arnie? Ahsoka asked Anakin. Yes, I am. Galactic visitors. The voice was different this time, but it said the same words. What are they? Ahsoka asked Anakin. They are called knowledge banks, or otherwise known to the locals as Pikaku. You knowledge about seemingly everything doesn't seem to have an end. Ahsoka was honestly impressed even though she should be used to it by now. It was like there was an entire database of knowledge stored within his mind, and it had knowledge on things that even shouldn't have. Maybe you can become like me in the future and know everything Anakin replied before continuing. Okay? Maybe you wouldn't become like me, as there is no way you are that smart. Hey! Come, galactic visitors have. Ahsoka's outrage was interrupted however as the alien sentient mollus wanted to speak to them. Yes, we are here looking for some Ultima Pearls. Ahsoka decided that she would try and communicate with the species that seemingly didn't care about one's own mental privacy at all. Pearls, beautiful pearls. A female voice was heard. Beautiful pearls, deep below one will find. Next was another female, but the voice was deeper. Sir, deep below, we have discovered this pearl. It seems like it would sell on the market for thousands of credits. This voice was distinctly that of some kind of man. Danger, don't go down. This one, a shrill cry was heard, and then it was cut off abruptly. Multiple voices were heard and directly transmitted to both Ahsoka and Anakin, as the humming noise was also heard as the mollusks opened their mouths. Right? Pearls. Ahsoka said to herself before turning towards Anakin. Do you think we should heed its warning? I don't know. This is your test, remember? If you can't decide for yourself here even after everything you have heard, how are you going to do so in the future? I can't always have the answer, right? Anakin responded, pouting. Ahsoka doesn't say anything, but contemplates the situation some more herself as he was correct. He can't be always taking charge or the lead when it comes to her life, because it was her life after all. No matter how much she might love Anakin, it still didn't change the fact that they are two different people. Both individuals that could learn to compromise with each other, but still in the end she would have to choose what is best for herself. She had believed that it was best for her to leave the Order with Anakin, and she had done so even being forced to hand in her previous lightsabers she had only recently constructed herself. Okay, I have decided. She exclaimed as she looked back towards the knowledge banks and their still relentless push in trying to get into her mind, and if she is correct, Anakin's mind as well. This slightly angered her, not only for herself but also for Anakin as well. You creepy clams will stop trying to get into our minds. If you do not do so, I will be forced to take some drastic measures. 
Ahsoka flaunted her telepathic might by violently crushing the probes trying to enter her mind. Stop. Stop. It hurts. Master, please stop. Again, one has to remember that these voices are not the mollusk phone, but taken from the minds of others, their memories, thoughts and the emotions all recorded by them. The bank used telepathy to store information in its database, and communicate it to those who sought their knowledge. A network of non-sentient fish scattered throughout the oceans of Mon Calamari, collected information and relayed it to the bank. The bank mollusk themselves had incredible data storage abilities, allowing them to record the details of every event that had taken place in the waters of Mon Calamari. However, the bank only held information on events within the Mon Calamari ocean as well as any information in the thoughts of those who had come near it. Furthermore, the information could become distorted over time. I won't until you leave my mind and the mind of Anakin as well. You know, the large guy next to me, Ahsoka stated, and the invasive mollusk relented. They didn't want to feel what they did again as it would only harm them. As a collective they had to think of each other, because they relied on each other to continue to live. And if one of them dies, or even the fish they used to gather information for them died, then they would all be impacted. That's good then. Ahsoka noticing this didn't let up, but instead forcefully pushed them out before turning towards Anakin. Your decision? Anakin asked still awaiting whether or not they would be going further down beneath. We will go, Sky Guy, you may be really powerful. But it seems like I will be making the decisions today. Ahsoka exclaimed. Then I guess, I am all yours for the next few hours then. Anakin replied liking that Ahsoka was starting to decide things for herself. And this would be seen in the future as well. The further down the two went, they discovered that the light that they could use to see things was becoming dim once again. There was something calling out to the both of them that they both noticed. But since this is Ahsoka's find and decision, it was left to Ahsoka to determine the location of this feeling. They had to keep going down, and it was pitch black darkness, which was something she used to bring herself closer to Anakin. He noticed but didn't do anything to stop her progress. I think that they are in this direction, Ahsoka seemed to be getting lost as she was distracted with another task. That task being that she is trying to molest Anakin that he would continually move out of her reach, which was both fun for him and a little annoying. She was too young, and it would she wanted to emulate what he already had with the other girls. I think that you should keep your mind on the mission at hand, Anakin stated implying he knew of her thoughts and actions. What do you ever mean? Of course I am trying to get to you I mean get to the Ultima Pearls. She had a little slip of the tongue at that last moment there. Of course you are. Anakin decided to just ignore her mistake as he was also helping her out, knowing that it is slightly his fault that she was trying to sneakily cop a feel. The pervert that she is, Anakin does continue to make sure she is kept on point. They continue to swim, and there is some back and forth between the two, before they finally come across what they are looking for. In the duck of the ocean, the water swishes back and forth as Anakin keeps directing her in the right direction. Waking up from her own plans and desires, she is caught off guard once they both come across just the right amount of Ultima Pearls that they need. Two for her and one for him. They gave off a silver, lustrous glow, and it signaled to them both the prestige one would need to wield such a pearl. Either that or to pull off the luxurious look for having them would require some level of fashion. It wasn't exactly the nicest thing to wear, because it looked heavy, and it was as Ahsoka picked it up despite its size. For a pole like this to exist in the depths of an ocean, with the entirety of its weight crushing down on it, one would assume that it had the capabilities to survive naturally by itself in that state. See, I told you we were going in the right direction. Ahsoka said as if everything went accordingly to her plan. Sure, sure. Anakin knew she wasn't, but he wasn't going to spoil her parade. Ahsoka took her own poles, and Anakin took his as well, and now that the prize was gotten, it would seem that they weren't exactly alone. Wait, what is that? Ahsoka could sense a tentacle coming towards the both of them. It would seem like the protector of these pearls has come out to stop us from leaving. No shit. Ahsoka had quite the potty mouth on her in this moment as the both accelerated upwards. The squid is slow enough for Anakin to not need to hold onto her, which is relieving as he would have to deal with her trying to fill him up again. What could possibly go wrong well? It seems like this could possibly go wrong. Ahsoka continued as they made their way out. What could possibly go wrong? Well, it seems like this could possibly go wrong. Ahsoka continued as they made their way out. I suggest that you talk less and swim more. Anakin stated as they were closely followed behind by the squid. That somehow had the capacity to fit through the thin cracks and crevices. That it should have the ability to do with its size. You can talk. Ahsoka snapped back as the pressure of the situation increased her frustration. I can. Thanks. Anakin replied knowing that this would probably annoy her some more. Anakin and Ahsoka made their way through the tight spaces quickly, while making sure to secure their prize. What is that thing anyway? Ahsoka asked as she just barely dodged the imminent threat of the squid's tentacles. Didn't I say so before? A devil squid? Don't worry however, as there are things much more dangerous than this. Anakin said in a matter-of-fact tone. And what could possibly be more dangerous than? Well, those. Ahsoka was referring to the squid's hooked tentacles that if it latches onto them, they would be done. Or more specifically, she would be done as it was entirely possible that Anakin's armor would easily withstand the blow. Another swish and it had nearly clipped Anakin. But he didn't seem to be worried one bit while Ahsoka was still panicking in this situation. While she might be subconsciously aware of Anakin being powerful, that doesn't mean she has seen the full extent of his capabilities. In fact, there was nearly no one that had seen the true scale and power of his abilities. The only person having even ever caught a glimpse being Xana, 
And even then that was when he wasn't as powerful as he is now. He could quite literally use the force to destroy an entire planet if he wanted. Instead of Nihilus being able to absorb the life force and force energies from the entirety of a planet and the inhabitants, Anakin is able to absolutely crush one. He could create an entire black hole by condensing the mass of a planet into a small ball. Then he should be capable enough to control and maneuver the black hole if he wanted to. Not that Anakin would be telling anyone what he could do, as he especially wouldn't be telling the public at large. Fear is a powerful tool. But it could also be used against him, and people may come up, fearing his power, and try to take him down. That wouldn't do good for him and his public image. Run, 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 run. On the chase, Anakin and Ahsoka were now passing by the knowledge banks again. Will you guys shut up? Ahsoka said as they passed by. But because they were unable to move, they too were put under the gauntlet. The squid, now much more interested in something else. That something else being the knowledge banks, stops and leaves Anakin and Ahsoka to escape. Anakin and Ahsoka aren't cruel by nature, but because of the insistence of those mollusks on trying to read their minds in combination with the fact it took pain to make them let up, had them not care they were going to die. The Devil Squid easily was able to swallow those clams whole, and would then go on to ingest these things, while they called out for help. The two force sensitive people would be uninterested in doing so, especially since Ahsoka wasn't as adamant in leaving them. Anakin was the one to suggest trying to help. Maybe we should know, let's keep going. Ahsoka knew that sometimes being a nice person wouldn't help her or anyone else. Not that in this situation that aren't incapable of helping them and Anakin doesn't need to listen to her command. He doesn't mind all too much by leaving them behind. He too was annoyed by their persistence. In fact they had tried to enter his mind more so than Ahsoka, because he is stronger and has a much bigger presence, not just physically but also mentally. They were able to tell he is the greater threat of the two, so most of their efforts was focused on him. If he wasn't there, the mollusk may have easily infiltrated Ahsoka's mind even with her training to help her and connection to Anakin. They could piggyback off of each other to create a series of networks amongst each other to create a feedback loop that enables them to overpower whatever defenses she may have had. Anakin had taken all of their attention and had to make sure that most of their mental thoughts were directed at him. Otherwise she would be bombarded with the pleas and cries of help sent telepathically. Where would she be now without me Anakin thought to himself as they finally left the crevice they had gone into that just so happened to also have what they wanted. Now what is before them is the Great Grand Ocean, and their ability to see is once again restricted, as the darkness of the ocean is all there is left to see. What could possibly go wrong, he said. Ahsoka was mumbling to herself, but internally was quite happy at being able to finally get the pearls. Their journey was basically near over and done with, now only having Anakin be the only one left without a crystal or crystals of his own. Hey, it was your idea to continue going down. Anakin replied having the ability to hear here despite the water concealing their ability to hear stuff significantly. Yay. But it was your idea to go down into that crevice in the first place. And in fact I had no say in the matter at all, at the time. Ahsoka grumbled as argued with each other. Well it was your idea to come to this planet for your pearls. Anakin replied passing back the blame to her. You know why I wanted to come here. Ahsoka said. Yeah, because the Force said so. But when did we have to ever listen to the Force? It doesn't exactly always have the brightest ideas. Anakin continued. Whatever, let's get back to the ship. Back to Jabitha and the rest of the others. Ahsoka dropped the subject because she was on the losing end of the argument. Sure. Anakin agreed not wanting to further allow her to continue. Anakin and Ahsoka headed back in the direction of Jabitha and they would keep each other on their toes. They didn't want to have to come across the monster from the depths again. Well, maybe Ahsoka would have liked for that to happen again. She could come out of her stupid to finally be able to get some real feels, being the little pervert she is, she would try her best to do so, once given the proper opportunity. Not that she hadn't already tried to do something, and in fact she was trying to pull back and search for that monster to chase them again. She knew that this was dangerous, but neither herself and Anakin would be harmed because they could easily escape. Well, Anakin could easily escape it while holding on to her, and that is exactly why she tried to be both discreet, but at the same time trying to draw its attention, wherever it may be. What are you doing? Anakin asked her. She succinctly replied, of course, I am just doing what is natural when one should enjoy their experience when swimming or diving into the depths of the ocean. She was every now and then doing two things, waving her arms about, enhanced by the force to create waves, and using the force in on itself to send out signals. She was telepathically trying to lure the beast, so she could be held by Anakin again. Sometimes people can do some crazy things when they could have simply asked for something like that. Ahsoka could wait till they arrived back at Jabitha, and then ask for something like a hug. But instead she was, no, is willing to do something crazy to do so. Sometimes people don't think straight when it comes to experiences dealing with romantic manners. Whatever you are doing isn't going to help us much. He could feel the vibrations both physically and mentally, but didn't really bother to do anything. No matter what came, would it be able to go against a power that could create an entire black hole by virtue of being able to destroy an entire planet? Whatever do you mean? I couldn't possibly be putting us in any more danger. Then we already supposedly are. Ahsoka replied, and if Anakin could see her, then he would see her fluttering her eyelashes in a girlish manner. Stop being silly and let's continue. The two had made considerable progress and were nearing the island that Jabitha is landed on and would be able to leave the planet soon. They would come across the area of which they had originally chased from, meaning that their ascension would get them back to the upper world. Their extended stay within the water at this point caused their skin to get wrinkly. Well, it caused Ahsoka's skin to become wrinkly. 
because she didn't have the same biology as Anakin. Nor did she have a nano suit that was protecting him every second, every nanosecond of time. It is a part of him and would continue to be so. When ascending, Ahsoka finally let out a breath of both relief and disappointment, that she was unable to be embraced by Anakin. What are you saddened about? Anakin asked her as they came across some familiar looking rocky formations, and the light coming from various sources allowed them the ability to see once again. Saddened. How am I saddened? I don't know what you mean. Ahsoka replied not wanting to go into depth about why. Really? I don't know because it seemed like to me that you are disappointed about something. Haven't we come here for everything that you need? I need the both of needs. Anakin asked her, why didn't you want to tell me about the bond? Ahsoka asked out of nowhere, while they had some time alone from the others. Why would I? It didn't seem like you noticed and I prefer that you didn't do things according to things related to me. Simply because of our new connection, Anakin said. You should have told me. I know what it means and so do you. So you shouldn't be trying to fool either me or yourself. Ahsoka replied. What do you mean? Anakin asked as some fish swam past them, seemingly not caring about the two foreign invaders going past them. It would have sooner or later come out. I know that everyone else connected to you also probably knows as well. Which I admit kind of makes me feel hurt. Ahsoka had a little more time to think about Anakin's behavior around her, and it made sense. But then she also noticed in her memories, how the others looked at her. That was not my intention. Anakin quickly stated, I know it wasn't, you believe that I am not old enough yet for something like that. I guess you do realize that you are quite young. Quite young. All it would take is another three years before you start to even consider being together with me. Won't it Ahsoka sounded hurt at this? Yes. Silence permeated the sea as they were nearing the end of their trip. You shouldn't have formed a die with me then. Ahsoka said calmly despite her emotions being all over the place. You know that it is impossible for me to determine whether or not something like this happens. Anakin didn't want the situation to escalate any further and wanted her to calm down and be acclimated to what has started. I know. She replied knowing full well that he is in a fault, at least not directly. There you two are. Barris was waiting outside for both Anakin and Ahsoka to return as Isla was exhausted and had gone to sleep while Shark was also still at work for her lightsaber. She would be the first to be finished even when Barris was also close as well. It took some time to make sure everything is done just right when synthesizing a crystal. Barris. Anakin was already dried off while Ahsoka had to deal with the cold. Not for long however, as before Anakin went towards Barris. He picked Ahsoka up in a princess carry. Hey! Ahsoka called out. But didn't make any physical struggle, as his physical warmth was welcomed. It seems like the two of you have become closer. Barris said knowing about the diet and was already alright with it. Especially when it was someone she is close with, extremely so. And looks and loves as a sister already. Some things have been cleared up and she is aware now. Anakin said to Barris as he moved into Jabitha. Barris was following behind him just off to the side before closing the distance herself and also grabbing onto his arm. I don't mind, but she is a little young isn't she? Barris said. Who said I was going to start anything with her? No, I have told Ahsoka my stance on the situation. Anakin replied. You didn't actually tell me. But I understand. Ahsoka spoke up as she was enjoying this little moment of being carried. Anakin changes the topic by asking about Barriss's lightsaber. So, about your lightsaber is it nearly done yet? Yeah, it's nearly finished. Barriss answered before a comfortable silence had settled between the three. Barriss started again. By the way, I don't know if I should ask this now but... Go ahead, there shouldn't be anything to hide between everyone now at this point. Anakin gave her the go ahead, since they didn't have to hide the dive between Anakin and Ahsoka anymore. Isla was talking about how you now wouldn't mind having children. Barriss said. What? This startled Ahsoka as it meant Anakin would be having some children with those already in a relationship with him. Not that she minded this, but instead minded that she wouldn't be seen as an adult herself to be in a relationship with him like this. This is true as I have had both a change of mind and heart. Anakin replied ignoring Ahsoka's outcry, and just embracing her a bit more tightly to playfully shut her up. I make like being hugged by you scar guy, but I don't appreciate being squished. Ahsoka stated as she struggled a bit. He relented but also replied himself. Then you must know of my struggles when you try to hug me. He had entered Ahsoka's room along with Barris, and then threw her on her bed with no preamble. Go to sleep now. I am sure you are tired. But. No buts. Anakin promptly walked out as Barris also followed after him, presumably to get some alone time together. In the unknown regions, otherwise within a region called the Tempered Wastes was a ship, hidden from view, making its way over towards a planet. That was not too unlike the one they had come from. The group of Force Sensitives were all hard at work, either beginning to create their lightsabers or otherwise putting on the final bits and pieces of what they want. Anakin was the only one left out of this equation, as while he had gotten quite a lot of crystals of various types to be used for his own, he wasn't ready yet. He wouldn't be using something natural, but instead would be creating his own, just like Barris was, but would be doing so in a unique way. Lee Hen has already been described, surveyed and secured by Anakin, discreetly through the use of his droids. In fact it was Hitsuko, previously known as HK, that had come here to extract the fragments, destroyed pieces of an ancient relic that shouldn't come back to life. The Star Forge. Of course, he fought in any and all caution because he was just that incredibly powerful enough to overcome whatever lingering consciousness of the machine that was left over. He had already purified all of the fragments himself personally back on Tatooine where the construction effort is taking place. It would be finished or completed by the end of the Clone Wars, or at least according to the normal or previous timeline of the Clone Wars ending. Above the planet itself, Anakin directly had Jabitha descend. I don't like this place, Papa. Jabitha communicated to him. He responded. Don't worry, it is completely safe at least it is safe according to my knowledge. The girls were all 
distracted doing their own things to come and give him a wave off or even to be interested in a place that is of great historical significance. Not that any of them were all that interested in history or anything like that, as that title of history nut belongs to Renala. Everyone had their own talents and aptitudes, just as he had inherited the original Anakin's aptitude and focus for all things tech-based. There is a specific area, a base of sorts that was created a few years back, and it should now be uninhabited. It should be uninhabited anyway, Anakin said as he didn't sense anything down on the planet. Okay, if Papa says so, Jabitha said to Anakin. And so, Jabitha on Anakin's persistent insistence landed on the planet steeped in dark side energy which is why Jabitha didn't want to come down here in the first place. Standard gravity, a tropical climate, oceans, tropical islands and rocky outcroppings are all the I could see. There are three points of interest here on this planet, but none of which Anakin had any desire to plunder or explore simply because they are not his goal. Not his goal now, before and properly, not so in the future as well, at least for the time being. There was the heavily destroyed but relatively still standing Temple of the Ancients, then there were some settlements that were inhabited by some racket in a very long time ago, now long abandoned or otherwise sunk into the oceans of the world due to the climatic events that took place around 3000 years ago. This planet's a technological graveyard, indeed. Anakin said aloud to himself as he could sense some remnants of various mechanical, technological, other things related to artificial intelligence and materials used in the creation of droids or ships. Looking back behind him he is kind of disappointed that no one had come out to help him after all that he had done to help them. How cruel. Not that it actually mattered all that much, and he could forgive the girls for their enthusiasm at wanting to create their brand new and improved sabers. It wasn't every day a Jedi or Force sensitive would do so. No, it is every other day. Anakin thought to himself as he internally chuckled as his small joke. Most people that have had a lightsaber know that losing one is quite a commonality, and for the strangest of reasons, he believed he had a theory as to why. The Force is the one in control, so obviously it would be the one to decide whether or not someone kept their lightsaber. There was that and probably that connection between the Force and the crystal used in their saber. A person does change in what they when first creating one's saber is not the same as they are in the future evolution is again a large part of the force. Jabitha, tell the girls, if they come looking for me that I will be out for a while, maybe a few days at most as I don't intend to stay here for long. Anakin stated as he already has everything he needs on himself. A few days, papa. I don't want to stay here for too long. Jabitha complained to him, which lead him to sigh. Jabitha, you are completely safe, and if you aren't you can just call me, and I will be here very fast. I didn't have the foresight to make you capable of traversing the seas as well. How silly of me, otherwise I would bring you with me. Anakin really wanted to upgrade Jabitha now that he was aware of this flaw. He much preferred the luxuries Jabitha had within, rather than having to deal with the natural elements. Not that he is incapable of doing so. It is just that it was like being reborn into the medieval era. And while one may survive they may do so, and complain about not having the luxuries of a toilet and basic toilet paper. Papa is not a fault, it is Jabitha's fault. Sometimes she would refer to herself in the third person, and it reminded him of some cute creature. Whatever creature that may be. No, no, don't be like that. You are fine just the way you are, okay? I may want to make you better. Just so you could come along with me instead of being left alone. That is why I suggested it. Anakin relented not wanting to say she is useless in this situation. Really, Papa? Yes, really. I need to go now. So just relay my message to them if they come asking. I too, also don't want to stay here too long. And want to get back to Emperor in controlled space. Anakin said to Jabitha and she understood everything he said. Yes, Papa. Jabitha will do as Papa says. Lehan wasn't the best place to be. But Anakin had to explore the vastness of its ocean. Just to see if he could find the two crystals he wanted in particular. Revan was powerful and had gone on an epic journey of his own. And in doing so, he had collected some special crystals Anakin wanted. The mantle of the Force and the heart of the Guardian, especially the heart of the Guardian. Because of its connection to prophecy and all of that jazz. It was simple, really. Anakin would go into the depths of Lehan, just as he had gone into the depths of Dak to help Ahsoka to see if he could locate these special crystals. If only I could have it just as easy as Revan to find them. Anakin thought to himself as he prepared to dive. Revan had gotten the crystals by buying them, fortunately enough from someone else, and didn't really need to do anything other than that to get them. They were just there ready enough for him to take when he had acquired enough funds to do so. There were two places Anakin knew that he had to look for them, and that was either here on Lehan, or he had to go to Yavin 4, the place where Revan had died for real. Well, he didn't actually die there, but instead he died spiritually in a sense as he had become one with the Force, meaning that he was a ghost, then after completing his goal, he had let go of his consciousness. Tragic as it is, Anakin really did want those crystals, so he is going to connect Toki Force to see if it would tell him where it is. Obviously going to random planets, that Revan just happened to either be on or died on was somewhat a wastage of his time. That was if he wasn't planning to create something of epic proportions. It is very likely that his lightsaber crystals, the mantle and the guardian are on Yavin, considering that was where he died, becoming one with the Force. It was just the disappearance of his physical form of cause, and his spirit remained until his goal was complete, meaning that it is most likely not where on Lehan, but on the of chance that it was. 
Anakin would then go on to explore the entirety of Lehan, well, explore all he could in a vain attempt to rediscover the crystals, but he would only be met with failure. Through the Force he was unable to to perceive anything. Despite being the chosen one, the Force didn't want to help him out in the endeavor. Either that it couldn't help him because the crystals had either been destroyed or otherwise lost to the sands of time. Lehan was a tropical world in a remote and relatively unknown corner of the galaxy known as the Tempered Wastes, a largely void area of space. Its surface was largely covered by oceans dotted by numerous clusters of islands and archipelagos. After the Jedi Civil War, the entire Lehan system was littered with wreckage from the destroyed Star Forge and the remnants of crippled vessels, which had fought in the final battle of the war. Lehan itself became surrounded with asteroid-like rings of rubble which made navigation to and from the planet extremely dangerous. Even within the oceans, Anakin explored could see the absolute devastation left behind by the destruction of the people that used to be here. This planet was much more deeply imbued with the dark side, and was surprisingly so much more than the planet of Korriban, which was known to be an extremely powerful and potent planet, connected to the dark side of the Force. It certainly could be used for something else Anakin thought to himself, but knew that wanting this place was unrealistic. It would be unsustainable to keep this place, not with his current political, economic and military power. It was something that wouldn't help him much in the long run, and he had only used this place to extract the fragments of the Star Forge. There is nothing else here for him or for anyone else for that matter, but he could find something interesting on a small island that held the ruins of a special temple. It may not give him everything he needs or give him everything he wants, not in the moment or in the future but he is sure it would be helpful for some others within the Emperor, and within his new order as well, as he won't limit or restrict people on what they want to do, whether that be study the dark side or the light. Everything is off limits when it comes to him, and he is strong enough to control anyone that does anything extreme. He wouldn't just allow anyone access to the dark side and their techniques without some supervision, that supervision being him or anyone that manages to achieve balance. Or it could be someone that is extremely powerful and has control over the dark side, more so than the person wanting to learn. The Temple of the Ancients, also called the Temple of the Elders, was a temple on Lehan that was said to hold the secrets of the Star Forge. The temple's doors were blocked by a mysterious force field that only Rakata could bring down by performing a special ritual, or by using an ancient tome. And even then, the force field would not stay down for long. The structure itself was 20 meters tall. Located on the top of the Temple of the Ancients was the summit. It contained an elevator to the main floor, as well as a disruptor field that forced starships to land, either controlled or not, on the planet. This temple holding the secrets to the Rakatan Empire's success, that being the Star Forge was locked, and even in its devastated state, Anakin was easily able to bypass their defenses. He has become extremely powerful within the Force and extremely knowledgeable, so of course he entered easily. After Anakin went in to get everything he wanted, plundering the place of every source or piece of information that was left behind, he moved on to searching to see that maybe, just maybe the crystals he was searching for is down there. Unfortunately for him however is that this place was a tomb, a tomb of outdated knowledge from thousands of years ago, but knowledge that was mostly and vastly still superior to everything that is accessible in this day and age. There was a lot of information of the dark side and dark side techniques, which he took for himself and those of whom were starting to learn from within the temple or educational facility on Tatooine. He was done there and decided to completely finish off this place for good and used the force telekinetically crunching the place outside. The ruin started to form a spherical shape as he exerted his will destroy this place forever, having it be erased from history. It is best that this place dies and the knowledge stays with me. Anakin thought to himself as he condensed the ruined temple into a small ball that was emitting a lot of intense energy. Sparks of electricity or lightning was come out of his palms as he again started to hyper-energize this ball and then threw it up and out of the atmosphere of Lehan. Doing so a miniature explosion would take place startling the girls back on the ship. Knowledge is power. But in the wrong hands it could spell that doom for many. So of course Anakin believed that he was the right hands, specifically he was the one in the right for having this knowledge. This information of which was dangerously tempting. But he didn't care one bit about the whispers to use and exploit it for himself. He would be using it. But he wouldn't just be doing so for himself but instead seeing if it could be used for the betterment of his emperor as well. He is the proper leader now, and it would be quite selfish of him to do everything for himself. Now he needs to properly think about those within the emperor, not that he wasn't doing that before, but now, publicly, he would need to put in some effort. Or at least show that he is. Yavin 4 was one of three habitable moons orbiting the gas giant Yavin. It was mainly covered in jungle and rainforests, and despite being remote and unheard of, it would play an important role in galactic events, including the seduction of Jedi Knight Ixacun to the dark side, and the destruction of Sith Lord Freedon Nad during the Great Sith War, the site of the eventual final death of the Madden Jedi Revan, in the waning days of the Galactic War. It would have been and probably will if events go accordingly, be the place of ferocious duel between Jedi and Sith during the Clone Wars, and serving as the base of the Alliance to restore the Republic during the Battle of Yavin, and as a battlefield in other battles of the Galactic Civil War. An attack was launched on the Death Star from this moon. It also became the base for a Jedi Academy after the war ended. All of this however, the later events may or may not happen depending on Anakin's effects on the galaxy at large. His empire stepping in to become the new safe haven instead of an entire rebel alliance against the emergence of the Galactic Empire. 
For all intents and purposes it was still possible for the Rebel Alliance to restore the Galactic Republic, could still be formed, and try to overthrow Palpatine. It wasn't off the books just yet, as Anakin didn't know whether or not it would reach that point of where he would be the safe haven for these people. If it does reach this point, it would probably be better for him to just declare himself as the new Emperor of the Galactic Empire, and just merge the Emperor and the Galactic Empire. It would be immensely better for himself and much easier as well. But there were also problems with that solution. The purpose of the Rebels was to restore the democracy of the Republic and make it better instead of electing another Emperor, namely himself. What was that back on Lehan, Ani? Isla was a little shook by the explosion that was created, and it also disturbed everyone else, believing that they were being attacked. But, it was only Anakin making a big scene out of nothing because he felt like it. Well, there were other reasons as well. Since the ruins of that temple was also a source of latent dark side energies, he decided to just destroy it. Nothing much. Anakin replied not going into detail as they were above Yevon 4 within Jabitha. Right, I am sure that a massive explosion that could even be felt by all of us was nothing. Isla rolled her eyes at Anakin's poor excuse. Hey, calm down now. You guys were the ones to leave me all by myself, all with my boredom of trying to get my own lightsaber crystal, Anakin replied, giving his compelling argument. One doesn't simply just blow stuff up for some fun. Shark interjected her own thoughts. Maybe you guys wouldn't Anakin was truly and well bored on his search, and needed some action on his search. Becoming powerful is great, and all but it does get boring, especially if you have a very strong to be adventurous and take action. Even though there will be a lot of action for him yet, that didn't mean his boredom in the moment wasn't warranted. There is also the fact he didn't want the temple to survive for an even longer time after its fall as well, despite its historical value. It didn't mean all that much to the galaxy at large, even when it had become officially a historic site to be kept and properly preserved. I don't think anyone else, but you would do that. Barris said, not that any of the girls were mad or anything as he didn't harm anyone, and at most gave the fish on the planet a scare. They had after all not come to help him when he had helped them. Again, not like it all that mattered because he didn't need it. But it was the thought that counted anyway. Where are we now? Ahsoka decided to shift the conversation to a new topic. That new topic being Yavin 4. The resting place and the most probable area to find the lightsaber crystals that Anakin is looking for. At this point Barris and Shark have both finished constructing their lightsabers. And are wishing to get a move on and use them within a real life scenario. I am glad someone asked. We are currently at Yevon 4, currently within the Outer Rim territories, of course. Anakin stated. In fact, it should be around this time that the Dark Reaper events were taking place, meaning that there was a chance that the group could come across the estranged Night Sister. That isn't a Night Sister anymore, known as a Sage Ventress. The Dark Reaper was a Sith super weapon created during the Great Hyperspace War, 5,000 years prior to current events. The Dark Reaper worked by harvesting the Force using the Force Harvester, a device that killed anything within range, by draining its Force energy and focusing it into beams. That dealt massive damage to any object. However, the Reaper could not harvest a wound in the Force. The Reaper was also equipped with Dark Side powered turbo lasers. In order to defeat the Dark Reaper, an ancient Jedi Knight named Julek Keldroma taught the Jedi how to withstand the Dark Reaper's effects. Anakin had heard of the news that the Dark Reaper had been destroyed, and wasn't all that hurt over its destruction. Even when he could have taken it for himself as he could always go to its debris and always reconstruct it. Just as he had done with the Star Forge, which he considered of much more importance rather than this weapon which could have killed billions. In fact, that sounds like a good idea. I should go ahead and do that for myself. It seemed like events were perfectly lining up, and it was quite possible, if not guaranteed, that he or anyone else here would be finding the estranged Ventress. Originally she had been followed by the counterpart Anakin, and he wasn't the original, but it is still possible that the stars were lining up perfectly. Maybe it was all just as the Force wanted. It was just after the group had left Dak, did the Separatists come and take it over by Dooku. He also deployed it on Dak. The death of millions caused the planet's inhabitants to cooperate with the Confederacy, including the deployment of Commander Mero. Anakin had a head start and of course didn't want to get in their way. It made him wonder whether or not the Force was sending Ahsoka these visions, even visions that could potentially have him come into conflict with either the CIS or Republic on purpose. Everything lined up to allow it to have him come so close to these events, that it even lead him back to here. Even though it was his decision, the Force was getting more and more attuned to him, and trying to still lead him in the direction it wanted. The duel may still happen yet. Anakin thought to himself as Ahsoka nudged him to continue. Right, right. I got distracted for a second, he said to the group, but because his eyes were unfocusedly looking in a certain direction, Isla was both proud and embarrassed. Can you stop making eyes and staring blanking at your wife and continue explaining? I didn't know you were such a pervert, Shark said out loud because she was listening to his explanation before he was seemingly distracted. I wasn't looked dash Anakin looked at the cute Isla and decided to take ownership of an action that he didn't actually do. No, I was staring at my wife. You are right to assume that is the correct answer. Sighing, Shark gestures for Anakin to continue. Isla didn't mind, and in fact wanted him to do so, while Ahsoka was annoyed, and Barris didn't mind considering he had done some things to her as well the night before. It would seem that he had the capabilities more and more so to block off this connection, the closer everyone is. So he was now capable, but only a further away enough to block of the feelings of such acts from the others if he wanted. Anyway, back to the topic at hand, this planet is a very special place. It has had a lot of special events happen here, and I am here to find some very special crystals. Anakin continued, so it is your turn. 
Hun. You didn't find anything on Li Hun? Isla questioned having come out from her little trance. No, there was nothing at all. Anakin answered. So, who is going to go with you then? Barris asked as she wanted to go with him. No doubt the others would all like to take along as well. Me too. Practically all of them said. But Anakin knew better than that. No, I shall just take Shark and Barris with me. This left out Ahsoka and Isla to stay behind on the ship, especially since they hadn't finished their lightsabers yet. It would be dangerous especially if Asajj was actually here on Yavin 4. This is also a chance for the two of them to test out their lightsabers, Shark getting used to her own, while Barris gets a feel as well. She is probably along with Ahsoka. That needs training and actual experience. When it comes to these things the most, that is not fair. I want to come along. Ahsoka complained, but she has had enough adventuring for now, and Anakin decided. No, Barris, Shark and I will go. I don't need absolutely everyone within to help me search, and I shouldn't take too long here. Anakin said, whereas Shark is surprised that she is coming along. Not that she minded, not one bit, but she probably would have preferred if Anakin took her alone. There is no telling what she would do once they were alone, and she is both regretful and thankful that he would not have her to himself. Or is it the other way around, where she would have him to herself? Right, let's get going then. Barris turned a little excitable because even though it wouldn't be some proper alone time, it would certainly allow her to do some other things. That while wasn't what she is hoping for, would still be better than staying within Jabitha. Not that Jabitha wasn't luxurious enough and even had some games to play with, and she also was able to connect back to the servers and networks of the Emperor, and it still doesn't beat getting some outside experience. Barris had already packed everything she needed, as soon as the words left his mouth, she bolted back to her room. Shark meanwhile didn't need to do much at all and had everything she would need on her. This trip would most likely not be taking an entire week to complete, and may even be completed within the day. If not, then it was possible for it to extend outwards. But even then it wouldn't matter because she is capable enough in hunting. She is used to living out in the wilderness after all. Alright then. I guess let's all meet back up outside, and you too. Anakin turned his attention to Isla and Ahsoka. I suggest that you two get back to working on your lightsabers. Or you could just slack off I won't be long and will most likely be finished within today. Isla just went up to him and gave a very, very long and somewhat sensual hug, something that was both great and annoying to Anakin. He had to shield Ahsoka from those feelings in this moment as he would consider this inappropriate. But now that she knew it would seem that Isla doesn't mind sharing her feelings, that didn't mean he did, and while he wouldn't mind if she was older, it certainly bothered now. I know. Anakin said to Isla as he knew what she wanted. It was more than just the physical feeling and the spiritual transference. But at this point, when he gave her the go-ahead on having children, she became especially enthusiastic. I will be seeing you as well, snips. Anakin said. Internally Ahsoka was beaming. He said it he said it she had gone into a trance, a trance of which gave Anakin time enough to escape the situation he was in. He couldn't exactly some some fun times with Isla right here, right now, but he promised her mentally that he would punish her once they got back to the Emperor. I hope so. Isla at this moment sent a message back as well. Yevon 4 was composed of a molten metallic core with a thick, immobile low-relief silicate crust. The surface was made up of four continents, which accounted for 67% of the moon's surface. These continents were mostly covered in large sprawling tropical jungles with tall canopies. Though there were also a few mountain ridges like the Yenta Mountains, dominated by volcanoes such as the Nicolo and Burundi Peaks. Yevon 4 also had six interconnected oceans, which covered the remaining 33% of the moon. There was also a large landlocked sea on the moon. As a relatively young world, the tiny jungle moon experienced a considerable amount of geothermal activity. Large rivers flowed dramatically from volcanic heights, and then followed a more meandering pace through the jungles. The planet had the standard 24-hour cycle that was similar to the timescale of Earth from Anakin's previous life. Where are we going then? Shark asked. This way? Anakin just started walking off into a random direction. Don't worry, he knows what he is doing. Barris was of course just going to follow along with whatever Anakin said. I am sure he does. Shark rolled her eyes at the blatant display of affection and honeyed words Barris said, just for Anakin to hear. It has been some time since the Battle of Geonosis, and it is about the time, four weeks to be exact after, that Dooku should have both made and lost the Dark Reaper. Anakin just knew that with the timeline of events, he was probably either going to come across Ventress, just as the original had, or that he had messed up the galaxy so much, he was never ever going to meet her. Looking through some shatter points and delving into the Force told him otherwise however, as he sees that they, himself, Shark and Barris, will come across the aspirant Sith apprentice of Dooku. Where exactly are we gone again? Shark asked for what felt like was the tenth time, but was actually only the fourth. Anakin had been keeping count after all, it was easy to do so with his mind. We are going where the wind takes us. Where the wind takes us. Barris asked with a confused look on her face, as it wasn't an expression she has heard of before. Something like, where the force takes us. Yeah, something like that. Anakin replied while thinking inwardly, of course, not really the force, because the force is semi-sentient, not the wind. So, we are heading in the direction the force has taken us. Shark asked thinking that Anakin was actually doing something productive, maybe. Anakin replied knowing that Shark will easily pick up on the fact he is actually not using the force. The reason why he isn't in this instance is because he didn't need to do so. 
he knew of the directions towards the place he needed to go. If he didn't scout out the area before he landed, then how the hell was he going to know, other than using the Force? He can't always rely on the mystical magical power of this energy field. Sighing with a bit of frustration, Shut just decides to not bother with it and just follow along, just waiting for her chance to fully come into action. Jungles, rainforests, these are the main terrains and biomes of Yavin 4, despite it being a simple moon. It is habitable by people, by any species really that could be for this environment, whether adapted or adaptable to something like this climate. There were four places that Anakin was interested in excavating, not including the area he was most interested in because of the crystals he wants. Within the Masasi site, the isolation chambers and everything else within this site, then there was the Swamp of Fallen Stars, a technological graveyard, and lastly the Temple Ruins. These areas had the most interesting things of historical importance, but not only that, also it would hold more information, knowledge for him and others. Anakin knows that this place would have been used for the Rebel Alliance, but since they may not even be a thing he could take this for himself, he isn't all that sure what he could do with it, and if it would be of any help to his empire at its current state however. The group of three would continue to wade their way through the thick underbrush, using the forced telekinesis to make sure nothing was in their way. Every now and then, Shark or Barris would test the efficiency and effectiveness of their lightsabers. How long until we reach a destination? Barris questioned with some frustration as while she loves Anakin. That doesn't mean she is willing to continuously follow along with what he is saying. At some point she would start to get curious as to where exactly they are going. It shouldn't be long now. Anakin simply replied while Shark was now the one laughing at Barris. Oh, how the roles have reversed. It feels as if it's been days. Barris sighed out loud even though it had realistically only been about an hour. Give or take a few minutes. Don't worry because we are moving at a record pace. Anakin stated with a chipper tone. Hey, unlike you and your insane limitless stamina, that you have no shame exerting in your nightly activities. Shark starts up as she knows, and even felt sometimes what he and the other girls have done. Us common girls have some need for rest. She was not embarrassed at all, it would seem. Common girls, eh? Anakin said with a questioning tone. Don't worry, we should be arriving soon enough. Why didn't we just use Jabitha to get us directly where we need to be? Shark asked. I don't know. Anakin really didn't know. As they continued, he began to wander around the rainforest. Darth Ruvan was the reason for the rule of two that the current Sith practiced, and while he wasn't the one to create it, he was the one to inspire such a thing. When Darth Bane had discovered some damaged manuscripts about Revan, Revan lived a long, long life, and it was aided by the Fools. He lived for well over the normal limit a human would be able to live for, and it was entirely possible that he could have lived for a very long ever after, if he didn't become one with the Force. There is a reason Anakin believed the crystals to possibly be here, on Yavin 4. While it is correct that Revan had been captured elsewhere while he was still considered and was a Jedi, that didn't mean they would stay where he was captured, or even still have those lightsaber on him. Even though he should have, Anakin knew that the Force was not like that, and instead was a lot more dramatic, than it really should be. It would have created the tragedy of Darth Vader, of course, just so it could restore its balance, no. He was here, because this was both the last place of Revan's passing, but also the last place he had on the top of his mind for such crystals to either be buried or hidden away. It was entirely possible for him to find stuff here that would pertain to the crystals at the very least. There it is. Anakin stated as the group of three came across the Sith, the Masasi site. So this was what we were looking for. I still don't understand why we couldn't just come here with Jabitha Shark muttered under her breath. But Anakin heard her. Don't you feel it? The dark side of the Force permeates this planet, especially this site here for example. It is all-consuming. Anakin questioned Shark. Yes, I can feel it. But I don't see Shark slowly comes to the realization of why exactly they, or more specifically Anakin, didn't want to have Jabitha land in this site. I see now. It's good that you do see, otherwise I may just have to check your vision. Anakin stated in a joking manner. You can't be going blind now through your ears. And how does one do that? Barris was curious as she missed the sarcasm within Anakin's voice. It's not Dashy side before looking back over the decay side of dark side energies, where ritualistic sacrifices took place. It kind of resembled the pyramids or Aztec, Mexica temples of his previous life. You know what, never mind the Masasi site, also known as the Masasi Ruins, was a region of Yevon 4. The site comprised a group of stone temples that were built around 5000 BBY, by order of the exiled Sith Lord Naga Sado, and it was named after the Masasi warriors who once inhabited it and erected its monuments. The group of three would go down to explore this site, with all of them splitting up from each other, because there shouldn't be anything of any particular danger here on the moon. Although the Masasi temples were scattered across the surface of the jungle moon, some of the oldest and most important temples belonged to the site. Those would be no millennia later as the Great Temple, the Palace of the Wulamanda, and the Temple of the Blue Leaf Cluster. In the wake of a devastating battle between the forces of Ixacun and the Jedi Order, the ravaged complex was abandoned for several millennia. Anakin had explained to both Barris and Shark, that what he was looking for was special crystals, that they should be able to easily identify. This place wasn't really the place Revan had stayed on, but Anakin had a feeling, an instinctual feeling himself and within the Force, that the crystals he was looking for were here. Revan did have a base here previously at some point 3,000 years prior to now, 
and Anakin was banking on the fact he would find those crystals here. Barris went off to explore one of the temples, while Shark went to explore the other. He, on the other hand, would be taking the main temple. Barris went towards the Palace of the Wormander, Shark went towards the Temple of the Blue Leaf Cluster, while Anakin took the Great Temple. The Palace of the Wormander, or Wormander Palace, was an ancient Misasi temple next to the Temple of the Blue Leaf Cluster, in the Villanos jungle of Yevon 4. It was built by Misasi slaves during the Dark Lord Ixacun's reign in 3997 BBY. He also kept the Golden Globe, a globular device which imprisoned the souls of the children of the Misasi, in a sealed chamber. It would be here that Barris would come across the Kushiban Jedi Master Ikrit, who during the last centuries of the Galactic Republic came to the palace and discovered the Golden Globe. Knowing that he was unable to free the trapped souls, he placed himself in a false trance to wait the arrival of those who would break the curse. Ikrit was a male Kushiban from the world of Kishiba, who was trained as a Jedi by Yoda, and later became a Jedi Master. During his career with the Jedi Order, he discovered a Masasi temple on Yavin 4, which trapped the souls of many Masasi children. After failing to free them, he went into a self-imposed exile, until the person that could free them came to the temple. By doing this, he avoided all Jedi events for the next 400 years. Or at least nearly 400 years as Barris was now here. Barris instead of those from the future that would take care of this problem, would be the one to help free the children within. Something that would occupy her time while Shark would also be occupied, but with another problem. Shark going towards the Temple of the Blue Leaf Cluster, also known as the Blue Leaf Temple, was a temple on Yavin 4, located on the Torin Delta, just downstream the Un River from the Great Temple. She would have to deal with the aggressive insectoids, designated the Clicknicks, that inhabited the temple's interior, effectively keeping any outsiders from entering. Of course, there was a little more to her situation as well, because she was being watched. Shark knew she was being watched and awaited to see just who was doing so. We rejoin Anakin back at the Great Temple. The Great Temple, commonly referred to as the Masasi Temple, was built on Yavin 4 by the Masasi to worship Nagasado, a Sith Lord who had enslaved and mutated the Masasi using Sith alchemy. The temple would have later housed the Rebel Alliance base, known as Masasi Base, and the Jedi Praxium. The temple would be destroyed during the Yuuzhan Vong occupation of Yavin 4. A great place indeed he thought to himself as he admired the architecture, but he wasn't here for that and needed to focus. The time was coming soon that Ventress should show herself, and there is no telling whether that be here or there. Seeing into the future is hard, even with shatter points. It isn't perfect, you can go by that logic, when looking at what happened to Mace Windu. Even though he had this power, this powerful ability, he was still slain by Anakin, and didn't see it coming as well, and probably only saw it within the last moments of his life. Internally, the Great Temple was divided into four levels, each representing a step of the ziggurat. Each level was thus larger in floor plan than the one above. But all were outfitted on broadly similar plans, with small cells, chambers and corridors around a large central space. The topmost level was almost entirely taken up by the Grand Audience Chamber, used as a ceremonial hall. A viaduct was located near the temple's entrance along with an altar and a fountain with stone pillars. An overlook was available across a canyon. There were many levels with many, many things destroyed, and as Anakin made his way inwards, he didn't want to do anything to it. It was probably either best left to be itself or be destroyed as using it as a base would be cursed. He didn't enter through the lowest level, but instead was somewhere just below halfway, and it was huge. It was immensely huge, and when comparing his height to it, it defiantly won. Naga Sada was either a very narcissistic person or was trying to cover up for his inadequacies. Anakin thought to himself as he would continue to search around and would soon come to a realization that some stuff was happening away from him. Specifically, Barris would be doing something dangerous, while Shark would also be under some trouble. Barris was currently within the Palace of the Wormander. She was sent here, at random, and has come to discover that this place is actually not as scary as it seemed it would be. This place was after all, as Anakin had explained to Shark and herself, a place of Sith creation and horrible experiments being done. Sacrifices and all. I wonder what Arnie is doing right now. She couldn't help but let her thoughts wander to her lover, now husband, and she reminisced her insecurities. How silly of me. The temple's name, the palace was named after a pack of Wormanders by someone that had come to the moon before. Well, it was supposed to be named as such by someone within the future, but Anakin just decided to keep the name. There was no need to confuse himself, and it wasn't like the palace had absolutely no relation to Wormanders at all. Looking around the ruins, Barris is contemplating many things. But right now she had a mission to do. A desire to help her beloved in his search, just as he had helped her with her own lightsaber's development, their materials and crystal. How could she not feel the way she does? She had been doing so for what felt like at least half of her life, and it was true. Ever since he had appeared, she had been taken. Her mind, body and soul without her, realizing that what she wanted was him, needed as Anakin. Okay, maybe she didn't need him, but that is how she felt, and she wouldn't have it any other way. A scurrying of feet was heard by Barris as she became aware that she was being watched. It wasn't something that called out to her as danger, but it certainly wasn't something that could be considered all that friendly, and she would have to wait for this person, or being to reveal itself. It is entirely possible for it to be some sort of wildlife that was living within the palace. She activated her lightsaber and continued her way into the palace. There was silence, and all she could make out is the noise from outside of the palace of the beasts and alien creatures native to Yevon 4. Sooner or later, she would come across something strange, strange enough to pull her in. Not in a trance-like state, 
but in a way that it was horrific. The dark side energies of this planet, it was extremely potent, and the energies she felt coming from this object in particular was bad. Like, really bad. She saw a dilapidated ruins with decaying infrastructure, and it was an absolute shambles, only a shadow of its previous self. A great palace, with horrific and terrible origins, reduced to a waste due to the passage of time. What is this? Barris practically gasped as she came across the object. Barris's attention was drawn to an exert that was carved into a stone tablet near this large glowing golden orb. Peace to all. We are the Masasi. Our children have been imprisoned by the evil Jedi Knight Ixacum. Locked deep within this palace, hidden in the glittering sands of a golden globe, they await. The crystal that holds them prisoner can only be unlocked by children strong in the Force and dedicated to the battle of good over evil. If you are the ones, enter the globe and lead our children to freedom. The exert finished. Wouldn't this mean that the people meant to free the children are meant to be more than me? Barris thought to herself as she was reading this exert carved into a stone tablet. The Golden Globe was a massive spherical device created by the Sith Lord Ixacun during his reign over the Masasi on Yavin 4 around 4,000 years prior to now. The Golden Globe resembled a massive, glowing, golden crystal sphere. As with many other dark side devices, it emitted a dark presence in the Force. Though no more than 4 meters when measured from the outside, its size within was infinite, allowing it to hold a large amount of captives. Within the Golden Globe was a realm filled with sand and dust. The Golden Globe was protected by a powerful energy shield which threw back anyone who attempted to touch it. The only way to break through this field was to weaken it with the Force. The globe was also haunted by manifestations of the followers of Ixacun, who tried to dissuade visitors from going near the globe, and freeing the captives. The golden globe was bound by Sith magic that could only be destroyed by Force-sensitive children. If an adult tried to do so, the golden globe would shatter into dust along with the captives. Once inside, the only way to break the golden globe was to use the Force to weaken the field from within, allowing the captives to escape, and shattering the globe into sand. It was such an insidious device, that Barris also had no way to enter because she is technically not a child anymore. She is an adult and she is unsure by which definition holds true for this globe. One might question where she had gotten this information. Well, all she had to do is make abundant use of psychometry through touching the stone tablet. In doing so she could view the past, and her force abilities were strong enough to do so. Are you the one, child? A voice spoke and it startled her from her thinking because she was trying to think up of a solution. Who is there? She looked around, but all she could see was an animal of some sort. What are you doing here? She went towards this small, white fairy creature and tried to approach it, while sending calming emotions through the force. Would you stop that? The voice echoed out again, and this time she is easily able to identify the person, know the animal was the cause of the sound. A blue what? Barris was confused as she was now dumbfounded at the fact, a creature that looked like some sort of pet, could communicate with her. Don't worry child, I am a Jedi master. A Jedi. Barris was even more confused, having never seen a Jedi that looked, well, looked like a mixture between a common house cat, lemur and rat, all at the same time. That is right, and from what I can sense, you are at the very least force sensitive and look young enough to be a child. You are a child, right? Barris was offended, because she did feel some of her features were less than, womanly, I am 19 years of age, thank you very much. She practically harumphed at the weird hybrid creature that proclaimed itself to be a Jedi Master. Don't worry child, it is fine to admit your real age. My name is Ikrit, a Jedi Master that was trained under Master Yoda 400 years ago. You were trained under Master Yoda. But look at you Barris doesn't mean to be offensive here. But the creature had already started up with calling her someone that looks like a child. I have been awake from my slumber as it would seem that I have found the person that is meant to help me in dismantling this despicable marvel of the dark side. Ikrit said. Ikrit was born on the outer rim world of Kishiba. Like many other Kushibans, he was a farmer and a weaver. However, unlike most Kushiban, he was not skilled at weaving. At a young age, his village was visited by Jedi Master Yoda, who had come to seek a Padawan. During this visit, Ikrit offered to assist Yoda in any way he could. However, the Jedi Master told him that he was the Padawan he had been searching for. Though his fellow Kushibans and even Ikrit himself found it absurd at first, Ikrit left Kishiba with Yoda and began training as a Jedi. I am sure that I could be of some assistance, but can you tell me exactly why you are here? Barris was still confused and was looking for some answers. Well, where do I begin? Ikrit would then go on to explain many things before the two would begin to work on destroying the Golden Globe, while also releasing all of the trapped children's souls. An insectoid, large enough to overshadow Shark was making its way towards her. It resembled a praying mantis from Anakin's previous life, and no doubt whatever other species it could be compared to in this new life as well. One went directly towards her, but her instincts and natural training within the Force enabled her to easily defeat her foes. They were great hunters themselves, but compared to her, they were no match given her experience. While they were locked up within the Temple of the Blue Leaf Cluster, her lightsaber was being put to good use, and her skills that she had not been tested with as time passed was slowly getting back up to standards. She has had training and practice with either Anakin or any of the others, but that doesn't mean it would be to the life and death. Something which her instincts as the carnivore, the predator demanded of her, not that she is ruled by her biological desires, but it helps her in the heat of moments like this. No matter how calm looking she is, she actually had quite a lot of feelings that she could draw upon to empower her Self. Something that she had also been working on, with the aid of Anakin, was exactly those emotions and feelings that helped her. It didn't mean she was turning to the dark side, but instead was fueled and empowered, just as Anakin is when he directs his emotions. The Clicknicks were annoying her, because they continued non-stop. They seemed to be limitless despite only having lived 
within this temple, closed off from the rest of the moon at large. The Clicknik was a dangerous insectoid species native to the jungles of Yevonfall. These voracious carnivores lived in large underground hives, and reported only to their queen who oversaw every last Clicknik. Hive members carried out specialized tasks, dividing them into workers, hunters, warriors and defenders. This meant that it was entirely possible these things would not end, and in contrast to Anakin, whom has unlimited stamina, she does not have the same capacity to continue. I doubt that the crystals are in here anyway. Shark gave herself some calming thoughts, as there was truly no way for her to know whether or not the things Anakin was looking for were further in. I need to retreat. She had been taught that retreating was cowardly, yes, but that didn't mean it was to be avoided. Sometimes, it is the right tactical decision to do so, and in this moment it should count for something that she was outnumbered and quite literally, having little time to recuperate some energy. She had killed a decent amount of these creatures, which would no doubt have the queen of this mantis ant-like hive a chance to reconsider going after her. Having gotten outside of the temple, she is once again alerted within the force, and her own natural senses to the presence of another. Show yourself, Shark called out, which only lead to silence. Silence within a forested area, where animals are likely was very telling to her that someone else or something else was within the same area as her. Her lightsaber still ignited, ready for when that someone or something shows itself. There was silence of course, until it was revealed to be none other than a Sag Ventress in the flesh. A person that Anakin half suspected would be coming, but was still unsure of where she would end up. Who are you? Shark asked the pale woman, that was steeped in dark side energies. Before, as a Jedi, she may have had something against those of the dark side, but that didn't mean she wasn't incapable of seeing things through the point of view from another person. Me? Why? I am a Sag Ventress, of course I wonder, what could a Jedi possibly be doing here? I am no Jedi. Shark stated having already come to terms with this fact long ago. Oh, then what are you Sith? You do not seem to be as such. The bald female Dathomirian Zabrak questioned. A Sag Ventress was a female Dathomirian Dark Jedi, and a valuable Dark Acolyte to Count Dooku. Originally a Knight Sister from Dathoma, Ventress was taken as a slave to Ratatak and trained as a Jedi Padawan by Jedi Knight Kentucky Narak. However, after Narak was slain, Ventress gave in to her anger and began walking the path of the dark side taking up the lightsaber of her dead master. She trained herself in the Jack-Eye style of lightsaber combat before slaying all the warlords on Ratatak and installing herself as its ruler. Ventress would certainly be something the Knight Sisters would be proud of. That is because I am not a Sith, but I'm something else. Shark wanted the woman to properly identify herself. Who are you exactly? Where do you come from and who do you affiliate yourself with? EIS. Ventress stated simply, you are a part of the independence faction. Shark continued to question. You could say that yes, Ventress continued. What are you here for? I am just making my escape, that's what. Ventress replied, I am aware of the conflict, and it would seem that you and I have no business with each other, so I am confused as to why you are here. Shark questioned Ventress. Of course, I was just passing through before I head on my way. It would seem that you failed. Shark said all of a sudden, failed. Ventress had gotten a little irritated because she had failed, failed to defeat the Jedi Knight known as Obi-Wan Kenobi, a task that she had been given by her new Sith Master, Count Dooku, otherwise known as Darth Tyrannus. I see that you have failed to assassinate someone. Shark wasn't just getting her information from out of nowhere, but was being provided information from Anakin, whom had also acquired his own information on what is going on from within the CIS and the Republic, because his spies had been placed within both governmental systems. Ventress didn't say anything anymore, and just straight away started to attack Shark with her own dual lightsaber form. Her red sabers blurring to life as they started to engage in combat that Shark was easily able to fend off her attacker. Much to learn the assassin has, Shark said as she taunted her opponent. A flurry of blows were exchanged between the two, as they would continue their combat for a while, with Ventress discovering that maybe she shouldn't have engaged with this opponent in particular. She wasn't even a part of the Jedi, and there was no need to go after her. Whatever, I will make your fall be my rise as a Sith, Ventress said aloud, making her intentions clear. On Tatrine, some interesting events were taking place as the group on Yavin 4 are taking care of some interesting events, both that are supposed to happen in current times, and some things that would be from the past, and most importantly, completing some important things before they are supposed to be completed. Specifically, the interesting events taking place was between Tals and the ruling person over the far-off planet of Dathoma from the Emperor and, and Shmai, whom is now a retired Empress. The Dowager, in fact, is what she is, given her son is of course the current Emperor, Your Majesty. While Talzin was a proud woman, she doesn't dare disrespect this woman in particular, considering what she had managed to accomplish even if it was done with the help of her child. And you are, Shmai had grown used to people approaching her, whether that be to get something from her or to help them in some manner. Rarely was she ever approached at this point by someone that just wants to become something akin to friends. Your Majesty, my name is Talzin, and I hail from the planet of Dathoma. Talzin didn't really have any real impressions of the woman just yet, but going from what she had seen so far, she is just like her. Shmai loved her son immensely, while she as well also loved her own son Maul immensely. It was only natural that Talzin would feel in some way connected to this woman, and she is surprised that a human woman could look so good despite her age of being in her 40s. She knows what kind of effects time has on a mortal being, even someone enhanced through the force. Dathoma, so you were the one my child went to. Shmai knew he had gone to Dathoma, he had already revealed to her a many great deal of secrets, and she didn't mind what he has done. In all honesty, a mother is usually biased, as while you could do something wrong, irrevocably so, 
they would still side with you. Yes, I have helped the emperor before when he was but a child. Towson answered, I am aware of a lot of things. There is no reason for you to be like this. I am far too ordained with the politics of this empire, and I am sure that the lovely woman that has helped my son would be some good company. Shmai looked towards the other female, a girl that was standing next to Talzin. And who might this be? Shmai started to walk within the palace halls, given that this is the safest place in the entire Emperor. There is a reason she doesn't mind turning her back to Talzin. Not that Talzin knows of this, and instead is delighted by this interaction, because it meant there is hope yet for her plans. If she couldn't get the boy to volunteer himself and take the girl, maybe she could get his mother to see reason. Surely she would see that she is lowering herself, unfairly and would force or at least persuade Anakin into accepting her proposal. You see, Talzin had big events planned for the future, which included her becoming a monarch of her own, where more would rule with her on the other side of the galaxy. Not that she would become all that great, or even live forever and ever, because it was not within Anakin's designs or plans to help her accomplish her goals. He may indirectly help her take revenge by eventually going after Sidious. But that doesn't mean anything to him or her in the know. Talzin whispered and slightly pushed the girl forward. Come on, you are going to become an empress. This is for your sisters and for yourself. Talzin then spoke to Shmai. This is Meren, she is a young sister within our tribe on Dathoma. May I ask why you have brought her with you, all the way to Tatrine? We are basically on the other side of the galaxy from you. Shmai was slightly confused but had a feeling she knew where this conversation was going. Shmai had received similar requests before, and it would be weird if she hadn't, but it wasn't only for Anakin, but also herself, something she was both flattered by, but was not going to accept. Of course, as I am sure you have been having offers like this before, especially now it has been revealed your acceptance of polyamory here in the Emperor, I would want to forge an alliance. Talzin said knowing the politics were probably similar to others. It is strange that you wouldn't bring a daughter of your own. I am sad to say that I do not have any. I have only had the fortune of having sons. Talzin said this as she wasn't as brainwashed by the precedent set by her ancestors anymore. In fact, most of the Night Sisters at this point treated their men better. But that didn't mean there weren't still a matriarchy. They still are. Oh, I am aware that it is extremely dangerous for a Zabrak to have children, especially on Dathoma. But your population has started to finally crawl upwards. Shmai tried to change the topic with something both connected and not. Yes, that is true. Thanks to your son's help, of course. Talzin said bringing the topic back to what she wanted. I am sure that you could maybe convince your son that a proper alliance set up between the Emperor and Dathoma is good. There was some silence as Talzin easily kept up with Shmai, due to her height, while Meren was having a little trouble. Considering everyone within the Emperor was better than what they were before, the super Serum certainly changed the way Shmai conducts herself yet again, and those within the Emperor. Faster movement just happens to be a part of that transformation. Of course, I don't mean to say I want to force anyone. In fact, I am even willing to become a part of the Emperor. I have sensed events within the galaxy that could put myself and my people of Dathomir at danger. Talzin continued, seeing that Shmai didn't say anything. Shmai continues to walk through the hallways, as there was space left enough for the palace to expand. It wasn't as small as it used to be, and it had been renovated more and more. The reason being that Shmai was expecting Anakin to have many, many children due to him many wives. She didn't underestimate his sexual prowess at all, and it may seem weird, but let's just say it is mother's instinct. She had bathed him while he was younger after all, she knew just how well equipped he was despite being just a babe. Your Majesty, Talzin was beginning to think her plans were not working as Shmai was not responding to her offer. It wasn't all that bad either, because the Emperor would gain an outpost of sorts on the other side of the galaxy. And it wasn't like Anakin hadn't done anything to make sure it wasn't ready to start handling an influx of people. If this were an empire with proper titles, then Anakin would hold an empire-level title, while Talzin would hold a kingdom, meaning that it was entirely highly possible to vassalize her due to the power, economic and political difference between the title levels. I think that this matter should be either discussed with Anakin yourself, or I could set up a meeting between the two of you. Shmai said not making a decision, since it wasn't hers to make. Have you not asked Anakin directly yourself as well? I have, your majesty, but the emperor doesn't see it from my point of view. He doesn't wish to marry someone so young, despite her being only six years younger than him. There is also a fact, that within my people, they would get married earlier and have children earlier as well, and this aspect hasn't changed. Talzin explained that it was a part of her culture or tradition to be married off so young. So Anakin is against this because of the girl's age. It seems perfectly normal from his point of view. Shmai said aloud with the poor girl. Marin was having her fate be decided by those that aren't even her parents. In fact, her parents had long ago since died, and this was before Anakin's implementations had come to full fruition within the Night Sisters. Yes, you highness, I agree with his choice, but I still wish to become and merge together through this way, as it would satisfy the needs of my own people. They would be against just coming under someone even if he has helped them. Talzin further explained, that is reasonable. Shmai nodded thinking about the differences in culture or religion was normal. What she was worried about most was how Anakin would react if she forced it upon him. Not that the force itself hadn't already forced him into having multiple wives or lovers already. It would simply be another of his parents because the force could be seen as his parent binding him to another. A marriage would solidify this aspect and allow myself to hand over the position of leadership, or at least hand over the top position of leadership to someone else. Talzin didn't want to give up her position of power, no matter what. 
But that didn't mean she didn't see the benefits of becoming a part of the Empire. Shmai or Anakin could just set up a Stargate and use that to transport between both places. It wouldn't be that hard at all. Of course, not that anyone knew of the insane technology or medicine the Emperor and Truly had access to. Even if they were to somehow gain this information, they would still be unable to decipher it. Or decode and reverse engineer the process of these things. Palpatine had tried and failed, so what made others think they could? I like all of the aspects you speak of, and I am sure Anakin has thought about this. I will tell you what. Shmai started as she came to a stop looking towards both the very tall woman and the small girl known as Marin. I will try and convince him to go through with it. But it is on the stipulation I know what the girl wants. The girl. Talzin was a bit confused before catching on to what Shmai wanted to know about. Of course. There is no need to worry, Marin is quite the lovely girl. And is definitely interested in this, because despite her ask she is quite mature. No, I would like to hear it from the girl's mouth. She is the one to be married to him, so I would suggest that you be quiet and allow her to speak. Shmai stated quite firmly while also remaining a respectful tone that didn't upset Talzin. Go ahead, Meryn. Allow me to hear your thoughts. Meryn was still a little afraid, but she liked Shmai more so than Talzin because Shmai was much more kind. In fact, Meryn could positively feel through the force just how much the woman seemingly cared for her, and there was nothing stopping her from feeling this way. It was a unique experience for an orphan girl like her, who has lost her parents at a young age. First her mother at childbirth, and her father to some unknown disease. He had caught out in the untamed wilds of Dathoma. I I like it here, Meryn stated, because she did. Anakin had done a lot for Tatrain, and had done a lot of realigning the balance of the planet, because it would remain as a seat of power for now. The force, both dark and light, was in perfect tandem with each other here, and it showed in the development within the Bayes spheres. Go on. Shmai gestured for her to continue. I I like and I mean the Emperor. Meryn wasn't lying as well, as it was both within her instincts to choose a suitable male as her pair, and also within her culture as well. She was entranced by him, his presence in the Force and his physical appearance. Do you want to become his wife? Shmai asked the most pressing question, that really Meryn shouldn't take any agency for. Why? Because she was still a child, but her position in life would dictate to her what she can or cannot do. So if this was something only she could decide on, then it would most definitely be something she, herself needs to think about. After a few seconds of silence, Mirren finally says in a meek tone, Ah yes. Back on Yavin 4, Anakin was nearing the top of the Great Temple, a paradise for dark side energy, which was present all throughout this planet right from the ground to the sky. Where could these things be? He was on the last floor before reaching the top, and his sense were going insane over this place. He knew at least one of the crystals was here, but he was unable to find it through using the Force, meaning it was purposefully making it harder on him. Not that it would be impossible to find, but he had to cover a lot of ground both on the ground itself and possibly every nook and cranny of the temple's walls. He had been speeding around as he wanted to get to Shark, knowing that the Force directed Ventress to her, instead of him made him kind of upset. He knew that the Force wasn't going to try and kill either of the two off or anything, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't allow harm. Anakin is a very protective person, whether that be himself or his counterpart, and that could be seen through both of their actions. In the corner of his eye, Anakin could see something cyan in color, and he knew that he had found it, and going by its color, it was the mantle of the Force. The mantle of the Force in particular, when placed in a lightsaber, its properties altered depending on the other crystals the lightsaber carried, making it more powerful in the areas that the other crystals improved, though it always enhanced Force abilities. But there was more than what meets the eye. Anakin isn't going to just simply make some boring old one saber, or two using the crystals he is collecting. No, he has something much greater planned. There is only one place left to go towards to find the heart of the Guardian. Anakin thought to himself as he dashed upwards flying through the temple insides. Heading further up the temple from within, Anakin was approaching the topmost part of this sacrificial temple. The grand audience chamber was humongous, gigantic in frame proportionate to Anakin, who has been commented on for his larger than normal height. The great temple itself was definitely taller than him, but this tip of the temple in particular was especially tall. Taller than all of the other levels he had explored to find the crystals, and now that he has one there is but one more place to check. The view from this area is quite good, but Anakin doesn't have time to see all of that, but instead wants to head further up. If he had stopped to look, it would have exposed the luscious moons, habitable atmosphere and the trees that were a part of its forests. None of them could quite compare to the temple's stature and height, but a lot of those trees were also quite tall in on themselves. At the tippity top of this pyramid-like temple, there was no point, and instead there was a room. A small room that also overlooked everything, and it was exactly at the center of this room. The very thing Anakin was looking for. The second half of what he was searching for, in fact. The heart of the Guardian. He didn't question how this has gotten here, and why it was here, because there is no need for him to know. But it would certainly be interesting to see the tale of how it happened to appear in this place. It wasn't exactly the resting place of Revan, or one of the area he was killed, died or otherwise reunited, and became one with the Force. When placed within a lightsaber, it altered the properties of other crystals that the lightsaber carried in a positive way. This crystal created a fast jet devastating blade. That was perfect for lightsaber combat. It is believed that the heart was involved in the founding of the Jedi Order. According to prophecies of the Order, the heart would appear at the time of greatest turmoil and help in bringing the galaxy into salvation. However, the Sith also believed it to be an object of their heritage, which in turn, would have brought about their domination of known space. 
While the mantle of the Force would give off a blue hue, the heart of the Guardian would give off the orange or bronze coloring. At first, Anakin had considered that maybe he should give these crystals over to Ahsoka, especially so because it fit her color scheme. Orange and blue along with her own orange and blue coloring. It would have certainly been funny. Of course, he retracted that decision as despite the look it would have given and despite her power within the Force, he could make much better use out of these crystals. Now, I need to go. It wouldn't be long now for Anakin to reach his first target, and while he can sense through the bond both Barris and Shark, he heads towards Shark first. The reason being he can see what is happening. She is having some fun with Ventress, in particular she is being used as a tool to train herself. Well, it wasn't just Shark that was getting some valuable experience out of this encounter as Ventress was also learning, improving and pulling on the dark side of the Force to better empower herself. Anakin started using the Force to make himself fly through the air, and the distance between himself and Shark wasn't all too much but it was far enough away that it warranted him using flight. Running there would have been more of a hassle and taken up too much time, which he could use better to convince Ventress to go back to her tribe. She would of course hate those from her tribe from the Night Sisters on Dathoma, especially Talzin, but Anakin didn't care all that much. In fact from what he understands is that she was taken from them all given away from a very young age. Ventress was taken as a slave to Ratatak and trained as a Jedi Padawan by Jedi Knight, Kentucky Narek, after all. Or, at least, this is from how he remembers it, and from the information he has gained from Grievous, in combination of his own previous life's knowledge, and using the Force. I am coming, try not to kill her. Anakin sent a message through the bond to Shark, knowing that it may affect her in some way. Utilizing the bond was dangerous, while not actually dangerous, but it did have its side effects, meaning it would deepen the emotions or feelings they have for each other. A reason he doesn't use it often with those connected to him, if they aren't already within a romantic relationship. There was no response from Shark because she was still trying her hardest to defy loving Anakin, and being connected to him through the diet. While Anakin is on his way, Shark and Ventress are engaged in quite the duel. What are you doing? Come at me. Ventress called out as she tried to aggressively attack Shark. But she was not held as a lightsaber combat master for nothing. There was no way Ventress would be able to defeat Shark through the use of her lightsabers and combat training even with all of the time she has had to hone these skills in particular. No, she would have to start relying on the Force more and more, which is something she is not against. Calm down. I am not your enemy. Shark was now regretting taunting her. Anakin didn't know that the information he had supplied Shark was used in that way but he would find out once he got here. Shark, even though not as brainwashed by the Jedi, still had a subconscious dislike for those that practiced the use of the dark side. It was one of the reasons even when she agreed with Anakin, she used to not embrace her developed feelings, while the others already have. She still had quite a while to go before she was capable of becoming or embracing these things, and this may be that chance. A chance to see past her own biases and lower her dislike for all things related to the dark side. She didn't just leave the Order because she wanted to go with Anakin, and had her own reasons as well that were indirectly pointed out to her by Anakin. That however is besides the point. Shut up, I will defeat you and destroy you, and as you fall, I will rise. Ventress called back out as she gave a rather vicious force push. That enabled her to create some distance between the two. Shakti, like most Jedi of the era, was discovered on her homeworld shyly as an infant when doctors identified her as force sensitive. Taken to the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, T entered into the academy there and spent the next decade studying the ways of the Force and the Jedi Code. After being promoted as a Jedi Knight by the Jedi High Council, pursued the path of the Jedi Consular, strengthening her connection to the Force and working under the Council of Reconciliation. She was also allowed to go back to her homeworld and connect with her roots. Undergoing a traditional Togretan rite of passage, T tracked and killed a wild occult beast and crafted an elegant headdress from its teeth. Shark had some regrets for regrets which included her first student of whom had died. During her early career T took her first student choosing to train him on her birth planet, Shali. Amongst the vast, dry scrublands T taught her student the ways of the Jedi, eventually raising him to knighthood. Parting ways, it wasn't long before Shark T got word that he had been killed by a criminal on one of his first missions. Having failed her first student T decided to try again when she chose the initiate Fae Sun as her second apprentice. However, instead of having the same fate, it was Anakin that had changed that. Shark was drawn to him, and in all the more irony, he was something, someone that was not like her. Not isolated and it took some effort, but she was able to become more social. Not that she wanted to, but it gave her a better understanding of people. Who would have thought that training someone like she had would get them killed? But she had the passion to continue, and if it wasn't for Anakin, she was sure her second student would die as well. Please, the dark side is not the path you should take, especially considering what you are doing. Shark tried to make Ventress see reason, but she wasn't having any of it, and she feared she may only worsen the situation. Shark is a very cunning person, but that mainly applied to combat situations, not diplomatic in nature, because she hadn't the mind for it. Not that she didn't have the potential, but because of the way she is. That is just the way it has to be. You don't know me. You don't know what path I have taken and how far it has gotten me. Ventress replied, also calmly as she again tried to strike Shark down, only to be unsuccessful. Shark was just too cunning, as it could be seen within her movements. 
Her style or approach to any situation including this one was portrayed in her movements, and given the few years she has had of proper social interactions she understands more. It probably helped Anakin allow for whatever awkwardness she had in terms of trying to be flirty or otherwise. She realizes what she had said back when he was younger was probably wrong to say to a child. That he didn't feel like one, nor did he look like one either. There is a better way to do this. Shark was slowly trying to draw Ventress away from the area she was at. They had come to a peak of a temple, and below that temple was a very large drop that looked like some sort of ravine. If you would just calm down, I am sure that we can talk about this. Someone is coming that will help you. Shark said this because she knew she couldn't help this situation, but she is also unsure of how Anakin would deal with this matter. He did however seem to know a lot about her. The two would be locked in a short duel that would only last around a minute before Anakin arrived from the sky. Well this is not what I was expecting, Anakin said as he looked at the two ladies, soaked in the rain because it had been starting to rain. While he may have had a nice view, particularly looking towards Shark as the fight, while controlled was still quite messy, and allowed for some of her clothing to become destroyed in a manner that allowed Anakin to see some of her more precious assets. Ventress was in the same state, but she cared less about her current state, and more about what or who Anakin was. Who are you? Ventress called out as she was at the precipice of a ledge leading into some depths. Allow me to introduce myself, Anakin did a bow, and then straightened himself again. I am Anakin, Anakin Skywalker. You, are you not the current Emperor of the Emperor? Ventress calmed down a bit because she had gotten confused. About that Anakin would then go on to speak with the woman and describe to her some events, and why exactly he was looking for her, to bring her back and reintroduce her back to her roots, her homeworld of Dathoma but she wasn't having any of it. She didn't want to go back, especially since she considered herself unwanted. Anakin wouldn't be able to convince her, and this whole thing was for naught. Ventress wouldn't be going back to Dathoma to rejoin with her people, and Anakin wouldn't be taking her as his wife. Either way he knew, that within the Force, it isn't meant to be. At this point a bond probably would have formed between the two. Catch me, if you can. Ventress jumped off of the cliff, similar to how the duel on Yavin 4 went down between her and the original. This time, However, she had done so herself. After that entire debacle, Anakin moved towards Shark. He could see she was exhausted as she was not only holding off Ventress, but just before her she was fighting those mantis-like creatures known as the Klicknicks. Anakin held her and she leaned into him, not caring for what she was portraying, or how she might be seen as weak. I am a bit tired, can we take a rest? She could hear the beating of his hearts, the four knocks it signified telling her, reminding her about what he is willing to do. Sure, Barris doesn't need our assistance at this moment. Anakin didn't mind Shark being selfish in this instance, and allowed it. You know, I love you, right? Shark all of a sudden said, I know, I have always known. You aren't as good as you think you are at hiding from me or the dive between us. Anakin replied, of course you do. She rolled her eyes as she once again was exposed to Anakin's know-it-all capabilities. Whether he actually did or not, it didn't matter. What mattered is now she felt ready to speak about her feelings for him. You know, I love you as well. Anakin said as she was slowly starting to regain her breath thanks to Anakin, as he was using a variation of force healing, as instead he was rejuvenating her stamina, rather than her vitality. I think we should go now. Shark separated from him, reluctantly. But she could cuddle him some more later. You feel good enough? Anakin questioned, yeah, let's go help out Barris and whatever trouble she has gotten herself into. Shark said before asking two more questions. By the way, did you get your crystals, and does this make me your official fourth wife? To answer both, yes. I guess it does make you mine, Anakin stated. Yours. I am fine with that. Before they left however, Anakin felt it prudent to make sure she knows of his feelings through his actions. He kissed her on the lips, and didn't avoid going fully in there, because he didn't have to worry about her predator-like teeth. He has too many protections against such basic sharp teeth, and he didn't fear being cut or hurt in any way. After it finished she couldn't help but be flustered as he started to fly with her into the other direction. He carried her just as he did with Ahsoka, like a princess of course, and went towards Barris. Anakin was getting into the habit of picking up his girls like this. The princess Carrie is famous, but it is also kind of cliche. But that wouldn't stop Anakin from taking advantage of this to help develop his relationship with any of the girls. Heading towards the temple, Anakin and Shark both made it there in record time. One might be wondering why he didn't call anyone else to come here, and that is because no one else is required. He has gotten the general gist of the situation going on within the palace of the Wormander, and knows that it would probably be within his power to solve this problem. He hadn't however communicated with Barris for a few minutes, and doesn't know about whether or not she has completed the problem yet. From what he understands, they are going to be tasked with solving a puzzle of sorts, which would then allow them to unlock the Golden Globe. It did anger him. He could admit he wasn't really feeling all too happy, despite finalizing his relationship with Shark. This was a monstrosity, but he could get some valuable information and knowledge from this, if he studied it properly. What exactly this could contribute towards, one may ask. It will help in the formation of his own dimension within the Falls. It holds souls after all, even when it is just the souls of children, it was more than enough because it created a whole other space for him to go into and explore. In fact, it was such a marvel of both technology, Sith intellect and the dark side of the Force that he couldn't and wouldn't pass this opportunity up. He could hear it now, the soft cries and pleas for help within the Force. He wouldn't be leaving this problem and let the children be trapped and suffer for longer than they already have. He knows that it would be his decision.
descendants, or rather, the descendants of his counterpart, that would have saved these children and released their souls. That wouldn't be happening, not because he wouldn't have descendants of his own. He knew he was probably going to have a very, very large family. No, it is because they would be freeing them now, and he has taken up the mantle of freedom and liberty. It has now become a part of him not only because he, himself wants to continue this idea, but also due to the influence of his people and subjects. Arnie. Barris's voice was heard as he and Shark were now on foot exploring the ruins of the palace for themselves. Shark had fully recovered most of her lost energy, and could continue which lead Anakin to seeing a problem. While he may have imparted eternal life to those connected to him through a diadem for his mother, that didn't mean they were as powerful as him. Not in their base form without the force compared to his base form, and in fact it is entirely possible that he is so physically and mentally dominant, that they wouldn't stand a chance even if he handicapped himself, and they were still able to use the force. Yes, Barris, it is I. Anakin replied as he stepped around the corner to see the golden globe and Barris talking with a little, rat, cat, lemur thing Barris ran up to him, and embraced him with slight tears in her eyes, as she was emotional over the golden globe. The children were what she is worried over, not anything else at this moment, not that she doesn't care for Anakin, but because he is unharmed and completely safe. The golden globe was protected by a powerful energy shield which threw back anyone who attempted to touch it. There was also the fact that the only way to break through this shield was by using the force to awaken it. Then there are also the haunting manifestations of the followers of Ixacun, blocking their way to entry. Overall not a good time. The children Barris left off, and didn't need to say any more as Anakin could sense her distress through their bond, and allowed her to be comforted by his presence within the Force and his physical self, that of which is embracing her. I know. Anakin replied, Shark, you are here as well. Barris looked towards the other person within the room. Why wouldn't I be? Shark had a frown on her face as well. So this thing is another source of dark side energies. Huh? Yes, from what we have done oh, I forgot to introduce the Jedi Master here. Barris was now not hugging Anakin anymore but was still physically attached to him as she pointed towards the very old Kushabin. This is Ikrit. Pleasure to meet the two of you. Ikrit did some funny bow that was really unsuitable for his physical form, given he used all four appendages, excluding the tail to move. Yes, as you may have heard from my wife here, I am Anakin Skywalker. Anakin assumed that Barris would just gush over him and reveal to any and everyone willing to listen to tell them she is his wife. Yes, yes. You are a Jedi, the supposed chosen one, yes. Ikrit had heard of some crazy stuff as both Barris and Ikrit converse with each other. That is what I was told. However, I don't really like prophecies all that much. Anakin answered while internally, of course it is true, or at least it is completely true that I am some sort of miracle given birth by a mother and only the Force. Then there is all of the other factors, but the Force is strange, and anything related to prophecies of the Force is 100% correct. That was until I was actually coming into form. I am no mere Anakin Skywalker, but the sum of two souls, the chosen one and some random guy from a place far, far away way Anakin finished inwardly, as he regarded the sentient being that looked like a pet. I don't know how much has changed over the years, but it would seem that the Order is just as weird as I had gone into exile. There were many things that happened throughout the history of the Jedi and the Republic, Ikrit was a testament to that fact himself. Right, so you guys have managed to destroy the outer layer, but are unable to actually destroy the orb. Anakin replied changing the topic back to the main subject at hand. Yes, Dash, Ikrit was interrupted as Barris wanted to be the one to explain. She had only told him so much through the link, and now wanted to take up as much time as she could. Not that he doesn't spend time with her. It was only natural for her to be so intimate. Barris would go on to explain all that had happened from her arrival into her meeting of Ikrit in as much detail as she could. She wanted Anakin to know not only because she wanted him to know everything about herself and vice versa, but because she knew that he would have a solution to their current predicament. Or, at least she believed he did but it wasn't really based off of any logical fact that he could. While the children's predicament was tragic and Anakin wanted to destroy the orb as soon as possible before heading back to the Emperor, that doesn't mean he would pass up this opportunity. No, he would get all of the gains possible from the artifact, preferably not at the risk of the children within. So you have a plan, right Arnie? Barris asked him, not leaving his side. Well, yes and no. Anakin replied, what do you mean? Ikrit asked, you see, from what I understand about this orb, is that it is kind of required for someone to be a child to destroy it. Anakin said, starting to lead the conversation in his direction, a direction that would convince Ikrit of allowing him to do whatever he wants, because there is no telling what the little guy would try to do. Yes, that is correct. Ikrit replied, nodding his little head up and down. Because of this fact, we need to have someone here that is young enough to be considered a child. Unfortunately for us, there is no one here under the age of whatever was considered an adult thousands of years ago. Anakin continued as everyone was just nodding along. Shark and Barris didn't have any bright ideas in this moment. But there was someone who could potentially destroy this thing. Someone back on the living ship, Jabitha. In fact, Anakin believes that it was not only that someone capable of destroying the all, but also Jabitha herself. That could also be considered a child. She was created a few years ago, and still holds a childlike personality with very little developments. Shark then spoke up. What about Ahsoka? She should be young enough to be still considered a child, at least I hope that she would be. It was possible that Ahsoka could be young enough, and Anakin knew that one of his descendants, or at least the descendants of his counterpart, named after himself, would be around the age of 12 at the time. So he at least knew of an age range to consider what children were, and he was unsure about whether or not Ahsoka would be young enough to destroy the thing. Not that he wanted it destroyed, but he wanted it to stay just as it is, just without all of the children's souls inside of it. I don't know about that, Ahsoka may be young and can still be considered a child in a sense, 
But that doesn't mean she can actually fit whatever required age range here. Barris interjected her own thoughts probably having come to a similar conclusion as Anakin. So you guys have a child. Ikrit said believing that Anakin and Barris have had a child already. But then again considering both of their ages. Having a child that was old enough would seem insane. What Ikrit said however did slightly embarrass Barris. Because the relationship between herself and Anakin seemed too advanced to this point. A point in which people would misunderstand what they speak about with each other, not understanding the actual context, and coming to their own conclusions based off of their perceptions. You got it all wrong there. It would seem your old age has gotten to you. Anakin supplied to make sure Ikrit understood that he and she were not so debauched enough to start having children at whatever age they would need to be. Wait, how old do you think we are exactly? From our looks, you would believe we are within our twenties, right? Well... Ikrit mistakenly thought Barris was a child herself. Now he made the mistake to believe by looking at Anakin. He could determine everyone's age here. Sorry about that. It would seem that it is true. My age is getting to me. Whatever, there is nothing wrong with that. Anakin said as he then looked towards the Golden Globe, having decided that enough was enough, and he should start the process. I am going to begin now. He walked towards the orb, unafraid of being pushed back. Wait, Arnie, what are you doing? Barris had to step back as Anakin was already right next to the orb and touching it. I said I have a plan. Anakin placed his hand on the device, and he felt it both checking him, and then trying to push him away. It didn't work however as he seemed unharmed and very nonchalant about the situation. How are you doing that? Ikrit exclaimed both confused and surprised as that didn't have the same effect as it did for him, or even Barris when she tried something. Don't worry about it. It shouldn't matter all that much what I'm doing or how I'm doing it. Anakin was in fact using the force to stay in place. There was nothing fancy about what he is doing, because the force allowed him to stick himself within one fixture of space and allowed him to maintain that position. It was something easy for him to do, considering all of his other capabilities. Having learned about the ability to fly using the force helped as well. What Anakin was doing is drawing upon the energy of the device, slowly siphoning its powers and abilities to keep itself afloat trying to weaken the prison even more so than what it already has been. Which is basically nothing at all, considering it housed the souls of so many individuals that Anakin felt a rush of energy. It may seem wrong what he is doing, because all of that excess energy had at one point belonged to the children. He was trying to make sure the prison collapses in on itself, and in doing so its inner dimension would be incapable of fueling the necessary power. Lightning or electricity started to come out of his hand that touched the orb. Shark, Barris and Ikrit could only stand there, in awe of the power that they felt within the force. This confirmed his status as the chosen one within Ikrit's mind, having known about the prophecy and all, as it was normal for the Jedi to know about it. It was not something kept secret but upheld as some form of mythological belief. Anakin was drawing in this power but making sure the device didn't try and start stealing and sapping energy from the children to restore itself and its functions. The prison was coming undone, undone enough for all of the trapped souls to escape. First it was in the tens, then the hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and it seemed as it wouldn't stop. Children and more and more and more kept coming and coming and coming. Finally after a storm of epic proportions that centered around Anakin and the orb, it came to a stop as Anakin had both successfully freed the children and kept them safe as he absorbed the energies of the orb. The golden globe was still intact because he couldn't destroy, is the label of only being capable of being destroyed by a a sensitive child was true. You've you've done it, Ikrit exclaimed, not really knowing what exactly had just transpired. Since everything here had been completed, Anakin wanted to go back to Tatooine now, and start working on his special project. If one is curious about what had happened with either Ikrit or the Golden Globe, then one need not worry because Ikrit would be returning to the Jedi. This would inevitably be a boon to them as yet another of their Jedi Masters would be returning to help them in their efforts. The Golden Globe had been packed up and secured within his dimension, and the reason he gave everyone for its disappearance, including Shark and Barris because it would look bad, was that it had been destroyed. They didn't question him, especially Barris and Shark didn't question him, fully believing that he was telling the truth. He wasn't but it is such a minor detail because the globe would be destroyed into only its parts that made up the power of containing souls. He didn't want to entrap and enslave the souls of children and that is why he is making his own dimension slowly both wear the globe down and integrate it into his dimension. So how am I going to take the both of you back? Anakin said as he was left alone with Shark and Barris. The two had somehow come to know of what had transpired between everyone here. Barris seemed to know or know of what Anakin and Shark were to each other know. It wasn't something hard to decipher as well. Well, Anakin asked seeing that the two remained quiet. I think that you should try and carry us both. Barris said all of a sudden, which Anakin could probably do, no, can do. It would just be a little annoying because who would be who? So one of you on my back, while the other is carried by me. Anakin didn't mind this arrangement as it wouldn't really matter in the long run, but he was confused that they would want to do this. There is no more rush other than wanting to get back home. Something that both Shark and Barris were starting to accept. That Tatooine would be becoming their home. Not their own home worlds, even though they would likely still travel back to their home worlds every once in a while. Simply because it is their birthplace. Well, Barris was born on a Starliner. But that is besides the point because the point is that they are still a part of another culture. Yeah. Barris jumped over him and landed before she proceeded to attach herself to his back, while Shark made her own move. She approached him from the front and stood there waiting for him to lift her and sweep her from her feet. All set then. Up and up he went as he scooped Shark into his embrace and went back on their way towards Jabitha. Ikrit. 
That was his name, a name that he had held for over 400 years, and he had not forgotten his promise. His isolation from the galaxy at large due to his failure, a failure that while not of his own fault, still pushed him into doing something this drastic. Isolated and alone, he would have to wait years and years on end until someone, someone meant to destroy this orb would come. Come they had in the form of a little girl, or what he assumed to be a little girl but was in fact an adult. The female had companions, which would lead him to meeting and discussing things with her. That was in relation to the Republic and the Jedi. She spoke to him and he was glad for the company, given he had been here, exiled. Self-imposed as it was, it was something he should have expected. To be alone, lonely and have nothing to do because of it. Not even have time to train because he wouldn't live that long. Something still needed to be done about the object, the Golden Globe, and it was really not something he could just let go. Those phantoms didn't scare him away, and neither would his failure and he made sure that he would stay to see this until its end. A year after training under Master Yoda, he returned to his village to visit his family and friends. They were happy that he came though they still tease him for joining the Jedi. However, on the night before the Silkweed harvest was about to begin, a Kushiban returned home injured. She alerted the village to the presence of a pack of vicious Shinkra. Since the Kushibans were ill prepared to deal with this menace, Ikrit spoke to his people and offered to deal with the threat alone, lest many die. He then raced into the fields to deal with the beasts. As the Shinkra surrounded the Kushiban, Ikrit stood on top of a stack of harvested Silkweed. Ikrit then used his force powers to send a message into the minds of the vicious creatures. In that message, he told them that his village was in flames before convincing them to seek food elsewhere, by sending them a picture of plentiful food other creatures in the forests and streams of the mountains behind them. A victorious Ikrit then returned to his village where he was treated as a hero. Ikrit would return to his master and complete his training as a Jedi Knight. On one occasion, he lost control during a petty disagreement and almost murdered a friend with his lightsaber. Yoda risked his life to stop him, and as a result Ikrit forsook the use of lightsabers, much like Nomi Sunrider had years and years ago. Ikrit had already become a Jedi Master. It wasn't all that long ago as well. Well, at least it wasn't that long when taking into the grand scale of time and everything else that was happening in the galaxy, as a result of many things. He traveled to the moon of Yavin 4 and discovered the Golden Globe within the palace of the Wormander. Unable to break the curse and free the countless trapped Misasi children, he waited in a hibernation trance until someone came along who could. When the girl came, her companions came soon after. The Chosen One, he had heard the girl named Barris speak of him, intimately, and he knew that the Jedi must have changed. That was until the girl revealed they were no longer a part of the Jedi because of several reasons. He was amazing, no he is amazing, and Ikrit couldn't help but agree with the assessment made by everyone within the Jedi. He had heard that he was brought in as an older child, which it made sense as to why at first they were scared. But it wasn't like children over a certain age hadn't been accepted before. It was just unorthodox for the Order. The task that drew me here was beyond my power to complete. It was beyond the power of any adult Jedi. It was a remark he made as he left those children alone, for they were still children within his eyes because of his age. It was no wonder he had grown old after all, without experiencing most of the passage of time. You, all of you have done something I was unable to do. Ikrit acknowledged that without the other two here, the boy, no the man known as Anakin, may have very well left. Not that he actually knew of why he felt this way. But it was just a feeling, a feeling that wouldn't have come true. But it was there, something within himself that was strange yet at the same time both familiar and not. He was seeing doubles as the man that helped him also at the same time looked like a boy, and he was extremely confused because of this occurrence. It was like this man wasn't meant to free the children, but had still done so, and in place of another that wasn't even in existence just yet. The force is mysterious, that is until you see the many facets and flaws of what it wants as it was something that existed. It had life of its own in a sense, and Anakin knew of this. It was something he took advantage of, and tried to make sure it didn't clash against his goals. Sometimes, it doesn't like this and would send signals, signals through the force to inform other force sensitives of something which wasn't exactly wrong, but wasn't right as well. He is foreign, a foreign entity that had come from outside of its purview and godlike perspective on everything. And now, I believe that it is my time to return to the Jedi. I thank you all. Ikrit had done his duty, perceived duty that is, and not his actual duty as a Jedi, but it was honorable nonetheless, and the three also said goodbye. At that time Ikrit had no idea where he would be going next, and the Force didn't really tell him or lead him in any direction. He had no ship to leave, and had already decided in splitting off from Anakin, Shark and Barris, because he felt like he was imposing. It was clear to him that whatever was going on, it was best not to put himself in between these people. The chosen one he may be, but that didn't look like it all that mattered to him, and he would be annoyed that his alone time would be interrupted. Of course that was all just based off of Ikrit's perceptions of the matter. I guess, I could go back to the Jedi. I wonder what Marcioda's face will look like once I come back. Ikrit thought to himself as he was left alone here on Yavin. With no way back, Anakin didn't want to leave the poor guy here, and he especially looked like a pet. There was just no way he was just going to leave the guy here, so he had given him a communication device that he could use. It would allow him to connect to the virtual world of the Emperor, of course. It would be a way for him to call a taxi of sorts. It was completely safe, and Anakin had made the device on the spot. Plus using his own nanosuit's connection to the network patch him in. So, if Ikrit ever wanted to leave he could. And Ikrit would leave, leave to return to the Jedi. 
which would both be a good and bad thing, as he spread some more tales about the magnificence done by Anakin. Anakin would soon be getting an influx of students from the Jedi Order as they start to leave more and more because of this. Any form of publicity is good publicity. Back on Jabitha, Anakin had arrived with Shark and Barris. Of course, there were some people awaiting their arrival and wanting to go into detail about what has happened. Shark was dragged away by Isla and into another room to talk about some things, while Barris went off with Ahsoka to help her in making her lightsabers. Of course not before Anakin got a quick peck on his check from Ahsoka and a hug before running off. It would seem Ahsoka will be becoming more and more bold, despite him having already told her to not engage in any romantic behavior. But he would learn that controlling teenagers are harder than expected. He only has some experience in managing children under the ages of 13, not a teen that is on the precipice of becoming an adult. Of course, she was around three years off from that point. But that didn't change the matter. At this point she was slowly starting to wear on him. Not that he still didn't respect or love her. But it was the fact she was crossing boundaries he had already set in place for her. He had assumed she would have known better than that, especially with having semi-taught her things. In the future, it was highly probable and most likely going to happen either way. But he wasn't going to start a relationship with her at this stage. Besides, he already has a few wives already that he is already within a relationship with. Moving on from this however he went back to his room and took out the two crystals he had originally come here for. While he has the golden globe within his spiritual dimension being crushed and pulverized into oblivion. He had now taken another step into a direction he wanted. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much. And it keeps me going. Plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.